Do you want to be a part of the COCO community? Sure, we all do. So join this free weekly live talk show to find out how easy it is to watch at home and learn about your color computer. At the COCO Nation, more than 9 million men and women have participated in the community without setting foot outside their homes. And now at home in your spare time, you can see what's happening or even join the discussion. Choose from any one of these segments. Panel intros, project updates, acquisitions, Coco Thoughts, featured interviews and events, the Game On Challenge, news, Ron's Garage, Coco commercials, show coverage, panel goodbyes, or you can join one of our extra shows. You can choose from the Game On Challenge Live or Coco Tech. Join the Coco Nation right now. Click the link for the free information TJB Chris spoke about. Then decide if you want to watch the Coco Nation live show, the world's leading live weekly talk show featuring the Tandy Color computer, its siblings, cousins, and redheaded stepchildren. Visit thecoconation.com. There is no obligation and no salesman will visit you. Visit thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation Show is an unscripted, live, and interactive broadcast. Anything can and will happen. The views and opinions expressed by members of the panel and the live audience are their own, and not necessarily those of the Coco Nation Show, its sponsors, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Open minds are encouraged, and a sense of humor is recommended. Thank you for being a part of the Coco Nation. Radio Shack. Okay. What? The 80s called.
Welcome to the Coco Nation, the world's first live and interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and its hardware cousins. Everybody, welcome to the Coco Nation Show, episode three fifty eight. And I remember to update the screen. I forgot to rename the file until just now. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, let's see. Hey, did I remember to push this button over here? No, I didn't. So here we go. Okay. Uh, let's see who we got on the panel this time. We got Terry Stiggy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. And Henry Gernhard. Hi, folks. Welcome to the Coco Nations. My name's Henry, and today we've got double the news from L. Curtis Boyle. <clears throat> That's right. Double news day. Yeah, Ken Waters. <laughs> All right. I'm here. I'm ready. I've got my cup of coffee and a whole pot behind me. I'm ready for the double news. I'd add a pillow. <laughs> All right. Next up is Alan. I am not ready for double news. <laughs> but you're looking good. Can I Just think that? of it as a nap, then you're ready for it's it. Slide news. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have the underwater Marco. Hello there. Am I coming through any better now? Yes, a little bit better. Oh, hold yeah, back. I reduced, reduced my CPU usage a little bit. Too many tabs open in my browsers. Anyway, I know the feeling. Right, are you doing the news too? <laughs> And the news. Ne next up, yours truly, the button pusher. Uh, let's see, Rick Uland. And the news here, it's not raining. Ah. Hey, folks. <laughs> Out here, it was so windy, the curtain was uh, horizontal, so I had to close the window. <laughs> uh, let's see, Ron Delvo is up next. Yes, and I'm pushing this here, Coco, but I can't move my mouth. Crazy, huh? <laughs> okay. And on the next row, we got Bob Emery. Hello, everybody. Am I, is my mic working? Yes, yep. it is. <laughs> and Dale Curtis Boyle. Welcome to the show, everyone. It's going to be a long one. <laughs> Warning. I know I say that every week. But... And you're usually right. Uh, let's see. Last but not least, we got Jason the Cocoa Man. All right, everyone, it's time to double down on your fun compass and follow it towards the Cocoa Nation show now with Lemony Fresh Scent. And over in the chat, we got Carrie Shrug, J.E. Jones, 3141, Tim Franklin, Kevin Holloway, Michael Zweffel. Sixty, Jim Rye, Mark Siegel, Tom Eric Gunderson, Brian Weasler, Julian Brown, and I think that covers about everybody for the moment. Okay, so intro's done. Uh, let's see. Snarky stuff on the IRC. Okay. Um, First up today, I think we have project updates, and uh, I have Terry, but does anyone else have anything? Yep. Well, you're a whole segment of yourself. Right. So, all right, Terry, what you got today for us? Well, I got two things. Uh, let's see. First, real quick, I want to thank Rick. Um Got my Coco IO. I love this thing. If you guys get a it's chance black. to check one out, it's uh, probably one of the coolest 3D printed cases I've seen yet. And not to mention the functionality is just awesome. So it's thank nice you, and, Rick. It's nice and smooth. Yeah, it's impressive. Mm -hmm. Print on glass. That's what you get. All right, and then the other one I've got, it's going to take me here a second. Get 
We have an unboxing. Somewhat larger. <laughs> Reach out to me on my uh, AgVision website and uh, ask oh. if I would be interested. Sweet. Oh, original box and everything. It has the, yep, it's got the original box. See if I can drop it. You know, it'd be about one right, break it right away. So, oh, oh very pretty. blue. <laughs> it actually came with um, all the original cables. They're still sealed. Ooh. <laughs> uh, had a, a modem. I guess uh, right here. like somebody signed up for it and forgot to take it out of the box. Exactly. I think what happened. What, well, let me finish here. Too. Actually, a pristine one of those. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Does they have a TV to match? <laughs> shiniest TV game switch ever seen. One of the things that I'm really get, not getting over right now is how white those white keys are. I mean, they are, are they? white. It's, yeah, yeah. It's impressive. But yeah, that yeah. uh, was labeled to the uh, the farm that it went to. And then in Kentucky, uh, right? Pardon? In Kentucky, right? Uh, this was actually Arkansas. Oh, okay, interesting. They made it there. Cool. Yeah, the original, the very original prototypes. They only made two hundred and fifty that used the Model One case. Those went to Kentucky into two different counties, and the blue oh, ones okay. kind of got scattered around a bit further. So the other kind of cool thing that came, I did not realize, but there was actually a recall on these machines. They, uh, you would send the machine in. I don't know if that's going to come through at all, but um, oh, barely. It it uh, basically said there was a new ROM version that you would send it in, and they would replace it at the Radio Shack repair. Um, so I thought that was cool. And then the original repair ticket. I don't know if that's going to come through or not, but okay. So do you know if the machine has been has Peter had that Falls, done? Iowa. <laughs> yeah, has it had it done? I did. What was that? Did it do the upgrade? Did they do it? Yep, this one has had the the upgrade. So let me see if I can. Now, one of the, my other one, the the um, sticker was faded, but this one, the sticker is not faded. What <laughs> this sticker is is actually from the manu from the factory. It, uh, I don't see it, but basically is the credentials to log on to their uh, account is what all that was. So oh, okay. it's got their name and then there's a serial <laughs> number and a password um, on that. It's pretty. And then, of course, the yeah. serial number and all that fun but you'll notice it does like the other one I have says video text terminal. Uh, well, and I bet that stickers on top because a lot of times the answer back was in the ROM for that particular machine where you had to all match up. You couldn't just grab Billy Bob's terminal and log into your account. You had to have your machine to do it. And that could be why it's like stuck right on the machine on top of it with a sticker. I, I think you're exactly right. In that letter, uh, it actually talks about uh, you can connect to CompuServe and Dow Jones, uh, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. They were actually saying you can use this for multiple things. Uh, one thing that I noticed was a little different than my other one. Around these feet, it actually is, you can, you can see they didn't quite spray it, the paint as well. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. It's kind of like it looks like an uh. overspray, but um it did bleed let me set this down before i drop it on this uh you can kind of see in the box there oh the oh, rubber wow. yeah. oh. rubber bled and then I, some of the blue wore onto the cardboard but it doesn't uh, it didn't really scratch up the machine and let's see mm -hmm. Is but the of course, it was. Is, cool is the package completely different? It is different than a, a regular cocoa would be back then, because yeah, it the, just had like a flap that opens up and then, yeah. 
But it was cool. Custom manufactured by Radio Shack Tandy. I thought that was kind of cool to see. Save this carton for returning. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I just wanted to share that. I will That's get nice. So letters. do they want them back at the end of the program or what was that, Mark? Did they uh did AgVision want all their all those back afterwards? It doesn't say so in the um no, no. no I think they were actually sold, so they weren't they weren't that the earlier sure version was the one that kind of did tests runs for people i think this was actually the first commercial the, the really cool thing about the ag vision was it was part of tandy's repair network which for an oddball little thing like that is huge you know there's radio shacks all over even if you're on a farm there's a radio shack not too far away <laughs> a couple hours away yeah now um can you actually actually cause a power meltdown if you put the video text cartridge in the video text machine, <laughs> <laughs> there's no cartridge on the video text. Is the it? nice thing yeah, is they don't have the cartridge. You <laughs> can't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, cartridge that, to prevent just that thing. Yeah, the video text terminals I don't think actually had a cartridge slot. No, it's blocked out in the plastic. Let's see it. Yeah. And there's no connector. Yeah, that's all you get. Don't don't. Uh, or you can take it that's back cool. to Radio Shack and have them fix that, huh? Does the door open? <laughs> no. I don't Are, think there's even a connector inside. Just to, in, in box, you have to right? like, change no, the motherboard. No, there's no connector. It's just the same. Yeah, it's just the. Right, now, Terry, have you cool. seen what the original Model 1 prototype looked like? You know, this one and my other one, I, I don't have my other one here. That Those two look very similar. Um, internally, they do look a touch bit different, but. It's, it's mostly just stickers and stuff that they put on the ROMs. I have not seen one of that. Oh, what is that model one? Um, I forgot the name of it. but Because there's there's one that was actually based on the Model 1 case, the Tiris 80 Model 1, that yeah, the very first Videotex. Uh, Eddie Shuford in the uh, Tandy Discord actually found a picture of it that says the College of Agriculture. It's going to be hard to read. But I'll share it because he actually it's not he doesn't own one. He's still trying to find one. Apparently, 250 of these were made. 100 each were shipped to two different counties in Kentucky, and then 50 were kept at Radio Shack for spares and parts. And their failure rate was pretty high. I guess they had to like replace nine right as soon as they shipped pretty well. Now, let me show you what that looks like. It's not the greatest picture in the world, but I've seen this in the manual when they did the original patents and stuff like that for it. But I've never seen one in real life. But there there is one. Oh, gee, weird looking wow. thing, isn't it? Huh. That's odd. Well, and the weird thing is to fit a like cocoa size normal motherboard in there, you have to break it in half and connect it with ribbon cable. I don't think this had a cocoa mm -hmm. motherboard in it. I think it's a totally well, different design because they don't have the American well, keypad, right? But like even the Model 1 they did, the same, it was two boards connected together with a cable. And, and yeah. It's just yeah. unnecessarily complicated. And if this followed the same plan, yeah, nine of them were broke. As soon as but Eddie has his own uh, video tech site too, where he's gone. He's you put up the manuals, Amazing. including the protocol to use uh, the, the terminal. These original prototype design drawings, and here then the you know the blue and the the gray ones. He's he's still looking to get a physical one of these, and he's actually trying to hunt through the university that this went through these these original prototype models. I because uh, I don't think they had to return these either, from what I understand. But basically, two hundred went out in public. I do have a manual for the College of America unit. They did not call it um, Ag Vision or anything like that. I wasn't quite sure what it was, so I will dig that out, make sure that's on the archive. But I've not seen the actual device. Was there a modem in it? Yep. yep. If you look in the left there, the two LED lights, one is power and one is data. And yeah. the data is for the modem. But you notice no full keyboard. You couldn't type letters or nothing. It was all American. Right. I think that's one thing the farmers probably requested get changed. And that's when the uh, the Ag Vision and the original video text came out. What's the CA stand for? College of Agriculture. Yeah, I could Which just imagine. You can just make out if you're zooming it in. Right. I could just imagine drilling through menus for hours with this keyboard, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get next page key, a last page, send, and clear. But yeah, yeah. next page, next page, next page, next page. Because <laughs> oh, this would have been around the 1979 version of it. Right, three hundred baud or something like that. So yeah, yeah, wonderful. But yeah, I, I was quite surprised when Eddie put that up because I've seen mock diagrams like the original patents and stuff that they applied for and the original proposal, 
or they drew up a little mock-up like this. I had no idea they'd actually manufacture them until Eddie posted this picture. That's very cool. So there's another one you have to find. <laughs> right, right. A quest. I, I'm not helping you uh, stop your hobby of collecting. <laughs> yeah, my wife's going to come to Canada and hunt you down, so. Don't let her know. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that that's all I had to show. That was quite good. Okay, let's see. Nick, any other uh, project updates? I have one, like but I'll mention show. it during the news. Okay. I had a, uh, just a quick thing that last uh, week or two ago, somebody was asking about the video text manual. So I dug mine out. I actually have a. It's melting. Is that VidTex yes. or VideoTex? Video Video Text Terminal Package. It has to touch your face or we don't see it. Yes. Well, it's blending into the palm tree. There. Here, let me just do this. Yeah, shut it off. <laughs> it's doing too good a job. There. Now it's going to just be blurry instead. But we're used to that. <laughs> But this has all the original uh original blur? <laughs> yeah. See? <laughs> it's it's not helping. There we go. It has all the original blur. Oh, it's still easier. Yeah. But yeah, I've got the video text user guide and then the CompuServe user's guide. And that was for the cartridge? For the cartridge, yeah. I think I got this when when it was on sale after, you know, well after I could have used it for anything, but Hey, I will mention one thing. The terminal program that's built into the Deluxe Coco, the one you type term to get into, actually uses the protocols that's in that manual. It, the only thing it doesn't support is the graphics modes, the RLE graphics. It'll support the semi-graphics and the text-only modes. And it supports all this, you know, the control escape code sequences to, like, position the cursor and clear to the end of line, clear to the screen, exact same protocol. So I think Tim Linder had actually made a video text server program that you can actually use to test. He did. And we should be able to hook up a deluxe to that and actually uh, try it out. Hey, Bob, mm -hmm. on the, on the sp spine of that, is it Radio Shack or is it TDP? It's TRS-80. TRS-80, okay. Yes, Radio Shack, yeah. Cool, very cool. And the reason I asked about video text versus vid text is that uh, CompuServe with Tandy later brought out vid text, which was a disk based terminal program for the Coco that was quite a bit more expanded. I had the CompuServe Streaming B protocol added and a bunch of mm -hmm. other things. That's actually one I bought when I was a regular on CompuServe. I think that's what I bought when I got a modem. I don't think I ever used the cartridge. Yeah, I never used the cartridge. None of the BBS has worked properly with it. <laughs> okay. Um, next up, we have a Ron's Garage. All right. <laughs> Take it away, Ron. All righty. Let's see what I can do here for damage. <laughs> I want to get rid of that. I can't. Okay, fine. All right. <clears throat> oh, crap. All right. Uh, I got this here because uh, do you guys realize that uh, this version of DeskMate is a GUI and it's not a text-based interface like... Uh, Model 1000, Tandy. Interesting. Did you realize that? I think that's cool. Never really paid attention before until I got my 1000 up and put Duskmate on and saw that, uh, well, this is kind of, you know, it, it's quick and everything, but, you know, it's kind of disingenuous because it's like, yeah, they just threw this together with a program, you know. Maybe basic or something. I don't know. Is that what Deskmate three? Yes, it is. Yep. And uh, 
Do you guys see this thing? It is pretty cool. Little device. It scans whatever oh. thing you have and makes a 3D rendering of it. I thought that was pretty cool. And I don't know how you can use it with your printer, but it looks like you could. Yes? Yeah, yeah I believe I so. From there, you just run it through the slicer program. I just want to mention, Ron, too, uh, the original desk made for the Coco 1 and 2 also was graphical, too, not just the Coco 3 one. Yes, that's correct. Yep, yep. You're right. And you would be because you know it. Now, this here has caused a lot of controversy. <laughs> what happened was <laughs> Mr. Uh, Fiscarelli and I myself were chatting, and he was working on his uh, Coco ID program, and I was helping him because he wanted to detect uh, the 8 um, megabyte I have on um, – Paul um, Barton's machine and uh, he finally got that fixed and um, he's been passing it around and I think you'll see it you know on various places it's, it's a really neat little program anyway um, and I told him I said you know it's it's going to be uh, the first of April and it's you know time to play pranks and stuff and I had always thought about doing something related to uh, a uh, Facebook client and um and he said, yeah, that would be cool. He said, I just don't have time to do that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, all right. You know, didn't think much more of it. And then on the day, on the first, he sends me a <laughs> Coco FB uh, dot disk program. So I pulled it up and there it was. And I thought, yes, I'm posting it. So I posted it here on my uh, garage and then I put it on both Coco groups. And then I got a lot of interesting uh talk about it you know um and this guy says how about a link and so uh i put <laughs> <laughs> rick you better live up to expectations there yeah, well, well, someone just has to the... finish the facebook client and we're good and then i said on here i'll bet you were thinking there were no links to give <laughs> uh so that was cool did you, did you yeah. get a swarm of sales after that rick Sales don't swarm, but <laughs> well, see here it says, "I want it." Where do we get Rick's uh, device? Right. We're making them. See? Okay, and <laughs> they're here. Tony says, "Sign me up to whatever comes up." If you notice, I don't know. If you notice. <laughs> okay, and then I saw um, Steve Bjork's Coco Three repack on uh, Marketplace, and ev evidently after it had been sold, I don't know who to who. But um, he left it up for quite a while, evidently, again, because I uh, I saw it. And it says, uh, I bought this from the estate of Stephen Bjork. I would assume he used it. He t um, someone told me the badge doesn't match what it really is. That's because it's a Coco 3, right? And yeah. the, f the frame is not screwed into the base. I don't know anything about this. Um, the person Was it a Coco 3 or a Coco 2? I thought it was a Coco 1 or 2. It could be a two, yeah. Uh, I bought it from, said it was kind of powers up, but nothing happened. I didn't see this, so uh, I didn't see this to confirm. I didn't try plugging it in for fear of blowing up my house. <laughs> I'm not a computer expert or electrician. Sold as is for parts, I will not plug it in, so please don't ask. I also have the plastic cover, but it's sticky and torn up which is what they are these days right any of those covers you buy yeah the dust covers yeah crazy hmm. somebody said um roger taylor already spent too much money but <laughs> that was, uh... <laughs> a few more dollars yeah <laughs> yeah and then i've been using this plug and power thing since uh 2020 um 2022 evidently um yeah. And, and it makes my uh, uh, fountain go. You know, it starts at 5 in the morning, ends at 8 type of thing. And I just leave the controller down in case I have to turn it off to do something to it or whatever. But um, it's a pretty nice little thing. And I can actually uh, change the times if I want by going and putting it on my Coco, which is right here next to this controller. So if can, any of you guys have an X10 system, try it. Can, can testify. Those controllers are solid. Some of the yep. home computer stuff didn't really last too long, but all these original ones are still working. Yeah, and this had a 9-volt um, battery in it, 
and keep um, the timer. Yeah. 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 And what happened was, uh, I don't know, we were vacuuming or something and it come unplugged and I thought, Oh geez, now I got to program it again. But I plugged it back in and voila, it worked. <laughs> it's right. still, still cooking away. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. And then, uh, someone had one for sale somewhere. I put it on there. And then, uh, this is my Coco Pie three that I put a new, um, background on and it shows the um screen in the middle and i put that on my uh i put i put it on coco three uh, or the coco pie um group if somebody wants to put that as a background it's kind of neat to see different than all the green ones and then um i showed this this was um uh simon's <laughs> creation and i made one of those um things that you what a reel or whatever with the sound of uh this in the background i don't know if you can hear it can you hear it no nope. you can't hear it well if you, you probably if you forgot to share to sound it, before you share the screen yeah that's right it's it's the sound of fire crackling okay. <laughs> so it's, that's pretty so, good that's not part of the demo that's something you added right yeah it's something i added yeah the, the uh micro color computer will not give you sound unless you program it somehow and then um you know, the artwork on some of these things that uh, Pierre has um, produced or put together really look pretty cool, don't they? Check that out. Yeah, Just these love. are the AGD games uh, yeah. that are ported from the, uh, I can't remember what AGD stands for, but it's for the Spectrum, basically. It's a game designing system uh, yeah. that they've been using for years and years, and he's been porting them all over. We've got 260 ported over, and he's been porting yeah. some of them to the Super Sprite FM Plus now, too. Yep. And here he put Tandy 3 com color computer. I and guess Dragon. it looks better that way, huh? <laughs> it should be Tandy <laughs> color computer and then 3 at the bottom. But I guess I think those work. are supposed to be the color stripes. Yeah. I think are so. they? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just like so, the dragon has the dragon <laughs> logo above it. This would work on 2 then to also, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the RGB okay. stripes are on Coco 2s as well. All right. It's a little later Coco 2s. The early ones had the three little bubble things like the Coco yeah. 1 does. And Archie then I had stripes. The, the sound of our show uh, starting up in the background of this while while it was playing. You can get this on, um, uh, and I think it's the distribution of um, the Coco SD. It's um, called Banner or something like that, and you you just basically program it. It has no way to save it, so you have to program it each time and you tell it what color you want for each line, and it uh, scrolls. So. Was that a commercial program or a rainbow typing no, or something? I think it's, uh, I don't know where it came from. Oh, it, I, do I have it on here? Oh, TND. Electronic okay. billboard. Yeah, there you go. 1985. Yep. And when you first started up, that's what it looks like. And, it, it, you know, it advertises itself, basically, that runs. Yeah, because there was some, there was some commercial versions of something similar to that back in the early 80s. I remember seeing them. Oh. Our club had one bought. I don't remember what the name of it was, unfortunately. Neat. And then I thought this Adam game was cool, so I told uh, Ken about it, and he said he put it on his list. And it has um, pretty good artwork. That's one Mark Siegel really is very proud it. of. Really? Yeah. Oh, Adam, I remember playing that when I was a kid and had a lot of fun with it. Okay. Well, Unfortunately, it's one of the ones that doesn't work properly in a Coco 3, but... Well, it, this is on a, my Black 2, so yeah. it's cool. Like the graphical part where you're actually are, you know importing the uh, electrons and stuff from that part works fine, but yeah. when it shows the periodic table, that doesn't work right because it's uh, a higher semi graphics mode. The Coke Three doesn't support unless you have a Gimme X. Yeah, and actually, I was shocked to see this because of the, it's so, so colorful and uh, and artistically done. You know, each one of these. Uh, yeah, well, what, Mark, which... I think mentioned that he helped design this game, and he also designed the poster that came with it, the full periodic table, and he was quite proud of that too. It was a big yeah. fold out poster. I, I never had the original, so I haven't seen the poster, but I imagine you have it. No. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'm not yeah, a filthy game pirate. Guy. No, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> I'm not a game guy much, but I do go through and look at stuff. And, and you know, there's a rare occasion where I do um, play some of the stuff and, uh, and I find myself either getting addicted to it and want to play it more, or I just go, nah, I don't think so. You know? Well, th this one was actually educational. This, this actually has some physics in it, it's not just a game. Yeah. Like you learn at the same time. I'm using a TV screen, so it's not, um, it didn't come out all that well, so I didn't go close to it. 
So, so the uh, ad for uh, the show is coming up. This is uh, for the guy that uh, was doing, he wanted uh, somebody to make him a Forgotten Machines logo for his old Coco One. And I told him, uh, no problem on the three, no problem on the uh, VG6, which is Coco VGA, but I couldn't make a color on my, um, I couldn't figure out a way to make a color. I could make it black and white, but he wanted color. So I think um, Simon came up with something. And he did a good job. Cool. This is the forgotten. Um, yeah, he's a, he's he's a, he's one of the vendors at. Uh, I don't know if he's really vending anything, but he's one of the people at Coco Fest this year. He's actually got his own. I think he's got the hallway table, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. Oh, is that I the guy so. that has the drive-in yeah. display that takes up the yeah. hallway? I think that's <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, this this is the color computer um, sc screen that was fed in from a booth uh, to the to the car. Which I thought maybe they had the machine stuck under the dash somewhere, you know, it was a cartridge in it, but no, I guess not. And then I put, uh, I think I might have this on before, but um, this is, uh, what's his name? Oh, now nah, see, I get stupid. Yeah, oh, there you go. Nah. <laughs> um, it's um, Adam's Digital Basement. And he did a really good job on explaining the how it works. Adrian. Adrian, yeah. That's it, guys. Thanks a lot for your yeah. It's it's, it's pretty amazing that that Steve got that to work as well as it did uh, using the techniques yeah. and the hardware that he had to work with. That was and back in the day. And a lot of people yeah. are very impressed when they go back and take a look and go, "Wait a sec, there's no like they open the cartridge expecting there's extra hardware doing all this calculation." Yeah. They're going, right? "There's no. a ROM." It's <laughs> <a chip>. <laughs> <laughs> magic is in the cocoa yeah right. that's right and the program yeah, programmer yeah yeah right nick since you showed up yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're not so happy with tomorrow huh i just woke up <laughs> that's what 3 30 in the morning there or something ah uh, 4 30 now 4 30 now okay oh easy that's about when i went to bed which i'll explain why later Okay. Um. Well, what's our next segment? Uh, game on. Well, before we get to game on, I want Mark to answer a question that came about Coco Tech from James Jones in the chat before it all slips our minds and it's gone in the ether. Oh darn! Okay. <laughs> I gave you as much warning as I could in our private chat. That's fine. That's fine. No, I'm. I. I was actually thinking about that this week. Thinking, you know, it's been a while since we did a Coco Tech. I really should do one. And then it's like, oh no, it's like less than a month till Coco Fest, and I'm kind of busy on other stuff. So it looks like I'll be picking that up here shortly after Coco Fest. So uh, very shortly. And if anybody has anything that they would like to present a Coco Tech on, or if they uh, um, have something that they might be interested in hearing about that I can contact somebody, because I actually do know a whole bunch of people in the community, or know people who know people, uh, please uh, send me a message. I have an email, uh, Coco Tech at the Coco Nation uh, that you can uh, send uh, requests to, or uh, if you want to offer to present something. And uh, there's a lot more stuff to cover. I just haven't really looked at it in the last couple of months since, uh, well, since the holidays. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's not forgotten. There's there's definitely a need for this type of stuff. I've looked back at the uh, the replays on YouTube and, you know, they're not like our daily show, but uh, there's quite a few people tuning in and looking at it. So there's demand. I, I have a couple of subjects I'll be I'll be getting into on that. So I'll, I'll contact you about those. Excellent. I, I might even sneak one in before the fest if things go well. So, okay. Curtis, you want a soldering lesson? No, we don't have time for a, a year-long <laughs> complete failure video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have something you have already together, Curtis, then we could just throw that in up sometime. I've got some sparse notes. I've actually got to write some little demos and stuff and it kind of scripted a bit. But yeah, I've got a couple of ideas. Okay. Well, uh, the sooner we know... When some almost nine, have... some basic. Good. The sooner we can, the sooner we can stick it on the calendar and get start promoting it. So... All right. That's all I have to say at the moment. There will be more Coco Tech. There is demand for it, and I've had a good time doing it so far. 
and uh, looking forward to doing some more. Hey, Curtis. I'm going to recruit Rick Euland to help me too. <laughs> Curtis, when, uh, when I showed the uh, um, deskmate stuff, when you do deskmate on your uh, release in the future, are you going to have both um, level, you know, the Cocoa 2 version and 3? Or is it going to... Um, I'll probably concentrate on the 3 first. The Cocoa 2... <clears throat> I've had a couple oh. problems with some of the games and stuff under for level 1. If it uses double buffering, like two high-res screens, it won't fit. You have to strip the boot file down to nothing, like get rid of CoWin and go to CoGraph and ditch a bunch of extra drivers and stuff to get it to fit because it needs 12K out of your system app just for the screens. Never mind extra pass, process descriptors, et cetera. So it's going to be tight. Like some of the games I've been trying to do, like Biosphere is fun because it only uses a single screen, but some other ones like Cavewalker use two. Um, and there's another couple that use two as well. So there's, it, it depends on how it's set up. I haven't had a chance to look at it closely enough. I don't think it would use double buffering. So it still should be possible, but I don't know for sure until I look. Hmm. Gotcha. But Thanks. by the time you're into a Coco 2, you might as well just run decimate as decimate, right? I mean, its its windowing system is adequate for what you can do on a Coco Two anyway. Yeah, you know, it, it's sort of menu scheme and GUI is fine, basically. It's only when Maybe you get a to GUI Cocoa on 3. a GUI if you're running it under EOS. Right. <laughs> Where you know, on, on a Coco Three, <laughs> if you could run Deskmate from MultiView without having to have the intermediary of the Coco of the Deskmate GUI. Then it might actually be really handy, you know. Some of those little applets you could pull up in multi-view and do some weird little thing. And yeah, I probably won't go that far. I'll just get it running so you can launch it the normal way. I already have to modify multiple programs to get it to even run properly because it's all hard coded for floppy drives and a bunch of other crap. Huh. Okay. You have to patch. There's a lot of D zeros in there, not D Ds. Oh. Right. Unless you want to go right. rename your descriptors, but that's kind of a pain. No, that's that's it. Nasty. Hard-coded paths to some of its files, too, which I want to change. I got to do that with Home Publisher, too, because it put all of the graphics, uh, you know, clip art and stuff, all has to go in the commands directory. Why would you put it there? There's already <laughs> enough stuff. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's there's literally like 200 files in EOU right now stuck in the commands directory because that's how they hard-coded. And unfortunately, I had dissembled a lot of Home Publisher back in the commercial days of Nitrous 9, but that was part of my great hard drive crash. I don't have any of that anymore, so I have to redo it from scratch again. But uh, I will fix that. Reference paths, trying to locate resources since it's already there for the commands. Hey, we'll just throw it in there. Then we'll find it. Yeah, I'll probably yeah. put it in like sys slash home publish or something like that. So it's obvious where it goes, but not in the middle of commands directory. <laughs> it's just right. It's right. not an executable. It's a piece of art. What is it doing in the commands directory? Like icons. Yeah. <laughs> that's like oh. putting spaghetti into a coffee machine. That's what that's like. Yeah, yeah. But will it clean it out? <laughs> no. No, no. Anyway. There's desk made on Bob Emery's uh, running a Cocoa 3 graphics demo. Yeah, that's one of the uh, store demos, I think. Yeah, it was the first one they did, actually. The first Spectral did, and then they did the Christmas one a couple months later. We didn't have much of a demo scene on the Coco. I think we were all busy doing real things. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, right. And by now, all of the things, you have better alternatives already in EOU. You know, DynaCalc, DynaStar, you know, all the Dyna things are there. Why would you want Deskmate's little editor when you can use well, If you don't want to actually learn a whole word processor, you just want a quick note-taking app, it's actually not bad. Well, it's Yeah, it's, it's not bad for certain things, but... At the time, a lot of people used it because that's what you could afford. You had the one thing. Yeah, well, you you paid, what was it? It was 69 or 99 bucks, I think. But it right. gave you like six apps. You have a like a, a graphic paint program. You have a spreadsheet. You have a word processor, terminal program, like a uh, filer. Was, right. You got it for and a bit then, for it. It's like getting VIP library or something and, like that. And then to give it a little more boost, someone made that hack so that you could run all the individual deskmate apps from MultiView. Even though it was kind of wrecking the cocoa in the process, you could just kick <laughs> them up and do stuff. You know, yeah. So every every app's works, a different you know? a different program, and then there's a little thing they call Turnkey, which is to basically do the launcher thing. And then when right. you pick an app, it just literally you know chains to the next app and kills the GUI itself, and then chains back to the GUI when you're when you're done because you're you're limited by 64k on you know workspace type thing. And they wanted to run on 128k cocoa, so 
we don't have that limitation anymore. So back on the back in the day when I tried the um, terminal program, I had a heck of a time trying to figure out how how to get the uh, terminal program to even run. And then I went and looked at the you know instructions after playing around with it a long time, and then I realized I just had the syntax of the slash t thing wrong. You know, t one or whatever it was. Yeah, and, t one or t two, depending on the bit banger. It worked. It worked very well. At, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad little program. Sweet yeah. program, sweet actually. Yes. Yeah. I had one thing. Yeah, we always talk about games, and that's something. It's you can it's it's much easier it. to learn than say VIP library, which is more sophisticated. Like it's spreadsheet oh, yeah. and then word processor is much more powerful than deskmates. But on the other hand, you better have the manual handy if you've never used it before. Well, one thing about uh, v VIP writer and stuff, they had uh, help right there. Yeah, I can't remember. Does Des I thought Deskmate had some help too? Doesn't have a little question mark icon? Yeah, it does. Click? It's rather limited. Right, right, but it was more of the you could just stumble into Deskmate and yeah. get through yeah. it. Yeah. Where, right. Even though they, they, they followed help. the philosophy of keep it simple, stupid. Yes. Right. <laughs> We're like VIP writer. You had to know how to use it, even to use the help. You had to know how to use the help. <laughs> and you another, the help. <laughs> another thing I struggled <laughs> with in the early days was I I spend a lot of time changing color and everything and and it looked good you know and then i got off of the program and then i got back on it later and it was back to regular settings and i'm thinking to myself well how the heck do i save it and i realized that you have to go in and close it and then it saves the value so that when you go back on you, you have the color scheme that you picked right but i didn't know that though they they didn't have a screen saying it is now safe to turn off your computer. No, like yeah. some systems. <laughs> Ready. <clears throat> there, Ken. Ken's already sipping coffee, so I think he's ready it to do his uh, time to time on. to roll. <laughs> Who, what, where, when, why? Okay, so we'll take our first break. Hey Taylor, we're watching the Coco Nation show. Yeah, we are. Woo! You should too. Everyone, it's your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo, and joined by that dastardly The Brent from ARG Presents. You're watching Coco Nation. I feel like that should have been longer. The Coco Nation show would like to thank the following patrons. Alex Gayer, Brendan Donahue, Brian Walsh, Brian Weasler, Karen Ascom, Coconut Bob, Daddy Burrito, David Ladd, Derek Smithson, Diego BF109, Don Barber, Eric Canales, Frederick Sigard, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Wabke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Justin Larson, Ken Reichard, Kevin Holloway, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, R. Allen Murphy, Retro Tech Time, Rob Binman, Rocky Hill, Steve Batson, TJB Chris, Tom C, Tom Gunderson, Tom S, and William A. Thing. Thank you so much, patrons. Welcome to everybody's favorite segment, Who's New to Discord? Tis Rog says, hello everyone. My name is Roger. And my first computer was a Coco 2 that I got in the 80s and that started a joy of programming that is still going on today. I owe a lot to that computer. Jeff P says, Hi everyone. I'm Jeff, and recently acquired a new to me Coco 3. Looking forward to learning more about it. Hi D who says, Hey everywhere, been spending more time with my Cocos lately, came over here to see what's up. Long time Coco 1 and Coco 2 user and helping with FujiNet hardware currently. Someday I'll own a Coco 3. Chris T. 
the previous bios were edited for time. Thanks to, Boysen, Glenside Computer Club, Micro Hobbyist Frederick, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Tandy Color Computer 3, and the Coco Nation patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer. Just go to discord.thecoconation.com. See you on Discord! Welcome everybody to the Coco Nation Game On Challenge of the Week results video. This week we played Star Blaze. We had a total of 15 players. We had Ed Rhodes with 500, Henry 600, Mike 950, Mark O 1000, Coconut Bob 2050, Tied for ninth, we had Shenley and Mr. Dave 6309 with 2300. Sabhead 4150, Sloopy Malibu 4300, Jim Rye 4350, Kasirinsan 4400, L. Curtis Boyle 4700, Paul Shoemaker 4950, Dr. Ted 5050, and this week's number one score is. Canadian Retro Things with 7,300. Thanks everybody that played. We'll see you again next week. And the you won one. <laughs> <laughs> the second one in a row. Woohoo. And yes, right. I cheated. <laughs> well, then, I'm kidding. Then, I didn't cheat. Well, we still got to give you the salute. Oh, okay. Salute. Salute. Gosh, that was a thanks. lot of wind up for that. <laughs> I have a quick question for you, Ken. Which which Henry was that that got Not on the me. scoreboard? Was that Henry Reitfeld or Henry the uh, third? The one that's just called Henry in the uh, Discord. Yeah, there's a Henry, and then there's me, the Henry the third. Okay, yeah, that must be Henry Reitfeld then. I wasn't sure which one it was. Um. Okay, so uh, I did find a few things about this game, so. I do have to say that 7,300 is the highest I've ever scored on that game. So, um, I played just... that game, but I guess I didn't capture the screenshot to post it. Uh, it would have been real low anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we have a rainbow here from, I think it's uh, November of 1984. And we have a star blaze with a top score of 11,000 which I think would be really tough to get, but I will get into how I think that is actually a score and a couple of 9,000 scores. And then uh, we did have a review. Um, okay, so uh, I kind of questioned some of the things this reviewer said, like it's a Star Trek type program. I have absolutely no idea how it's Star Trek type. I'm no. betting this reviewer doesn't normally play games. <laughs> and um, he does uh, get into an entire paragraph of talking about how it, your ship flies over the surface of a planet, yet um, your mission is to, to defend 64 sectors of your galaxy. So why does every place you go look like a planet and gets into the realism of that? Because, uh, because people it wouldn't be living in space. space. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's um, a Coco game. Yeah, it's a, it's a game, and he does say that it's not a boring game. Um, not only do you have to avoid uh, the and fight the alien ships, you also have to maneuver your ship to restock your supplies. Um, and your ship can still come under attack while you're restocking. He would have liked it to have a more realistic setting. Now, uh, I. How it's a game where you're fighting aliens in space. What was it? Well, was this was this guy playing Elite I don't on the BBC Micro? Because I mean, that's the only thing that would explain why he thought that like the Coco could give us better realism at that time. Well, he is a doctor, so um, maybe he thought that you should just uh, spend fifteen. Is years he a doctor? From... Is he a doctor of computer science? 
I, I don't know. Maybe he thought that the game should have you flying for 15 years between different sectors and yeah, do it in real time. <laughs> yeah. Do it in real time. And oh, sub battle simulator. Great. It's oh, just, fuck. yeah. Uh, but anyways, he did say it does provide many hours of entertainment. So I just thought it was really weird how he got into this tangent on the, the realism of the game that. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing he's not, he's one of the reviewers that didn't normally play games. Cause a lot of them, like you'd, you'd give them a Galaxian clone. They wouldn't have a clue what Galaxian is. Mm-hmm. Right. That would just happen to be a lot of the people at rainbow reviews. They have a word processor, though, on the other hand. Then they know what they're doing. The reason that I think you could uh, score higher on that is um, when I was playing the game, uh, the score that I got was one of my better games that I've ever played. But I think whenever the aliens blow up one of your depots, it takes out a bunch of the aliens, too. Because I did notice that after one of my uh, fuel depots got blown up, which I had been there fighting all the aliens... And then I uh, had to warp out of there to go fix my ship up. And I came back after they had destroyed the fuel depot and there was way less aliens than when I left. So you don't get any points for running into the aliens. You only get points when you shoot them. So I think you could get a higher score as long as you make sure with the less depots that they blow up and the less times that they hit you and take out your shields. That makes sense. Now, now the higher we, skill levels, is there more ships to deal with? Yes. Or is it just harder? It is, and they're a lot harder because they do actually dive bomb you quite a bit in the higher levels. Like, I actually beat level eight, but my score was way lower than my level six. I, I beat that one. My high score, I got beating level six, and I think I only lost, like, two depots in that one. Whenever I played level eight, I lost, like, four or five depots, so... Yeah, Brian Weasler and Chaz claiming I got over 10,000 on multiple occasions. I think that's his late April Fool's joke. <laughs> Pictures or it didn't happen. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. Um, tips and tricks for this game. The way that I would do it is if I went into a heavily aliened area, I just went full thruster along the very bottom of the screen because... Uh, if they're trying to blow up your depots, they're conglomerating around the bottom of the screen. So if you just fly through and fire, you take out a good portion of the aliens before you actually have to get up and fight them on multiple levels. So I seem to run into the aliens more often than shooting them, which means my shields went and then I went. Yeah. Numerous times. And yeah, you have to do a fair bit of shooting. When I skim on the bottom, I kind of bounce up and down just a little bit because sometimes they're not right at the exact level. Right. So. Yeah, I found well, it's I figure, good. Yeah, I take moving. out a good portion of them before I actually yeah. try to engage them, because then they can't. With less of them there, they don't swarm you as badly. Yeah, and and also don't feel like a coward if you have to run to a depot and yeah, oh yeah, before you as clean away. As your shields about... are gone, have your have, be ready to hit that W as soon as your shields <laughs> go. Just hit warp because they cannot kill you while you're in warp. I think you, you can still kill them, them though, can't you? Or yeah, yeah, you can shoot them, and you do get points for that. I like the phrase heavily aliened area. <laughs> yeah, it's a good game. I, the fact that it's a cross of kind of like a defender scramble thing, but with all of the, you know, and you don't just have one thing, like a lot of games similar to this would have like a fuel depot or a repair depot and that's it. One yeah. of them would do everything, but you actually have separate ones. And you have to go to different sectors to repair everything on your ship and top up your torpedoes and a completely different one to go get your fuel done. So you really have to manage a bit, which really adds a lot to the game. I, I quite like that part of it. And just going back to the um, the article that was written about it for the realism, I, I had a little trouble swallowing the fact that you don't blow up your fuel depot to get fuel like you do in all the other games. <laughs> Like, yeah, because yeah. yeah, that makes you, perfect sense. How do you actually right, get right. fuel by parking at the fuel depot? You've got like to scramble it up. <laughs> right. Yeah, scramble. Right. You shoot it, shoot them with shoot them with a drop bomb, and somehow you refuel from that. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Because you're blowing it up and all the fuel's flying up and you're catching it in your ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this was much more realistic, honestly, than a lot of the games of the similar spec and scope back in the day of 1983 when this came out i don't know i don't understand why he's being fussy what is he comparing it to 
I don't know. Real right. space. Right. Well, then you should complain about sound effects. There's, there's no sound effects in space. <laughs> well, you are on a planet surface in every section, though. So there might be an atmosphere there. Oh, true. Yeah, it's blue, blue sky. And that would be refracted light through an atmosphere to get blue. So that makes sense. So what's he complaining about with the realism? <laughs> I know. He should go back to playing microscopic mission, I guess. <laughs> oh, wait, that didn't come out for another four years. All right. So, um, yeah, that was one of my favorite games. Uh, one of a number of my favorite games when I was a kid. So I enjoyed it. It's up there for me. One. one of the best games Greg Zumwalt ever did. <clears throat> biosphere i really like too that's a simulation so you have to be into that style of game to like it uh but the, the whole you know merging dnas of two different creatures and creating new ones that was such an awesome thing to do that back then but as far as a space shooter type thing a defender style game that's that's one of the best ones and it's got enough originality it's not just a clone so mm -hmm. i quite yeah. like it All right. good sound effects good graphics even with the color you know they didn't pick artifact colors you know just a generally good game. I think even Nick liked it, and he's pretty fussy. I, I didn't play it, um, but I uh, uploaded to the Discord a uh, a Color Computer Three modified color palette set. Uh, it just improves the the look of the game a bit more. Yeah, you also uploaded the Coco Three fixed version just to play the regular one too, didn't you? Well, yeah. I mean, I downloaded the uh, the Coco Three fixed version off the uh, archive. And it didn't work and just kept crashing. So yeah, I had I, the same I, problem. I had to go back I, to an old version I my archives. <laughs> so I, I, I seem to recall that I, I'm sure I played this file back in the day off disk. Yeah, I, I did. I, that's the one I ended up grabbing was my disk version. Yeah. So I, I dug it up, found it, still had it, and it worked fine. So <laughs> Ken Riker in the chat says in space no one can hear you refuel. <laughs> <laughs> and Exile and, Spar and Paradise says you hear the inside of your spacesuit in space. Oh, that's true. That heavy breathing. There, there better be some fans going on in there. <laughs> As you're sweating away, getting shot at by a multitude of aliens. No background music? Orchestra orchestral? You know. Well, how many times have you been in a real space battle, Mark, where you actually have an orchestra sitting behind you, I guess, is the question. It's not realistic enough, right? Well, right. The <laughs> last time I was in a real space battle. That depends. Come on. Was didn't, it, didn't, was didn't, it didn't anybody see that? By Mel Brooks? Did, yeah, I was going to say, didn't by... anybody see that wonderful space documentary, Spaceballs? <laughs> <laughs> you always have a timpanist available. Always. Mm -hmm. I think this is earlier times, though. The ship's too small to hold that, so... Like you're talking Death Star size stuff there. Oh, yeah. oh no, it was only three kilometers long. That's right. says you hear your own tinnitus. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have anything else to add about Star Blaze? Great game. Go play it if you haven't done it yet. <laughs> oh man! Oh, I, I love Ken's. I love Ken's statement in the chat. He's quoting something. I'm not sure who the, he's quoting, but he's quoting something. Who are they? They're my theme music. Every good hero should have some. <laughs> all right so the other game that we played this week was monster maze and uh i have to say that um just sitting in the uh game on challenge live with curtis i learned a whole bunch of tips and tricks i did not know about this game so curtis would you like to mention those tips and tricks to help no because one guy already beat them. my score so now you got to go back and well, cool. You can drive everyone else. Down. No, I'm not going to go back. It's like literally once once you kind of get the hang of it, you can go forever. That's why I quit playing it back in the day. Like the screenshot I submitted was just over twenty five thousand, I think, and yeah. I had thirty four men left. And you just get bored and you kind of stop. Um, but yeah, basically the trick is always exit up if you can. Um, mainly because the robots can shoot through walls that are above them to the left of them, the right of them. They cannot shoot through the bottom, but you can shoot up through a wall. So the big thing to learn is the timing. Like you just twitch the joystick so that you're right up against the wall and hold down the fire button so you can pause easier. And then you can start shooting through walls, you know, with impunity in the same three directions robots can. But if you're coming up from the bottom, uh, any of the ones above you can't hit you. 
uh, if there's a wall in between, but you can kill them. If you have uh, robots on the sides of you, right as soon as you appear in a room, immediately just start moving down so that you can dodge your shots because they shoot fairly high up on the robot. So if you go down just a few pixels, they can't hit you, but you can still shoot them in the feet. So then you can just, you know, move down, yeah, fire both feet, directions and take care of them. That's the, you're shooting them in the feet. That's right. Yeah, the tentacle feet, whatever they want to call them. <laughs> <laughs> you're just shooting uh, them in the crotch. Don't don't uh, same as Star Blaze. Like uh, don't don't be the hero. If uh, you get into a situation where you had to go left to right, and you're in a room where you're just going to get nailed, get out of there as quick as you can. Don't even worry about the gold. Don't worry about killing robots. Just get out. Um, you won't get the bonus points uh, for missing the gold or exiting the room after you get gold, but you get a free man. So who cares? You don't get a free man <laughs> if you leave the room without the gold. Or no, free as in you don't die on that level. Because if you try yeah. to be the hero, you will right. probably get killed. Right. And there's sometimes you just can't avoid it, just to, the random placement. But one thing I liked about the game is that once in a while you get a room with no robots at all. And that's a free just man wander level. over, pick up the gold, saunter along, and away you go. Remember, this is from the guy who quit the game with 34 extra men. <laughs> and the sad thing was, I wasn't even the yeah, best player in my local Coco Club at this game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious to see what the rainbow scores are on this one because I could see somebody maxing out the score if they had the patience. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, definitely in this one, whatever, however high the score is in rainbow, that's a believable score. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the the difficulty doesn't really ramp up after the first little bit; it just kind of stays there. It's, it depends. Whatever, if you get randomly like eight robots instead of zero, obviously that's a bit more difficult, but. Also, still, keep an eye on your diagonal shots, which you can also shoot through walls. Um, so sometimes you can hit the robot in the feet because he fires at a different height than you. He might still be missing you and can't move any further, so you can just pick him off. There's a lot of little little things like that. But I uh, definitely recommend a, a self-centering joystick that makes it much easier to like stock up to the wall before you hit it. It's a good game, man. And the fact that it ran on a 4K Coco, it's pretty late for a 4K game because it came out in 80. Three or eighty-two? I can't remember now. Um, not a hundred percent sure. Just let me take. That but I know, like Tandy wasn't even selling four K Cocos by the time this game came out, so that was just a throwback to the people that bought the original and didn't you know, upgrade it. That it's actually a nice little berserk game, and it adds in uh, the wall through shooting through walls. Both you and the robots can do that, and also treasures to pick up. So it's got a little bit more to it than just berserk. February nineteen eighty-three. All right. Well, uh, shall we talk about our live session that we had? Yes. Sorry, I showed up so late. That's fine. No, don't do that again. You got to show up earlier, or we won't let you in. I get my life back. <laughs> <laughs> All I got to do is be late. <laughs> All right. So we had a few people in playing both the games so uh i think we had a couple of first timers playing star blaze this week so we had to yeah i completely uh, missed the beginning of the show i don't even know who was on um marco me uh i was me, late i didn't get there until hour and a half um, in jim jim rye mark you do you didn't actually play anything did you you just read the yeah, instructions Oh, you did? Yeah, I played uh, the, uh, not the Star Blaze, the, the Monster Maze. Oh, okay. And I even so posted a score, 1,800. Oh, okay. I haven't uh, tallied the scores yet, so I don't know who all posted scores. But and yeah, I know I that... I found um, some deeper levels. A few people that uh, were playing uh, Star Blaze for the first time were like, okay, you, you load it up and there's nothing to do. Just fly around this planet. They didn't know anything about the uh, bringing up the maze and stuff, or bringing up the um, the map, map, and then warping to sectors. And well, that's because they missed the week before show. Where they I missed the instruction reading. The See, dramatic so reading. You have to be there every week for the entire show. Come on, people. <laughs> yeah, you have to come in early so you can get the uh, dramatic reading by Mark B, where where he's he's basically the equivalent of Shakespeare. Um, yeah, you're know, reciting these manuals. So, if I can find them, I'll read it. I'll yeah, at least it. when he reads it, it, the he mispronounces so much stuff. It sounds like he's speaking old English. 
<laughs> and then point, pointing out the typographical errors they've got in the manual. Yeah. That's another game we play. How many mistakes did Handy make in this manual? <laughs> With a little color commentary. <laughs> Yeah, Dad and Breed on the chat says Starblade is a great game. I spent lots and lots and lots of hours playing that fun game. I did as well as a kid. And um, I guess it uh, my, my uh, understanding of the game was better now because I definitely was able to beat it a lot easier than when I was a kid. Yeah, and that's not something you hear too often, like people in our age group <laughs> getting better at games than we were as right? a kid. That's Unless well, it's like a text adventure or strategy game maybe but i think this game yeah um you maybe didn't have to uh rely on your reflexes quite as much it's not quite as twitchy yeah if you had a good strategy and weren't so stupid as i was when i was a kid to sit and try to fight the aliens even when i had no shields that was one way i often died when i was a kid but now it was just like you lose your shields, boom, hit warp. I stayed alive a lot better than I did when I was a kid. Yeah. Actually, watching the gameplay now, I forgot. It actually kind of fakes parallax scrolling too. Yep. In a very low key way, but the little blue mountaintops or whatever, they're, they, they yeah, scroll slower in the background than the foreground. The, those The green humps in the background move a lot slower than the blue. And, then and the, the blues blue go at different speeds depending on how high up there. Like yeah, there's, there. there's basically three levels of parallax, like three levels of scrolling. So you got the closest blue humps, the middle blue humps, and then the green humps. They all go at different speeds. Yeah, Greg did really well in this one. I don't know. I was going to ask Mark. I don't know if he's in the chat today. I didn't get a chance to check. I don't know if yes. this is one of the ones that was commissioned yes. and designed by you know Mark or somebody else at Tandy that was asked, you know, Greg, can you do this? Or if Greg came up with this one on his own, but it's it's a really good game. Mm -hmm. Oh, another strategy that I had for it is um, always work your way from the uh, lower right-hand corner up to the upper left-hand corner because it does have a weird thing that when your joystick centers, you automatically face to the left, like go to the right side of the screen facing left. So... Is, if does that working, matter how you adjust the little uh, lever on the deluxe? Or? Well, if you adjust the little lever, then you're actually just going to thrust in that direction. It will thrust you in that direction, but you'll be constantly moving. Okay, so center that. defaults to left no matter what. Basically. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. So that's a good thing. And you know. uh, if you warp going from the lower right to the upper left on the grid, then you travel to the left. So when you come into the um uh, bing. And when you yeah, come you're... into an area with uh monster or with uh aliens, you can just continue flying straight. You don't without uh if you let your joystick go, you don't automatically turn around and it stops you. Right. You're going left, you come into the left, start shooting. That's yeah. good. Is it, is it just me or when you when you dock that the your ship puts on landing gear? Yep, it does. Oh, I didn't notice that. How many yeah, times have I played you, this? <laughs> as soon as you stop, little wheels pop out. See, there's the little wheels. And then as oh, soon as you go, go. I've never noticed that this entire time in 40 years. I have never noticed that. <laughs> You're welcome. Huh. Yeah, I'm too busy to pay attention and not getting killed and trying to shoot things. I never noticed uh, that. I think that also might be a way that he tells whether you can actually dock because if you're hovering above the ground by the littlest, littlest bit, your oh. landing gear isn't down, and you don't dock. So you have okay. to see the wheels to actually dock. Yeah. Okay. So that might be uh, a way that he could tell whether your ship was actually docking or just hovering. Yeah, no shadow, so, yeah. Huh, I learned something new in a game I've played for years. Wow. All right, so Thursday nights in the uh, Discord channel for the Game On Challenge, we play this starting at 5, five o'clock Pacific time. What, 8 like o'clock Eastern. 8 o'clock Eastern time. So, uh, yeah, come on in and play either the game of the week or any other game that you want. Um, as Coconut Bob often does, he'll 
play different games. So we don't mind. Or if you just want to hang out and talk. Or yeah, and if you can't talk, or like if you can't join the live show on, you know, a camera or microphone, you can always come in ch the chat room too and yeah. on Facebook and YouTube and, and uh, Twitch and Twitch. Uh, chat back and forth with the people playing. Sometimes the game's complicated and they're so busy they want to answer you for half an hour. But yeah. Well, that, that's true. We're, <laughs> we concentrate really hard on these games, man. All right. So shall we look at what the new game is? And roll, um, please. I will give you a hint. We already know what the new game is because uh, somebody stole my thunder earlier in one of their segments. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Oh no, another space game. Another no, space no. game. No, it's a subatomic game. Subatomic game, yep. and you are, oh. well, it's uh, subatomic space. There's space in the yeah, subatoms. You're flying around the quantum foam, basically, at this point. Yeah. Yep. Whatever it's an do, educational do not, game, so you're going to learn stuff. Whatever you do, do not let your electron hit the nucleus. <laughs> I tried playing this, and um, I have to read the instructions because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> But of course, this was a um, suggestion from Ron. If I recall correctly, it plays best with the Black Beauty. So we will and, be playing you, Atom. You, you so are you're not going to want to miss Thursday's show as there's the reading of this because even though it's a kid's game, I think there's a little bit of explanation that has to come on how to play it. And plus, as you go through the levels and you have to build the different elements, there's different numbers of electrons. You have to keep track of that kind of stuff. Like it's, oh, yep. you do actually learn in this game. It's it's one of the better yeah. educational ones because it's actually fun. Yeah, I, I didn't do that good in chemistry. And well, um, now's your chance. <laughs> also, as you said, it doesn't quite work properly on the Coco Three. The the periodic table stuff because it's using semigraphics twelve I think you it'll oh okay repeat stuff at the top and you won't see the bottom at all. Um, Although you could uh, use that poke with the semigraphics mode, and then yeah, you just that, wouldn't see the words. If you on poke there. into four, but I can't remember. Does Nick, do you remember? Does that screw up the P mode four, or just does it leave that alone? Uh, I think it leaves it alone. Okay, then yeah, you you can do the poke. You won't be able to read the text though. Yeah. It'll just show the graphics. You'll see the little boxes, but you won't see like HE for helium or something yeah. like that. So you won't quite learn as much. But... Oh, you have to really lean on your chemistry knowledge there. <laughs> if, if if the scan of the chart that Mark Siegel designed is on the archive, you can download that and have it handy. Yeah. Because I believe that has basically the whole thing that the screen basically duplicates. But yeah, you learn, you learn a periodic table, like how many electrons does each element have? And you know, which of the what are they called? The uh, energy level valence, things, the yeah. orbits, the valence levels, and uh -huh. all of that stuff. And oh, I assume and he's got it. In yeah, two weeks, there will be a written test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I glad I'm quitting attending now? I, I like announced earlier there. No, no, no. no it's going to be on this show that there'll be a written test. Everybody on the panel is going to have to take a written test. Oh, I'll be busy preparing for that Coco Tech Mark and I were talking about. I won't be able to make it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. And Priorities. I'm not going to be here either. So Sloopy's <laughs> going to be giving everybody a written test. Uh, I got to curl my um, hair. I don't know that is Sloopy even going to be able to do that because we've got um, we've got VCF East coming up. Oh, in two weeks. Oh, <laughs> not like in like in like in this Thursday. Yeah, like Friday starts PCS East. Like... Oh no, no, this is in two weeks. Ah, um, if it's third, yeah, we get another Thursday, week. We yet. might have to have somebody else do the live or the game on challenge. But wow, the manual for Adam. But Sloopy does. I, I am actually not going to be here in two weeks, so Sloopy will. Yeah, there's actually two Hopefully events on that same weekend: uh, VCF East and the Indie Classic Computer and Gaming Expo. So it's a busy weekend. You know, these shows, i got to coordinate stuff better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at least, like, right if, they, if, they put, if they put the Indie uh, Gaming Classic the same weekend as Coke Fest, that's only a four-hour drive. You could make both one day each, you know, type thing, but BCF East is way off in of New Jersey somewhere. I think it's a bit longer of a drive. Yep. In the earthquake zone. 
<laughs> yeah, <Right>. access <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> The, the earthquake that startled me the most was the one in Taiwan, though, because uh, on the Amigos, some of the people that live in Europe and right. in Taiwan and stuff yeah, like that were actually that. talking about it before I even heard it on the, our local news. And some did of the video footage there, like the one guy backing up his car's boulders are rifling off the thing and nailed the car ahead of him on so the edge of a, a mountain. There was like, a wow. building slanted like 50 degrees off to one side. Yep, there was a couple of them. That was amazing. Yeah. Oh, and just uh, just a thing here that uh six he said in the uh, chat is that uh, for adam if you can avoid it just don't play it on the coco 3 play it on something else so you mm, get the yeah, full right. effect of the game right do we have an earthquake game <laughs> there's one there's a text adventure by scott adams actually it's earthquake 1906 the san francisco quake it's kind of a murder mystery thing well somebody That's needs one. to write 2024 the new jersey quake yeah, I don't know. It's four point eight a real quake. I'm just kidding. Yes, it's spilt. Hey, it spilt people's coffee. That's oh, actual spilled coffee. That's yeah. Uh, uh, I can do that tripping over my own feet. Tragedy. Well, there there were yeah, but this was a, there were I, some I, Taiwan's was like seven point eight, and that was that was bad. As like Ron said, you know, buildings like this and yeah. right, but they got two car sized boulders started, rifling so. down the mountainside right under the highway. Like wow. It's always fun bit. when something like that happens, and then here in Vancouver, all of a sudden, everybody starts freaking out. And well, we well you guys are overdue for the big one. You guys every store had a... around here all of a sudden has earthquake uh, kits on sale, and they're selling out. <laughs> right. And we've been waiting well, we, like we, we had, for really hundred years because you you guys have had eight and nine magnitude quakes back in like the seventeen hundreds, and it's roughly every 150, 200 years. And you guys are overdue, so you guys are going to get one. So. This is why I live in the prairies. Nothing happens here. It just gets cold. <laughs> this is why I live in the burg that I do. There's no tall buildings here. <laughs> Nothing there's to fall over. And after watching <laughs> what happened with Taiwan with mountains, I'd still be worried. Well, the closest mountain to me is, I don't know, about five or six miles. So, What's next? The sun going to go out? As a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> just wait till that big solar flare that knocks out the internet. Right. Or all electricity and, and the power, out, yeah, the power grid and all that. And, yeah, that big cell that knocks out the internet is going to knock out civilization as we know it. That's all there is to it. Yeah, and then we got the cicadas this year. Double. Oh yeah, they the all they all come out, out this Just year. Just wait till we yeah. get to Chicago. That's the epicenter of the double <laughs> cicada. Exactly, they're both out. So <laughs> those things are loud. We had them yes. in Florida when I first get, when I got down there in seventeen, or in I'm sorry in uh, fourteen. Man, those things are loud. Those yeah, I got to ones. witness them when I was in Cincinnati. I was in a campground just south of Cincinnati, and I, I managed to catch them. And I can't remember what year that was. It was one of the cycles, but it wasn't a double like this one is. When the moon turns to blood. Mm. Anyhow, I think we're getting a bit off track. Imagine that yes, on the show. very much so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got nothing else to say about the game on, so... um. Everybody, get your pillows, get your blankets, because Curtis is gonna be talking for a while about the news. Yeah, I hope enough have enough water and coffee for right, myself. Right. You wanna <laughs> we can take like another pot quick while we run a commercial? Or <laughs> okay, we can run a commercial. Uh, let's see. I think we need to hear from uh, Mr. Mark Siegel today. Hello, this is Mark Siegel, product manager for the Color Computer product line and designer of the Tandy Color Computer 3. And I'm proud to be a citizen of the Coco Nation.
making games for the Coco for over 35 years. Go to my Coco Games website at www.nickmarentes.com for information and pricing of my later games as well as downloads of many of my older games. And Nick, you're going to have to update your ad there because it's 40 years now. Yeah. With new games. New toy. <laughs> well, that's not good. Actually, that was your first one, wasn't it? New toy yeah. 2. Thank God you improved since then. 40 years of improving new toy. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty well. <laughs> Okay, I'm assuming my screen is being shared here with the uh, Jim Gary. Imagine that. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we did a couple this past uh, week. Um, the first one here is called Castle Adventure, originally written by Dave Trapasso in 1981 in the July issue. Or he wrote in July of 81, but it was published in the April 1982 issue of Computronics magazine. And it was originally for the Tier City Model 1 and 3. And Computronics, I think, was actually a Tier City dedicated magazine, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jim added a new color graphics title screen to this and this uh, video I'm not going to play the whole thing it's nine minutes long but it's actually a complete walkthrough um, so spoiler alert uh, if you want to play that but if you get stuck you can actually go in and just you know queue up that part of the video nice little intro screen here with the, the castle and stuff though now, that's a standard text adventure game so And the next after that, uh, one that he did a little bit later this week, um, he also ported Video Poker, originally done by D. Scott Williams. And this is a brand new one. Um, the 10 line basic programming contest we've talked about on past shows for this year. Um, this was actually an entry by D. Scott Williams for the Atari 8 bit machines to do an entire, you know, video poker style game, you know, like you see in casinos and stuff, uh, to do it in 10 lines of basic. And I think uh, Jim mentions that he's, you know, taking more lines on the MC 10. Um, but not by much. Like it probably still fits in 4K just fine. And uh, actually it looks pretty pretty decent. He's cramming a lot on the screen here to get it all to fit. He's got like the complete, you know, uh, winning, you know, how much you get for how many coins you bet, etc. And So he's, he's filling up and using the 32 by 16 to its utmost. And for those, I mean, I, mean, I know Paul uh, Shoemaker's actually done uh, some video poker and so has Paul Thayer. Along with his brother Tim has done on multiple ones too. And of course, we have the uh brothers interviewing brothers where they all did casino games, you know, 40 years apart in the Coca community. So it seems to be a popular genre. Anyway, on the MC10 group on Facebook, uh Jim has actually posted the uh download. So if you want to grab these, uh you can grab uh the link here from his post, uh, the WAV sound file for it on his Google Drive. So you can actually grab that for your MC10 and give it a shot. Um, I believe, I don't know if both do, but I'm pretty sure the video poker really will run on a 4K stock MC10. You won't need anything fancy like the 16K RAM pack or, you know, the SDX32 or any of that kind of stuff. Next up, I'd like to thank uh, Venditaire in the chat because he actually sent me some private messages here. We were talking about this guy in Russia that's been reviewing every Star Wars or Star Wars related game he can find. And he just started getting to the Coco a few weeks ago, and now he's added a few more. He did two separate posts here, actually. So the first one here, uh, Return of the Jedi, which I'm trying to remember, Ken, I think we have we played this one in the uh, Game On Challenge before? Oh, maybe he stepped away. Or he's sleeping ready because the news started. But anyway, this is this is actually a pretty cool one. He actually quite liked this this particular game because basically it's um, rescuing Ewoks type thing. So it, it takes place during what is Ewoks? Is that the third movie? Return of the Jedi, I guess. Which is the, of course the title stolen from. Rescuing. Um, but there's there's basically three different screens or three different sections to the game. Uh, the first one you're just driving through the forest, and if you've played Death Chase on the Spectrum or the Cocoa Port of it that James McKay did back in 2007 or nine or something like that, it's similar to that. 
you you're going through the forest, you got to dodge trees, you got other people flying their cycles beside you that you can either shoot if they start going off in the distance ahead of you, or you can try to ram them into the tree, which is one of the most satisfying gameplay moves ever. And there's also little Ewoks you have to rescue along the way. But then after that, you go through a whole series of walls that have these little openings. You have to fly back and forth because you can't control your speed. They're just coming at you. So you have to you know, kind of navigate and try to get through the walls. And at the higher the level, there's more walls you have to go through. There's 15 skill levels, so it's, there's a fair bit of variety to it. And then the last level, you're kind of zooming up at a fixed speed towards this base station with a satellite dish on. There's this tiny little dot in the middle. You have to shoot before you get too close to it to to blow it up and actually has a pretty decent little graphic. It's a little 16K machine language game by Thunder Vision, uh, which didn't make a ton of stuff. And I think the company was only around for a year or less, I think. Um, they actually made a Joust clone, too, that we do not have in the archive. So if anybody out there has that, uh, please upload to the archive. I'd love to see because this game is pretty decent. I'd be curious what their Joust clone was like because I think it's actually one of the earlier ones. So that's one of them. I'm, I'm assuming most of you have seen this one before on the panel. An accurate assessment, or have you guys never seen this before? Never seen it. Okay, because I don't think, yeah, this one, I'm running through Google Translate because this original page is in Russian. Clickable links to YouTube don't work. <laughs> so um, I, I try to bring it up later, but anyway, he's got some screenshots. So this is the first screen where you're going through the trees. Here are the blue cycle. The ones here are the ones trying to kill you. This is the Ewoks you've got to pick up. Here's when you're going through the walls, you go through one wall at a time, and basically you're flying in kind of 3D perspective. And here's a satellite. That little dot in the middle there is what you got to shoot before you zoom up completely, because otherwise you get hit. Another one he covered here was Laser Run. On This is a Dragon game originally. Um, and this one I'm pretty sure is in basic. It does have some four-voice music ripping off Star Wars, of course. Um, but I think it's using page flipping and stuff here to do the animation. So it's a little slow. It, it reminds me a lot of Dan's Star Trench Warfare that IMB put out in 82, I think it was. Um, well, this one, I have to say is more of a game, like the movement of the TIE fighter you're trying to shoot is better than advanced because advanced is basically had a grid of nine squares and would just randomly jump to one or the other. It wouldn't even move across. It would just jump. So it's like a random shooter. You almost have no control over it. There's a bit of a zoom up on it. You can see it's uh, basically, you know, the, you're moving through the trench. You get to see the animation. The TIE fighter flies around. It has a bit of a block around it. I think this is also done before people discovered the uh, trick of uh, using the get put with the uh, even bite boundary, which really speeds things up. I think you probably could make this game a lot better if you just reprogrammed that. This is a favorite of mine, Sazigi. This is a Spectral Associates graphical adventure game with some arcade elements to it. And in fact, you want to see the arcade elements. I'm trying to remember what this guy's name was. He was on our show way back. He set up that whole 3D virtual reality and he, he reprogrammed Phantom Slayer and Dungeons of Daggerath and Sazigi and a few others. We actually are walking the virtual reality, you're turning around, you're firing and everything else in, in like real 3D space type thing. Oh, the guy and, that has the uh, um, treadmill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he actually, this is one of the games he patched to run on on that. Yeah, we hadn't heard from him in a while. No, I haven't heard from him at all. I haven't even seen him on the chat or the Discord. He might have gotten busy with real life. <laughs> Anyway, this is a game where you're going through and you have uh, the arrow keys move you through. So it's nice. You don't have to type go north or go south. You just hit up arrow to go forward and left to turn left, etc. But there's a couple places where you actually get to fight Darth Vader with real light, you know, lightsabers that are moving in real time. Like it's not, that's where it switches from being a typical graphical text adventure game into an actual bit of arcade-ishness. And you got to worry about stuff like suffocating and you, like you walk through a place where you've lost air pressure. You have to like hold your breath and then get through it before you run out of breath. So it's actually quite an interesting game. And uh, I quite liked it back in the day. Um, so if any of you have not tried it and you're into Star Wars, I think you quite like it. It's actually a pretty decent one. And you've got Yoda. And then here's a Zector Adventure. Uh, this was originally... Uh, done by Daryl Alm on the Coco on one of the tape magazines, if I remember correctly. And then uh, Jim Gary supported it to the MC-10. So a bit of a shout out to Jim there. That's a typical text adventure style game. And one nice thing this one did have was auto mapping. So it would actually kind of show the map. You could bring it up if you type the map command and kind of see where you've gone on the grid and uh, where you, what your current position is type thing. So that was one thing we didn't see too often back then was the auto mapping stuff. 
<clears throat> normally a text adventure game back in those days, you had to map it yourself on graph paper. So that was kind of a, a cool, cool feature. And then Space Raider, this one I'm pretty sure we have not played yet. Uh, Ken can correct me if I'm wrong. This was a T&D software. It's machine language. And it's kind of, it's, it's closer to Star Raiders, I think, than Star Wars. I, I'm not quite sure why this one was picked, <laughs> except the fact that it has TIE fighters in it. Um, and he's not as impressed with this one. I have played this one. I think I've even got it on my site, or it's one of the ones that got queued up once I get back to my site again. Um, I prefer Project Nebula myself. There's a lot more variety to the game there, but this was a you know a cheap magazine one. You got it on a tape with 10 other programs for like five bucks rather than paying 30 bucks for Project Nebula card. So, you ever notice that the profile of a TIE fighter spells out LOL? Well, I guess, yeah, if you're doing lowercase. <laughs> yeah, your, your text based games are have a solution. <laughs> They should have put that into the stormtroopers' hats because you, you LOL because they can fire a bazillion times and never hit you, and one shot will kill a whole fleet of them. So right, right. <laughs> and then he did a, a sequel follow-up where he did some more here, and he's covered some more. So Star Wars, this is a 1988 um, shooting range, and he actually this is in basic too, but he actually preferred this one to the uh, the Blaby one, I guess because the the plays a bit more real time and a bit better as far as the actual playability. It's, it's simple. Um, it's basically just, you know, a, a target and it moves around. You have to you know maneuver to shoot it type thing. This is one I have not played myself. I think I've seen it and maybe fired it up briefly, but it's not one I've actually sat down and played much. So I'll have to see, cause he was quite enamored with it for a basic game. So I'd be curious what it plays like. Um, Star Wars 1981 text adventure. This is a conversion. Um, from the Apple II to the Coco Three, and this actually is in uh, OS Nine, Nitrous Nine, and it's included on the OU. So if you guys wanted to play it, it's in Games Level Two Adventure Text and uh, forty column screen, so it'll play fine on a composite or TV. It's not eighty column where you might not be able to read it on those if, if that's all you have. That's a nice, nice little one. It's kind of like a setup with a little, you know, part of the top. You're kind of giving you a brief description of where you are, what directions you can go, so you don't have to guess. Uh, your inventory is kept on screen type thing. And then you've got the lower part for the actual interaction of the game itself. And here's his mapping of the thing here. And this is one where the maps actually make sense because I know some of the games like, you know, Pyramid 2000 don't. <laughs> so you can go east and then come west and you went to a different room than you came from. So not this one it makes sense. And here's another uh, MC10 one. And this was ported from or did they originally write Jim tell me where this one came from um, but this is doing like low res graphics now it's kind of doubling up the image here because it he's drawing the new position of the ship and then erasing the old one so it kind of widens and squishes and widens and squishes visually but you know pretty decent for a, you know an actual moving trench game on an MC10 and low res He wasn't too impressed with it, uh, the guy that reviewed it here, but, I mean, he's used to, you know, hiring machines, I guess. And he's getting back into some of the other platforms here. Now, I did ask Vendetter, who actually talks to this guy in Russia, and because he's been pretty loosey-goosey with what is a Star Wars game, like Space Raiders, more Star Raiders, like I said, not not Star Wars technically. So if he's going to include anything with a TIE Fighter, I would have him try Project Nebula, because honestly, it's a better game. And the fact you have forward and backward radars, which I don't think even the original Star Raiders had. So it's it's actually got a few little bits of innovation of itself too. Oh, Jim says it's an original game. So he wrote that one uh, totally on his own. No no porting here. I think I've seen the video of this one way back. I think we covered it way way back. Next up, the guys at Inufuto have released a new game, and the MC10, Coco One and Two, and Coco Three versions are all already out now. And uh, this is called Anti Air, and it's kind of Kind of Space Invader-ish. But the uh, the aliens are dropping a variety of things. They can drop bombs, but they also drop blocks. And if they hit the ground and you don't shoot them, you can't go past them. It gets stuck in the ground and you're stuck there. So if it falls in the middle of the screen and you're on the left side, you can only maneuver on the left side now until they drop a bomb to destroy it. You can't destroy it yourself. So there's a bit of extra gameplay there that's not on you know a regular Space Invaders game, which actually made it kind of cool. So I'd want to play both because we got a lot of news to cover. Do you guys want to see the 
MC10, the Coco 1, 2, or the Coco 3 version? A little bit of a video clip. Coco 3. Okay. Let's see if this works. Oh, the regular Coco version looks pretty cool, too. Nice. Of course, they do all the everything on cassette. Okay, there. Now that blocks there, you, your ship cannot move past it, so you can only shoot them when they're on the left side of the screen, unless a bomb takes it out. Of course, the bomb can take you out too. So. But that block really adds something to the game because if you, you're busy shooting aliens and all of a sudden you didn't notice they dropped a block and it just cuts you off like in this case where you only have a very tiny bit of maneuvering. And if they don't drop a bomb on it, bomb on it you're just stuck until they come back across again. So yeah, that's that's some brief gameplay. The Coco 1 and 2 version, of course, uses the uh, green, yellow, blue, red palette instead. And same as the MC-10. And the MC-10 is a little bit lower res, 128 by 96 versus the 128 by 192 on the Coco 1 and 2 version. But yeah, there's and of course, you know, it's it's already available for like 40 other platforms if you're interested in trying it in some other ones. Um, I have not seen a Tier City Model 1 3 version of this one yet, and they don't always port the game depending on what it is and, and what's required to the Model 1 and 3, but I'd be kind of curious if that one comes out too. If it does, I'll let the guys know in the Tandy Discord. Anyway, available for download now. Um, they're typically set up as WAV files, so we'll have to like switch it over to disk. Um, I sometimes use that uh, utility ROM L uh, because they tend to load it right into the cassette, you know, right in where the disk buffers are normally on a disk drive. So we normally try to load it directly off disk, it'll just crash. Um, I'm guessing that will be the same in this one. I don't know if he's figured out that if you move your code up, you know, so many K, then you don't have that problem. But there's another one Ken can add into this list of stuff to try. Uh, next up, the Super Sprite FM Plus. Now, we covered last week the Paris Rat had released a, an AGD games pack, which had four games on it, three of them with the Dark Pits, one, two, three, and I can't remember what the fourth one was off the top of my head. But he, anyway, he found a bug. So he's re-released those as version 1.1, which fixes the bug. So that that's good. But he also released the next game pack, so only a week apart. He's the 11th game pack now. So that's over 40 games now that use a Super Sprite FM Plus board, including the new graphics and the new sound routines. So this is actually getting almost to be a standard if you want a Coco 1 to upgrade besides the Coco VGA, which unfortunately due to chip shortages and stuff has not been manufactured in a while. So this is kind of the alternative. Uh, but you can see the ones here. Basically, this uh, new one is basically Funky Fungus Level 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're each a separate program, so I'm imagining the levels are pretty big. And uh, they actually, it looks like a pretty interesting game. Um, as with all the AG games, it's, it's basically platforming style. But he's got some pretty decent graphics in here. Um, it looks like the levels have some variety to them. Uh, there's like places you can drop in from the ceiling and then drop throughout. There's others where you go across. Uh, the the tiles that he's using in the background change quite a bit. Like they're not just all bricks, so they're not all just regular walls. They they change quite a bit. So there's going to be some good variety in the game. This is one I'm really curious to see a video on. Actually, does anybody here on the panel have a Super Sprite FM Plus board on their Coco One, Two, or Three? No. Maybe Brian Weezer. Yeah, I think he did, actually. I know we had some people that are on the show that have had it, and we've actually had some demos of it, but uh, the fact that Paris keeps you know hammering these out here um, and the AGD engine has already been basically adapted, you just have to tweak it for each game you know, to get the specifics out. It looks like uh, if you want a decent gaming platform for a Coco 1 and 2 uh, with a lot of extra hardware for your know, multi-voice channel sound and you know much more color and, and graphics, and I think even hardware sprites are on here, it's basically the MSX platform. It's pretty pretty cool stuff. I'm glad he's cranking them out again because we haven't seen uh, uh, any of these AGD Super Sprite games for a while. And now he's, you know, come out with eight in the span of two weeks. Next up, uh, a site called Dr. Grifa. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not. Uh, but he did some gameplay video of uh, the dragon and... Uh, I believe this is actually in a different language. Yeah, I think it's Spanish. Let's 
see if I can. Oh, there's nothing there. Anyway, he covers uh, for over three quarters of an hour a whole bunch of, of dragon based games. And there's some stuff that we've, you know, of course, seen in the Coco. This is the original Cyrus Chess, which actually Tandy got the rights to later to publish in North America, but this was on the Dragon several years before the Coco version came out. And then, of course, he covers stuff like Backtracks, which is a, a classic and a very impressive 3D perspective. Uh, Chucky Egg, and um, what's some of the other ones he played here? He played. Uh, Ugg, Donkey King, Frogger, and a whole bunch of others here. So you can pan through and see there's a Hungry Horus, um, Crystal Castles, uh, Dark Pit, I think that is, a basic Pac-Man style game, uh, one of the Scramble clones that was unique to the dragon called Tube Army. Um, just just a whole bunch. There's, there's quite a few here. There's something that you'll recognize, obviously, like Mooncrest that we've played before on the Coco and Moon and Robo Patrol, which started on the Coco, but he's, he's got a good mix. And they're not just all arcade games, which most of these types of videos are. He's got two different chess games in here, for example. So if you want some uh, good dragon stuff. Now, the the backtrack and a couple of other game videos are really blurry. I don't know what he recorded it with, but some of the other ones, like Chucky Egg, looks crisp and clean. So I'm not sure why the big difference in quality between the videos. But you can still get a good gist of the gameplay anyway. So that's what I have for the uh, Game On segment. So I'm going to switch over and talk about upcoming events next. Let me get prepared for that. So I've added a few more uh, that we haven't been talking about uh, thanks to our guests last week. Oh, I can't just cut. Go ahead. I say I can't just cut and paste from last week? Man, making my work hard. <laughs> Well, a couple of them are going to be over within a couple of weeks, too, so that'll shrink the list well, back down. I mean, I got the next three up on the screen already. What's that? The next three are actually up on my in the screen in the gray square. Oh, I can't see it because I'm sharing right now, so. Oh. All, right. All right, first one up is the Indie Classic Computer and Gaming Expo, April 13th to 14th, so that's not this weekend, but the weekend after. Um, got someone running by Randy Kindig of Antic and Floppy Days podcasts. He's one of the main organizers for it. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's one I plan on going to at some point. There was one time where it was actually only a week away from Cocoa Fest and that would have been, I mean, unfortunately funds were not, and the time were not available at the time, but having them a week apart would mean I would just stay, you know, camp or in the area or, or stay at hotel or whatever. And, and just, you know, attend it because it's literally a four-hour drive from Chicago. So it would have been perfect time to, to do it. Just didn't work out that particular year. But I plan on doing it sometime. If I can do a doubleheader, I will. That same weekend, um, VCF East at the Info Age Science and History Museum in Wall, New Jersey is happening. And um, they've got a Hotel Block 3 is open until March 31st. That's a little out of date. Um, I have no idea if they still got rooms available at the discount rate. But... Uh, I think this is one that's Sloopy. Henry, I think you're going to this one too, aren't you? Yep. Yep. I don't know if we can get I'm some live reports it. from the field from you guys, but I would love to, even if you pop in just for a few minutes to kind of tell us what you see. Sure. I need a selfie stick. <laughs> Next up, of course, the 32nd annual last Chicago Coco Fest, where people will get to see the deluxe Coco in action in person. With the new advanced color basic ROMs and a whole bunch of other stuff that's uh, main all been sold out for a while. The auxiliary room's only got two tables left last time I checked. Uh, Forbidden Machines has got his own little portable display that's actually going to be out in the hallway. It's going to be a packed show. 102 rooms have already been booked um, in advance and, and several, you know, multiple of those rooms have multiple people in them. So the attendance is already looking like it's going to break last year's, uh, a full month ahead which is awesome. So I'm really looking forward to this show. Then one of the ones we got notified about here, the Festival of Portable Computing, May 18th, 19th, Center of Computing or Center for Computing History in Cambridge, England. Now this is the same location that the Dragon Meetups happen at. And Sixie, if you know in the chat there, Kieran, um, <clears throat> you guys have dates firmed up for the next Dragon Meetup for 2024? It's usually... Later in the year than this is, obviously. I think it's more in the fall, early winter, somewhere around there. But uh, usually like I'd love to know if you guys have dates. What's that? It's usually like the beginning of October. 
Yeah, because their their general all retro event is in November, which we'll get to in a little bit here, but uh, all in the same yet. location. Oh, okay, yeah, sixty saying yeah. not yet. So yeah, this this particular one here is dedicated to portable computing, which you know normally doesn't really apply to the Coco, but. Um, Frank Swagger did a portable Coco with disk drives in a wooden case that I remember seeing at Coco Fest in the early 90s. He used to carry around all the time. He's a publisher of World of Six Eight Micros. Taylor and Amy, of course, also did their portable one that they went running around the front yard with. And now we've got Porta Coco, who's also doing one that has you know, Wi-Fi and everything else built into it. So I think we qualify now. I don't know if anybody have, will be able to get out there to show off the portable Cocos, but it'd be pretty cool if they could. Next up, we have another doubleheader weekend, depending on where you are in the United States. Uh, it might dictate which one you want to go to, but uh, I mean, this we've got Boat old. Fest, third this annual. Is, these shows are coordinated like road construction. <laughs> yeah. hey, well, it could this, be worse. It could be Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the, the, the two that are on this rooms. particular weekend, which is Boat Fest and... Um, VCF uh, Southwest in Texas, they have a bit of a different theme because VCF is more, you know, computer oriented, whereas uh, Boat Fest is more game oriented. Now, they're not strictly that way for either one of them. There, there's some games at VCF Southwest and there's uh, uh, some, uh, you know, regular computer and hardware upgrades and that kind of stuff at Boat Fest too. But they definitely have a, have a stronger theme each way. A little bit different. So, if your preference is to be more game oriented, I would recommend Boat Fest. If you're more to the hardware side of things, then I would probably do the VCF one. You know, assuming it's within reach for you to get there. All right, uh, there's a few of us still be coming attending this one, uh, including some people that have not been to it before. So, this is always a lot of fun. If you've ever watched any of the Amigo shows, there, you know, Atari ST show, the Coco show, the Amiga show, uh, the Atari 8 bit show, and then. Uh, their general all-purpose, you know, randomly picked by the wheel, um, general, you know, ARG presents type thing. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of fun. They they have a lot of fun. They don't take themselves too seriously, so it's just a very laid back atmosphere. And that same weekend, uh, June 14th to 16th at the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center at the University of Texas at Dallas is VCF Southwest, which does have some separate sub themes. Um, Chronological Gaming is doing a presentation there on retro gaming going chronologically through the history of all video games. And uh, I think Boise Pete's got a thing there too, going through one of the 6809 uh, modern FPGA implementation boards. And of course, the Tandy Assembly uh, is kind of getting a whole bunch of the Tandy alumni, the people that actually worked at Tandy back in the 70s and 80s, because they all live there still. So they're going to be doing a gathering just like they did last year. And last year, they actually had a presentation. Last I heard, I don't think they're doing a presentation this year, but they are playing a gathering a meetup if you people want to meet some of them. This is one I do plan on making out within the next couple of years myself because I do want to meet some of these people in person. It'd be awesome. <laughs> next up after that is VCF West. This is happening August 2nd to 3rd at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. This is the one Mikey has gone to. I think, Mark, you've been, Mark Oberhose, you've been to this one before too, I think? Yeah, I've been a couple of times and I want to go again. Don't know if I'll make it this year, but um I'll pencil it in my calendar, see if I can. It'll be beginning of August. Okay. So Tim this Linder's is at the event. Computer History Museum in uh, Mountain View, California. And we've had several Cocoa contingents. I know Mike, Mikey did his flexing the Cocoa, I think was what he called it. But it was basically running the Flex operating system, which is uh, an advanced CPM-ish style operating system that came out before OS 9 on the Cocoa did and didn't have quite as strict uh, requirements either. It doesn't multitask, but it did do you know, fairly advanced things a lot better than Disk Basic did. And there'll be some more flex stuff in the news a little bit later too. So anyway, that that's happening on <laughs> that weekend. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. The the wrong mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you hit the amplify Love button it. instead. <laughs> Okay, next up is the big one, if you're into old retro computers. This is VCF Midwest at their new larger venue, the Renaissance Schaumburg Convention Center in Schaumburg, Illinois, which is also the home of the original Rainbow Fest in Schaumburg, Illinois, though that was at the Hyatt Regency. Uh, September 17th, 2024. Uh, September 6th, if you're a vendor, uh, there's a whole lot of setting up and visiting going on there, too, so do that as well. Um, this is one that is expected to maybe hit Ford, uh, probably 5,000 people this year, I'm guessing, if not higher. 
it sounds like a lot of people are going that have not been to it before. So, and all the regulars are planning on going to it. So this is the big one. And uh, I will make it out to this one some year too. Um, working on it. Uh, but this is this is this is a nice one. There's uh, usually uh, multiple cocoa people out there doing displays. Um, I'm trying to remember. Ken, are you back at your desk here? Or are you still napping on the couch because we're doing news? Oh, sorry. What? Uh, I heard my <laughs> name. I, I was just going to ask, like, how many cocoa people showed up last year? Because you were at this last year, correct? Oh, what was? I mean, there is a... me, Jason, Sloopy. Um, a few other people had cocoa stuff, but from our group, I think it was just the three of us, wasn't it? Was Jim Brain there, or was he just? Oh yeah, Jim was there. Commodore? Yeah, but he had a Commodore set up. So, oh well, then we won't talk about him then. <laughs> no, there's some. There was a um a little corner of cocoa stuff, and uh... so what you're telling me is that we need to get more cocoa people. Yeah, out we there need to get more cocoa fill that people in. there representing. I agree. But this this is a it, it's the premier retro computer show I think on the planet right now. I'm trying to remember whether um, who else was there. Was David uh, David Lab might have been there, or maybe that was two years ago. David yeah, I know there. not everybody had tables. Yeah, because uh, they were you know, there were there was no room for them. I mean, people were actually doing their vending out in the parking lot. Yeah, but I, I remember you guys were you know, meeting some other people that. Uh, you know, had cocos and stuff or an interest in the cocoa at any rate and just, you know, kind of wandered by the table type thing. Yeah. This is, this is one I'm definitely, this one in the Southwest one of the two that I'm going to make at some point. Um, just because I know a lot of the people at this one uh, from the Chicago area. And then of course the one in Dallas is because, you know, Fort Worth is because that's where Tandy was. And there's a lot of the Tandy alumni there and I really want to meet them too. So I'm working on it. Next up is Tandy Assembly, September 27th to the 29th in Springfield at the Courtyard by Marriott in Springfield, Ohio. Um, they've started posting exhibitors. I don't know if they've got any speakers yet. I'm just going to take a quick look. No speakers yet. Uh, exhibitors. I know they've been adding a few here. Um, most of these look like the ones I showed last week. Well, Brendan Donahue, of course, for Kogabi Day is going to be there. No, it looks like the same list, but basically, yeah, they've got some vendors already booked. Um, they're actively soliciting for people to do talks. And um, this is another one I will eventually make it to. It's not quite sure when yet. And then the last one is another one from our guests last week, and this is their equivalent of VCF. This is the Retro Computer Festival, Saturday, November the 9th. Now, I'm a little bit confused here on the site, and, and if he's watching, maybe you can send me an email or a Discord message. But the, the blurb up here says September... Sorry, November the 9th, Saturday. All the purchasing of tickets is done with Saturday. But if you go down here, it says we'll be dedicating another entire weekend on the 9th and 10th. So I'm not sure if it's a single day event or if this is a double day event and they one of these is wrong. So hopefully you can, you can um, clarify that. But this is basically all retro. So this is uh, retro gaming, retro computers. Um, it is the largest one in the UK uh, for retro in general. So if you're in the UK or and you want to go the equivalent of VCF, this would be it. Now, from my understanding, the uh, Dragon Meetup is usually a month or two before this uh, at this exact same venue, though, as is the portable one that's you know earlier in the year. So it looks like the Center for Computing History actually is hosting a lot of these events now. And one of the organizers for this particular one is actually one of the active people in the Dragon community, Tony Jules. So that's cool, too. So I, I'm imagining there'll be a bit more Coco and Dragon involvement here, having you know one of the people heavily involved with that community helping out with, you know, organizing this particular show. So this is another one along with the dragon meetup. I'll eventually will make when I can afford to do holidays to the UK. And that's it for the upcoming shows so far. When you want the latest in TRS 80, Tandy, Dragon, MC 10, and all of their hardware cousins, no matter what it takes or where news breaks from around the world to your nation. 
Okay, now this is one I have not had a chance to fully watch. Um, this is our double news thing, and I'll explain why later. Uh, but Mark B, I believe you're the one that kind of queued this one up for me. We're going to actually, yeah, hopefully found- David was going to be on. So I'm assuming you've watched oh. it. Can you explain what we're watching here? And I'll just mute the sound while I play a bit. Actually, I'd forgotten about uh. it from last week. <laughs> so it's it's not a floppy cleaner. It's a floppy head cleaner. Yes. So he's okay. uh, trying to build a. Um, uh, oh, like a, the old cleaning, cleaning disc. disc. Yeah, he's trying to build right. a cleaning disc, and uh, I think he's tried some different materials. Uh, but I didn't watch the whole thing to see how we get through got through it. But uh, um, this guy is uh, uh, does a lot of uh, like board repairs, like two eighty six, three eighty six, okay, and so on board repairs. He's also the one, the guy that came up with the. Uh, 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 PS2 mouse to serial converter that I've told you about. I'm trying to figure out like like normally the uh, the the casing around a five and a quarter inch disc is basically a plastic. Is this plastic or is this more like a cardboard he's using? Uh, he's using cardboard here. Okay. The uh, he tr- first tried the uh, looks like an actual floppy stuff. disc, but that didn't work out real well. So. Oh, because it's got its own funky things. Yeah, coatings on the inside cleaner, yeah it has a, a cleaner layer in there that would really cause a lot of drag i would think right against his his uh yeah and the felt he was using was snagging on the inside of the uh yeah uh, plastic. That, make, that makes sense yeah so but no i didn't end up watching the whole thing to, to see the results did anybody on the panel here watch it through or I, like I said, I didn't get a chance I, to this last. I see what he's doing, though. He's recreating the old felt. You know, you drop a couple of drops of alcohol on the pad inside and yep. and mm-hmm. the head scrub clean. Yeah. But yeah, you can't do that with just a regular floppy case because it's got its own felt inside to swipe the, the snagger. Yeah. And that catches on this felt, felt against felt. So yeah, it makes sense. But wow, what work. Good yeah, evening. I mean his, his floppy out of cardboard looks pretty pretty convincing, actually. <laughs> right. Now I myself I had cleaning discs, but honestly I didn't use them too much. I used to use a Q-tip with with alcohol and just rub the head directly. After yeah, the, the bottom part. head was fine, but the head one could be a little delicate. Well, and the double sided discs, and then it's all assembled. You just poke this in with some alcohol on it and hit dirt a couple of times, and it goes. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Yeah. The Tandy drives and the Apple drives are pretty easy to get into. Commodore drives are a little bit harder. And the Commodore drive in my SX is you know, almost impossible. So, okay. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times it's easier to use a disc like this than to try to open them up and work on them. Depends on the drive. Oh, yeah. Looks like he's trying a different outer casing material. Because the, the Tex and the Tandons that I had when I still, you know, ran my floppy drives regularly on my Cocoa, I'd never had much problem getting to either head, honestly. Well, it's it's a fine line. I mean, we'll get into how heads wear and how you need to clean them along their axis of wear and all that other stuff someday. David Ladd's not here, unfortunately. I'm yeah, sure this he... was kind of queued up to be like Mark <laughs> when he sent me the link to this. Said, uh, if David's on, we got to talk about this because it's his he, favorite He will subject. tell us exactly why you do it this way and why. <laughs> right. I don't think I've even seen him in the chat today, to be honest. Paging David Ladd. Right. <laughs> But you do do it this way, and I'm sure there's a very specific reason. And... Oh, and I guess he's uh, encountering some other issue with an optical sensor. Oh, right. To detect the disc. <laughs> oh, because of the clear plastic. So... <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> <He can't... laughs> the plastic's not there because it's clear. How much harder would it be to make a, a three and a half inch disc version of this? I wonder because they used to be cleaning discs for that as well. And of course, that's a solid case, not a. Right. right. Well, that may actually be easier because the three and a half flew inside of its case. It wasn't rubbed on both sides by an internal thing, so it might actually be easier on a three and a half. Yeah, if you look at the three and a half, the center part, the metal part, is actually thicker than the disc it is itself. I right, the, the disc there, flies. Yeah, I assume it actually would, you know, 
Centrifugal it doesn't torsion. fly it. Yeah. Where, yeah. So a, a five and a quarter, the disc slid against both sides of the jacket. Where a three and a half is almost like a hard drive. It flies in space, and the the heads well, clamp a on it. Effect. Well, the, the, isn't that the heads still clamp on it? But it doesn't rub against the casing while it's running. Yeah. And yeah. I yeah, because I remember when we used to do flippy discs, a lot of the people used to tell me, well, you shouldn't do that because it makes your heads dirty because you're wringing backwards if you flip oh, the right. disc over and, and it it's takes... going to rub the dirt back onto the head. I'd never had that problem. I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. yeah I, heard, no, I... I heard that too. It's like... That's one of the theory had... things, yeah. There's a theory. I think they everything. just... I think it was usually like people like Radio Shack salesmen, they wanted you to pay extra for the double-sided proper oh, floppies. Oh, yeah. Get the proper floppies. You <laughs> must. You must get the proper ones. You know, six bucks a pop or whatever they were charging for them back Well, then? they were more reliable because the the back you know the they make them one-sided because they know the other side is actually bad oh i never be. had that problem I, I i've still got ones i cut the little holes with a hole punch i didn't make them yep. square and they still work 40 years right. later right. i think it was all hype they just wanted to sell you more expensive discs right all right we miss you david sorry you weren't here for this this was this we right. queued this up yeah. for you perfectly you have to fix it up next week <laughs> So, Next up, oh. there's an update for the Cocoa Pie project from Ron Klein. Um, so he's including an installer version that is available for the first time to the public right now. And I'll just read a little bit of his quote here. And for those of you that actually have Cocoa Pies, you can tell me uh, what the significance of this is. It says, even though I have not posted any recent updates, a significant amount of work has been done on the new Cocoa Pie installer, in quotes, based variant. I covered the installer-based version of my previous post back in January. I feel as though the installer version is the correct direction to move in. As much as the Raspberry Pi platform was key in kicking off the Cocoa Pie project to begin with, there are many other platforms and architectures that can be a suitable home for the Cocoa Pie. The Raspberry Pi platform will always be near and dear to me, but it's nice to expand this to other systems. While this installer is very much a work in progress, it is available for anyone that would like to try it out, and he gives a link to his GitHub if you want to grab it. Uh, as I mentioned before, there will be issues, bugs, etc. Please provide feedback if you do not, or if you do use it. I try to check the Discord Cocoa Pie channel as much as I can. I've not spent much time in Facebook as I'm getting a bit jaded with it. I I, I understand. Um, and he says, in the meantime, I will continue to provide updates to the Cocoa Pie 64-bit SD card image-based release as well. Though he's talking about making it go away some point in the future and switching just to the installed version. So for those of you probably more familiar with this stuff, because I don't have a Cocoa Pie, I never have. Um, what exactly is the difference between installer version and just getting the image to run directly? And why is it advantageous to switch to that installer version? I'm going to make a guess that uh, the installer version would let it be compatible with uh, with other other platforms besides just the Pi. Yes. You know, with some of the Pi clones or look or similars. So like Arduinos or something like that? or mm, It has to run no. Linux. No, it's for other games. It has to run Linux. A generic so, Linux. Yeah. So what, what 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 would be some sample other platforms? Just because I don't know. I don't I have no idea about this stuff. BeagleBone running Debian Linux. Did you say BeagleBone? Uh, BeagleBone. Yep. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. Okay. I have one. There's other single um, board computers that... Uh, that aren't Pies that could do the yeah, Pi thing. That run, uh, that run yeah. Linux. So... What, what uh, uh, Ron is doing is he's basically taking a Raspberry Pi image. Oh, okay. And then yeah. he is downloading MAME. He's downloading XROR. He's downloading all the various, uh, the GCC compiler. Um, you put the GCC pilot, compi patch compiler. He's downloading CMOC. He's downloading LWASM. He's downloading Toolshed. UG he's Basic, putting, another one, a micro basic. UG yeah. Basic, yes. He downloads basically... all that stuff and builds it on that yeah. Pi. And so then he distributes a completely loaded Raspberry Pi image. It's basically a stock image that he's added all his custom stuff for making a Cocoa Pie and theoretically any other emulator that you could stick on there. And so he spends a lot of time building it. It takes hours and hours and hours to compile all that stuff from scratch. But when you get done, you have basically a working system. He basically certifies you have a working system because again, the, the target platform is a Raspberry Pi 3 or a 4 or a Pi 400 or a Pi 5. And so the hardware is, you know, a known quantity. He just targets that particular thing. What this does is this lets, this is basically all the build scripts that he uses to make a Raspberry Pi image. That is just the scripts. 
So when it runs, it goes through and it downloads all those bits and pieces and you build it yourself. So he's so shifting have, the compiling of getting everything ready to go from doing it locally and then sending you the finished version that finished you do it yourself yeah. on your own Pi clone Correct. or whatever. Because you're building it for hardware that he doesn't have. Right, right. I've got this new board that no one else has. I've got this build script. I can build the so, Pi image on my FUBAR. Yeah. So even Curtis, with you, you should be able to load Xcode on your Mac, and you should be able to download that image, and basically build a complete Cocoa Pie setup on your Mac. Turn your Mac into a Cocoa, isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> I already do that with Mame and Xroar. <laughs> well, well, I'd say you already do that anyway. But that's what this is. This is for it's, people. Uh, with... Well, yeah, but like the those all those stupid little single board computers that you could buy, I could see experimenting with this as being a lot of fun. Yeah, the, the Raspberry Pi has really started a whole trend in single board computers that can run some sort of embedded system, uh, Linux or otherwise. And so, yeah, there's a lot of choices out there now. And so this just expands. So are, are these are these other ones that are coming up besides the Pis themselves, are they like um, as powerful or even more powerful than the Pis? Or is the yes. Pi still ahead of the game in the hardware? Yeah. Some of them are more powerful. They have more cores well, or they have faster CPU. Well, right, and different capabilities. So the Pi has very specific I.O. capabilities that's built into it. For, or they might also have well, lower cost. Right, right, and or completely, yeah. This is Yeah, because cool. I was just, uh, Karen in the chat's mentioned a couple of these. It's something RISC-V-ish, I guess. I guess that's RISC, the core yeah. of CPU. Yeah, RISC-V-ish. RISC yeah. And then he said building named directly on a Pi might take a while. Yeah, it does, especially on <laughs> a Which I've heard is, you know, hours in some cases, right? Mm-hmm, it can. Well, what, the idea about, one name that comes idea. to mind is like a La Panda. La Panda? I haven't heard of that one, but yeah. There's oh, and the Beagle there. Bone. Yeah, it's things that aren't compatible with Pi at all, but maybe provide and extra features, maybe OS. have better I.O., you know, Less cost. whatever you need. You can yeah. take the Cocoa Pie thing and put it on that thing and combine the two. So, yeah. Sorry, Mark, you were saying? Oh, just, yeah, like I said, there's, this, this just expands it out. So instead of requiring a, uh, a Raspberry Pi, you can use some other sort of system that has a Linux operating system or Debian operating system on it to, you know, build all the stuff up. So literally, you could just do it on a PC if you have Linux installed, too. Then you don't need a Pi yes. or one of these single board computers yes. at all, right? Yep. And it might compile faster. Oh, well, yeah, but if you get a, a, a Pal Kitty game thing and put the Raspberry Pi stuff on it. You could have a really cool Cocoa. I have a Gimme X. That's good for me. I don't know if you've <laughs> seen the Pal, the Pal Kitty game machine. It's been sold under a whole bunch of things. It was pretty hot for a couple of weeks. Um, but if you could run the Cocoa Pi stuff on that, you would have a really cool um, game Cocoa game machine. Anyway. Yeah, I could see that. In fact, I think Henry Wright felt the Henry we were talking about there. I think he's actually brought his arcade cabinet with, I'm not sure if it's a Pi or not, but he has the, the main emulator and he has it set up to be able to select them using the joystick controls and stuff on his arcade cabinet mm -hmm. to be a Coca Game. So he's brought it to the, the fest a few times. Okay, no, I was, I was kind of curious here because I, I didn't really know what was meant because, I, I mean, you're already installing it when you download the Pi thing, so I didn't understand what is the difference. It's... It's so it's not really install. It's it's between installing a ready-made thing and then installing all the pieces to actually assemble you it could, yourself. It's it's like a recipe. It basically is a big script that runs. It downloads the bits and pieces and assembles and compiles stuff. Right. So you aren't limited to what someone has already done. You can run this on whatever you got and make your own new thing. There's pie and there's spaghetti. Right. <laughs> Uh, William Athing in the chat here says he ran built the installer on a Pi 5. That's one of the newest ones, right? Yeah. That is With NVMe, I don't know what that means. Uh, it took about 90 minutes. Type of storage. That's not yeah, bad. It's, uh, solid, solid state storage. So how long would it take to do that on a like a modern PC? I'm just wondering what the speed difference is. Huh. Um, Name your PC. Five minutes? If you so, have enough money? <laughs> you know. I know... I know my four core PC I'm using right now for uh, Zoom. When I build MAME, everything it takes it probably an hour or two. But oh, so the Pi Five is actually getting close to the speed of a modern PC then? No, well, probably. I think it has four cores and well, uh, eight gigs. Yeah, for 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 a small core task, Pi Five is not bad. 
Yeah, some of these single board computers can be used as a desktop replacement. Oh, yeah. There's, any of the any there's of the been some studies on it. Five. All right. The the graphics are still a little weak in the, you know, these, but everything as else. Up playing intensive video games. I mean, for like word processing and browsing the web and stuff, they're more than enough. Okay. That's cool. I, I didn't know any of this because this is not a, a segment I follow all that closely. I mean, I mentioned it whenever Ron does a posting, but <clears throat> I, I'm not that familiar with it. I don't have one. And I, I uh, built a lot of the tools from scratch for uh, when I do stuff like name and XROAR and uh, the GCC uh, patch uh, for 6, 6809 and the CMOC and all that stuff. So I actually helped Ron with some of that stuff, getting the, the GCC patch to run. He actually had to modify the configuration script that was provided because it didn't recognize the hardware that the Pi 5 is running on. So we had to modify it so it actually generate executables. But other than that, it all was pretty smooth. Yeah, I guess if, yes. if you're the hobbyist programmer that likes, you know, fiddling with, you know, stuff like building your own from scratch, everything, this would be right up your mm -hmm. alley. I think mm -hmm. for a lot of people that want to casually play games so that, you know, having to run installers and then if the config doesn't quite work, you have to try to figure that out, I think would be a, a, an offsetting thing. So I... Hope he, you know, maybe it's too much work, but I would hope he would keep the uh, ready to go install available at least in the future, I'm so that sure people that just want to pick up a pie and start playing Coco games and and aren't programmers can can mm. do it. Now, like I said, it's it's a recipe. I mean, basically, he's taken his recipe that he's used behind the scenes to make the Raspberry Pi image. It's now available for anybody to download, so they can do yeah. their own. Yeah, but you you have to have a bit of programming skill and familiarity with the OS that you're running it under to to do that kind of thing if something goes wrong. Right. Or you could yes. spend fifty bucks. Like on you a just pie, said, you so. had to fix it up for Ron to get it to run because it wasn't running on a Pi Five. Right. Your average game player is not going to have a clue what to do with that. True. So I mean, I have no problem with him doing it this way because obviously the the people that are into that kind of thing would love doing this type of thing. Right. But the fact he's talking about eventually making the pre pre built one go away in the future and only have the installer base, I think might be. Did he say that? To some. I thought this was just bleeding edge changes. I didn't think he was making anything go away. That's no, what he says right here. Away. This will eventually go away at some point in the future and everything will move to the installer based version, oh, okay. which means for your casual user, this will no longer be an option. Well, by then I assume the installer base will be rock solid where you can say, I have a Pi 7 and I want to build for it. Yeah, but as yeah, you guys are mentioning, you can pick all these other, you know, single right, base computers and stuff that may not be one of the ones that Ron set it up for, may not work out the box. So I can see some major disappointments happening. <laughs> uh, this one is cheaper than a Pi 7, so I'm going to get this instead and uh, run the installer and it just starts bombing out because certain hardware is not there, paths yep. are different or who knows what. And then uh, the yep. screw this, I'm going to sell this back and return it type thing. Well, well what I was sure nervous about... I was nervous because uh, I have the uh, Pi 3B Plus, I think. And, um, you know, it's slow, but it works the Coco Still Pi does. fine. Yeah. Now, Ron, and, did uh, you run the whole installer base thing here, or did you just use the pre pre made version? Uh, I, inst I installed from whatever he had when it first came out. Um, so that'd so be the pre built, ready yeah. to run. Right, and and I didn't really have to do much except load it on and then add my uh, files that I was going to play with. And yeah, has, you know, so, like like that's that's why I'm I'm thinking it might be a mistake to shut that off in the future because you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. You'd have to figure out how to run no. make files and stuff. Yeah, I'm not going to. And all I did, I I made sure I backed up my uh, SD card because otherwise, uh, you know, there would be no path. And you know, it keep. He, the updates he's doing is more for these faster, nicer stuff. And, you know, we're, we're basically stuck. Uh, my machine works. I, why I would do anything for It's almost like 1990 right. when they stopped making the Coco 3, you know? <laughs> it's like, this right. Coco Pi has ended. Well, I mean, to go along the same lines, it's like the difference of using the repository in Nitrous 9 where you have to, like, build everything yourself or you can just download a UU and it's ready to run. You just... You know, you mount well, the VHD and you're done. It's the same thing. I mean, you can do a lot more sophisticated stuff if you know what you're doing with the built stuff because you can customize the living crap out of it. Right. But for somebody like Ron, that's not something he's going to do. Nope. Well, but the other, he may have brought up the other side of this. You've got to 
Pi 3 and everyone else is using a Pi 8 now, it doesn't really matter if it takes eight hours for the script to run. If it will make it work on your Pi 3, I'd be happy. I'll let it run all night. And if it runs tomorrow, you know, if the program executes tomorrow. Okay, I'm eight happy. hours in, an error happens. Yeah. And, well, and, and, and you're not a sophisticated programmer. What do you do? Well, it's better than saying we don't support the Pi 3 anymore. At least you could try it again the next day. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's. Like to me, this screams. This is going to become elite hobbyists that your our, our Linux users, et cetera, type thing that are going to be you know loving this stuff, and which I you know no argument there. <laughs> but for somebody like Ron, like just a user who wants to fiddle and play some of these old retro things, yeah. I think it's going to become more complicated. Cut him out, <laughs> and they're going to have to switch to VCC or something. That you can just you know click and install. And and uh, when when I first got mine going, I noticed there was a uh, TI ninety nine A version on there. And I played with that a little bit, and then that might have been another one that was on there already, um, you know, an emul uh, a Mame uh, version or whatever you call it. And that was kind of fun to play around there. But um, you know, and there's a whole list of things you can go through if you had uh, those things, I guess, compiled or whatever. You could run them, but you know, I have no clue on how to do it, nor am I interested because I have no software, and I'm I'm not going to about to go get it. You know, I've got plenty of software for the Coco 3 and 2 that I've never even downloaded yet and played with. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, I think there's definitely advantages to doing this way because then, like like you said, you can customize the living crap out of it and match your hardware and, and, and uninstall certain things you don't care about and install certain things that maybe other people don't care about. Just like you can with Nitrous9.org type thing when you're, you're downloading off the, uh, <laughs> the repository. But for people that just, you know, are the more casual user and just want to, you know, be nostalgic and run some of the old Coco stuff. Um, that's this is probably a bridge too far. If he completely cuts that pre-install off, I'm well, hoping he like, doesn't. It's like in Linux when I type make, and crap scrolls by for 35 minutes on the screen. I have no idea how to fix <laughs> any of that stuff if it doesn't yeah, work. Exactly, <laughs> but it always works. And at the end of the day, the program runs on my computer. So I don't care that there was 35 minutes of stuff that I didn't understand that went by on the screen. It but as, as Mark just pointed <laughs> out, he tried to do that and he had to help Ron with the Pi 5 because it didn't work. Well, so what do you do then? I mean, Mark's second. familiar enough with it to figure out what went wrong. But for somebody actually, like Ron, it's like, uh, no, I'm done. Ron Where's XROR? <laughs> Ron actually did the looking into it and realized that the processor type was not falling into the definition of what was in the specification for generating the compiler. So. So I gave him the yeah because with more and more platforms that this can expand to like all these other mm -hmm. you know alternate machines you guys are talking about here I can just see this becoming more and more complicated for a beginner user that's not going to go beyond being a beginner mm -hmm. that's right. that's my one worry yeah, well, mind you we have alternatives so there's X where you can download just go VCC can just download and go well, Mames kind I of in between like, <laughs> maybe it'll come it like down this. to a group of us you know and doing I'll... doing the support sorry sorry Henry I just sorry that's right. It might just come down to not Ron being the one to always do this, but have a group of us that kind of know what we're doing to figure it out and generate those images so that that's always there. It might be what it comes down to. Yeah, well, the head guy. It would be nice to, have, to, it. It yeah. be nice to have, be, have a SD card image that works mm -hmm. and you know it works at, like at my backup or something put up on somewhere that you can download it. But it's, you know, it's sizable. It's 14 mm -hmm. gigabytes. Yeah. We'll, no, we'll there's this bit also. There's this bit also. What he's hey, doing hey, here, you're, you're, you're going to say a couple things there, so just I'll let you have the floor. Yeah, so he was, um, he was, uh, Bob's men, uh, mentioning right here that effectively what he's doing is he's making a distribution, okay, and he's making a distribution. He, uh, I'm hearing words of like compile and make files and everything like that, so it almost sounds like something similar to a Gen 2 stage three. Um, so if any of you are familiar with Gen 2, Gen 2 typically is a uh, Linux distribu distribution that bootstraps itself by compiling everything. And when you install new packages, it compiles everything. And if that's the case, then the difference is you're not grabbing binary blobs like you are with all other distributions. You're grabbing source blobs. But I don't know for sure that, that, that he's grabbing source blobs for these. If it's, like comp if it's compiling on ARM, then it doesn't necessarily have to be machine specific. Um, if it's if it's going to work for ARM, if it's going to uh, work on a, a particular machine, if it doesn't compile on a particular machine, if it doesn't compile on compile on a particular board, 
then it's going to be a case of, all right, this board is not yet supported. And then it's going to be up to the community to go ahead and make sure that support gets added for that board. Um, by providing the by providing the installer me uh, installer methodology, what he's providing is a means by which to expand the the base of uh, the install base um, platform wise without having to do that much that terribly much work himself. Yeah. So we've still weird. got yeah we've still got the known good platforms that it works on. So if he puts out an installer, it'll install on the Pi, it'll, it should install on the Pi 3 unless he says Pi 3 has been deprecated. And as we True. go forward in time, it's possible that because of the specifications and requirements of the emulators themselves, certain older hardware will become deprecated. Yes. Right. But then he's also distributing the difficulty. So if there are three guys that like some specific platform as long as one of the three can build this they're home free because he's exactly. provided the framework to do that exactly yeah. yeah well so once again this this is a more aimed at the coders now if they want to distribute a, a pre-bundled one for a particular piece of hardware they like for people like ron to use then, then i have no problem with this you know what i asked uh uh ron klein i said it would be nice if you when you do updates to explain which which machines they're for because if i see an update i want to go and do an update but if i see that it's one of these generic ones sort of that cover a bland thing that if i do it then i screw up my whole version or whatever i don't want to mess with it then i'd really like to know can my pi 3 b plus or whatever is it for that or you know is it going to make it faster or is it going to you know be specific as to what this is for, because when he said that this this one update here is for all of them, I guess, but I don't see how it makes mine any better. You know what I mean? Other than giving you the opportunity to expand somewhere else, but mine's not fast enough, maybe. Yeah, yeah. All and that's where Henry was talking, like eventually it might get deprecated because they're adding new features that require more horsepower. Yeah, well, will he say that though? Because I I want to, you know, not try and install something that's going to screw it up. It's all communication. I'm going to guess there's going to be install images that are ready to go for everything that's practical. And if you really want to get funky, you can run this and make any kind of oddball image you want. But you wouldn't want to, so. I mean, he ought to be able to come out with a document that's like minimum hardware requirements. Yeah. Well, then that'll probably be the <laughs> what's available. If you can still yeah. get it for a Pi 3, the Pi 3 meets the minimum. If you can't get it for the Pi 3, maybe you can try to build it if you really want. <laughs> but, so uh, is the Pi, is the Pi 3 um, 32 bit or 64 or both? Well, that's a problem because that, the 32 bit OS support's going away. Right, so. right, right. And but Brian what, Weasler what said a couple times, invite Ron onto the show. Well, your Coco, yeah, I agree. Your Pi <laughs> three is going to support sixty four bit. I don't know which OS. Sixty four bit. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. So, Ron, what you doing next weekend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ron's there. been on the show Paging. before, so I mean, he has no Paging problem coming on to talk about it. Paging Ron Klein. Yes, Brian, we'll see if we can get Ron on here. That'd be interesting talk. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, I don't follow this stuff that closely. I don't have really any interest in getting pies and stuff or anything like that myself because I'm not a hardware tinkerer type thing. Um, and then to be honest, I, I run stuff on my real Coco more often than I run on the emulator, especially this last little while. So well, I'd you know, like it's got to work on the real hardware, otherwise you're faking it. I'd like to see um, Roger Taylor come on and talk about FPGAs and how they work. Um, I don't yeah, him and Gary Becker would be good because they both done stuff like that for the, yeah. the Mr. Coco and the uh, Coco 3 FPGA. Yeah, I understand the basic of it is probably more expensive than a, than a Pi is, you know, a Raspberry Pi. The hardware. So I don't think Ron's in the chat. Sometimes he is, but uh, if he listens to this later, please uh, contact us. We'd love to have you on to kind of go through the the whole project, where it's at, where it's going what the goals are you know his dreams <laughs> <laughs> all 
Okay, next up after that, speaking of Kieran, I think this is. Yes, Kieran, he's actually in the chat too, so you can set me right where I'm wrong here. Um, he posted a short but deep dive post on his site on how the NTSC Coco 3's composite signal works. Uh, he, this is based on the 1987 version of the game. He doesn't know if there's any major changes to the 1986 one. I know there's some timing differences between the two. Um, he spelled the word color wrong. I oh, spelled it right. <laughs> right, Ken? And Nick? <laughs> yep. Absolutely. <laughs> color, 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 color. <laughs> Everybody Color. else that spells it the wrong way is just lazy. Oh, I've got to take a letter out. Yeah, oh, I've got to write a whole other letter. Oh, I can't do that. Double vowels. <laughs> They're so hard. Anyway, it's, it's a bit of a deep dive. So there's oscilloscopes and everything. And I, you know, frankly, this is way beyond my pay grade to understand a thing he's talking about here. I don't know if anybody else has seen this. It's not a very long article. Looked at it briefly. So can you summarize it in English? Uh no, no. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark, <laughs> but yeah, you no can't. <laughs> so this is how we handle things that we don't understand. The next one is <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did it's something about composite video and. Uh... Voltages and levels, I guess. <laughs> it's looking at the signaling of the uh, gimme. Uh, and how they're trying to make analog things out of digital signals. And I mean, the fact that, I mean, Karen's obviously used to PAL in Europe and the UK, and this is actually working with an NTSC, so which of course it means never the same color twice. Um, so I'm assuming that it's getting to some of the differences the way that composite. NTSC well, work that, compared to L. The one thing that I noticed is that um, he talks about skipping um, skipping a, a skipping a cycle. So like there's phasing that it has to do. If you're like whenever you're doing NTSC color, you have to look at like what phase the lumus the luma thing is in in order to get your chroma. And so he's got 15 different hues, which should be 15 different phases. But he's got 16 edges available in those 15 hues. So one of them gets dropped. The hue difference is a little bit longer than it otherwise would be. Okay. Because I haven't used composite in quite a while myself. But if I remember, the Coco 3 composite basically has 16 basic shades and it adds more whiteness to them. That's your four different levels. That's the Luma, I'm guessing that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So basically, it's the same colors, just you know, they add more white to it and you know, washing it out kind of look. Yeah. So imagine, you remember the old tint dial on your old TVs? Yep. Yes. Tint and color. Okay. So you, your tint color was a uh, color was like color intensity, but tint adjusted the phase of the received of the received thing. So what it's saying is basically what you do is you take your tint knob, turn it all the way over, and he's got 15, he's got 16 clicks available from one end to the other on that tint knob. Only 15 are used, and they're supposed to be equally spaced, but they can't be because you've got discrete you clicks that you got to deal with. 16 clicks, yes. Yeah. And he's got 15 clicks from the gimme, so the gimme's like, oh, I'll just skip this click. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do remember There's... the tint, like that that red blue that we get on the Coke 3. If you jam the tint enough on certain TVs, you could actually go all the way between them on there. You wouldn't have to hit reset to change your color. Yeah, it just... Well, the... Six, he said, I'm cracking up yeah. here. <laughs> tint oh, yeah. was the thing. Tint was the thing that your young child could do in the seventies. Yeah, I thanks. could get the flesh color right on any color TV when I was twelve. No one older than me could do that. They always looked like cartoon Warner Brothers kind of, you know, Looney Tunes colors. It's but like old people you, nowadays will take a, a a four to three signal old TV show and then stretch it. They right, don't want right. black areas but, on the uh, screen. But in the old days, no barn doors. Well, I could well I could do tint with the analog tint knob. I can see where 15 steps on this is there's no way you're going to get anything like the color you wanted. You're going to get a color, but it's not going to be the one that you were aiming for. So this is all cool stuff. 
Yeah, Karen, if you ever want to pop on the show here, maybe not this week. I don't know what time it is there. Um, probably late enough. You probably don't want to keep your family <laughs> listening to you talk to us. But if you want to pop on sometime and kind of give us a better explanation, I would love to do that. Uh, he says he's drunk. He won't join us now. But he said composite video is luminous, DC plus chroma, wiggles. And how the wiggles line up with the color burst wiggles implies the hue. Yep. <laughs> implies, but does not set. <laughs> it only implies. <laughs> I love technical explanations that involve the word wiggle. That's not too often right? heard. Wiggles and implies. Yes, those are great. <laughs> oh, no. I just got crazy cartoon image of those tetra-colored individuals in their crazy little car driving down a driving down a coaxial cable and into an NTSC television set to make the screen go right. Ah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Karen, if sometime like in the next couple of weeks here, or, uh, maybe before the fest, if you want to pop in and give us a bit of a technical thing, also give us some updates on X-Work. You've been doing quite a few changes there, including the deluxe. So it might be good to have you on to talk about a couple of your projects. <laughs> Hey, next up, uh, Tier City Retro Programming has been busy the last couple of weeks doing a few video uh, updates here on a variety of things and some side projects as well. <clears throat> the first one here is uh, he got back to his Tales of Suburbia game for the first time in several months, and he's kind of debugging the hobby shop scene where you have to request your mother to come in the car to pick you up, and he kind of was debugging it live and uh, finally got it working where the car actually shows up and she comes pick you up because otherwise you can't walk that long road to get back home. So it's got a kind of a you know debugging session going on here, kind of live live recording. Another one here, uh, inspired by some of the bouncing balls and stuff that he's seen uh, done with some basics and stuff here. He was going to try to do a page flip style, and um, just just the complexity of trying to make a, a decent a whole bunch of more set of circles here, and, right. you know, trying to figure out all the arc, but you, see where you know, commands and stuff that would fit it so it looks proper. Um, so I know I tried to do this and I like back then I didn't really understand sine and cosine and that kind of stuff. So I, I, I kind of gave up too. <laughs> I just try to do by as much as you can. Um, so he goes through that and, and then he issues a challenge on this one too, uh, to see uh, if anybody wants to kind of come up with something a little bit better than, and this is part of the challenge too, where he's actually just made a little animated bouncing ball. A ball, um, you know, rotate a sphere, which is... And then some suggestions, like to, to taking a programming challenge where this is just like a very base thing, but how, you know, how much could you fancy it up type thing? Um, which if I had time, I wouldn't mind doing that because that's, that's kind of fun. But And I don't need to understand trig. <laughs> and the last one here, he kind of did a, a kind of a proof of uh, the fact that, you know, we have really old machines we're dealing with here, but they still can do some useful things. You don't need a modern PC to do some stuff. So here he, he called it a dimensional analyzer, which is really fancy saying metric conversion. And uh, basically he's converting between, you know, inches and kilometers and meters and miles and everything else here um, and kind of goes through the math that's involved. Um, he claims, of course, that it's much easier for him to understand the, the imperial system, whereas I'm sure Karen, Nick, Ken, and myself would think the exact opposite because we just have to do powers, or not powers, but multiples of uh, 10. It's much easier to remember that. I, I don't like having to remember how many feet in a mile and how many inches in a yard because they're 5, all odd numbers. 280, 36. Because we're mm -hmm. masochists. Yeah. You, mem you memorize these things. Well, I know we did too. I mean, in Canada, we switched over right in the middle of my schooling. So I, I kind of learned both systems. I much prefer the metric one. I much prefer the metric one too. I just can't think in it. <laughs> well, it's pretty easy to think. How many how many uh, meters are in 1.54 kilometers? That's 1,540 meters. Right, but I have yeah. to, how many got, so how, how many, many yards in 1.6 miles? Yeah, how many feet in 1.54 miles? Well, that doesn't that doesn't matter. But when you said how many meters in 1.4 uh, kilometers, I immediately translated that to miles. Um, because I can, because I can't, because I don't necessarily think space wise. It's like, okay, oh, so that's that would be how many feet are in what would that be? 0.975 miles, yeah, something like that. At any rate, the dimensional analyzer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the thing when they tried to teach metrics to Americans, instead of saying a centimeter is this long, 
they said it's, you know, so many centimeters to an inch. And so you were supposed to look at, okay, that's a hundred feet. That could burst to this many inches. That could burst to that many centimeters. And then I multiply it up. Yeah, they made it more complicated than it has to be. I, I remember exactly. when they were teaching us in 70, what year was it, Ken, that they switched over? 77? 70, uh, 77, 78. I was in like kindergarten. So Yeah, I was in grade four or five or something. Uh, but I remember, like they said, a millimeter. Like everything's based on 10 times this, and you just keep 10 times, you get to millimeter, centimeter, decimeter, meter, you know, et cetera, kilometer. Um, but they they started with a small one being a millimeter <clears throat> is the thickness of a dime. That way you can translate it instantly. You don't have to remember the imperial okay. version. Just you know what a dime, how thick it is. 10 dimes. 10 of those is, is a centimeter. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Um, and I think that really helped that they did it that way because it, it made it, you know, relative to, you know, real terms that you could remember and already knew, but without having you, to translate you know, between. Real things. Yeah. Like it could be like, you know, how many stones do you weigh, Henry? Right. I never heard <laughs> that one. That one's not common here. I weigh 6.03 <laughs> stones, I think. I don't know. I just remember it was awful fun driving in Montreal when my car was in English and every sign was in metric. <laughs> there you go. Ooh, I, can go fast. <laughs> I can go 110 miles an hour. This is awesome. Right. It's like the Autobahn. <laughs> yeah, but the police didn't think that was quite so funny. <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah, would you at least translate the money was... between you know, Canadian money and American, which is kind of metric to imperial, so that you <laughs> at least gained a bit there? <laughs> uh, I just had to say, I'm just some stupid American. Give me a break. I think, like, don't your cars in the States now have the little yeah, yes. metric stuff on the inside, like we have the Imperial one still on the inside, too? Yeah, it's useless. So, Tim Franklin's asking, is that a U.S. dime or a Canadian dime? They're about the same. <laughs> They're about the same. Also really warm. <laughs> yeah, 60 says, yeah, I was brought up in Imperial, and then every single real-life thing was better in metric. We still have some hangovers like pints and miles per hour. And you don't even agree what a pint is. Well, I mean, that's the same with us between uh, Canada and the States because we had the imperial gallon, which is larger than the American gallon. Yeah. So I had to translate gallons yeah. back and forth across the border back in the 70s anyways. Now, that's a good point. If you're in Britain, you buy your gas in liters, but you track miles per gallon. Well, you buy gallon. beer by the true? pint. Yeah, and there's different pints too. And, uh, and like the fact there's pints. different gallons was just yeah. was silly to me. We're all going to die. <laughs> so yeah, Julian Brown is from the UK. says, it doesn't make sense here. We buy fuel by the liter and consume it by the gallon. I well, thought yeah, that was here zero. in Canada, they still <laughs> yeah, push the that's... miles per gallon on vehicles. And so right, then I have to oh, We also do the uh, number of liters, liters per... per 100 kilometers. That's what most yeah. of them do now. My mom's actually used to that already. She knows that better than... Oh, I know that way better than miles per gallon. I mean, my car, you can just switch you know, on the dash you know, go through the little menu system. You just tell which one you want. So when I travel states, I switch it over. So I don't have to worry about translating kilometers to miles or. I still don't know. understand why they use that liters or liters per hundred kilometer metric. Why not use something sensible like kilometers per liter? Honestly, that's what I use right. in my car. Cause I'm worth used to thinking that way. Right. Well, because it's um, small numbers. That's extremely small numbers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, so so we, we're used to that now. We get miles per kilowatt hour. Did you notice you use kilowatt? That's a metric thing. Yeah, you use kilowatt. Yep. You're comparing, you're you're mixing uh Metaphors. there. Measuring Anyways, metaphors. tangent. Let's get back to the news. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need tangents here. <laughs> okay, next up from Todd Wallace. Or Dragon, I think is one of his nicknames. He's got a few now. Um, he's been kind of porting or, or making an app to run virtually on a real Coco 3 with a 6309. And he got an update. He's got the high-res graphics working. So this is like an HDR2. Nice. Um, it's not quick, uh, obviously, because he's doing this on real Coco, but it does work. And he's like played the Looser Realm. He's got Cannibal Blitz here. Um, he's even got it booting DOS now. So he's emulating the disk controller, which is really funky on the Apple II. Yep. Index hole, what's that for? Um <laughs> Really, really cool. He's got it working. I, I would like to try it on the Gimme X. I know it's going to be quite slow the way it is, but the fact you can do it at all. Um, we've got CPM emulators already, of course, too. And of course, we've emulated some arcade systems and stuff, too, transcoding them type thing. But that's a manual transcode where you're getting the speed back up. This is actually trying to run 6502 code with Apple II hardware, and totally in software on an actual Cocoa. Software. Yeah, built hardware and software. <laughs> now, Mark, since you have an interest in both camps, have you actually tried it out? Because I know you put it up for. Uh, Download for testing it. 
I haven't had a chance uh, to do that. No, I actually haven't played with it. I've been busy on other stuff. But yeah, it looks interesting because, uh, wow. I mean, I mean the, the Apple II graphics are all wacky because they're not linear because of the way Woz did the memory. So he's got to read the stuff and then- yeah, It's not linear in two ways. It. Every byte has got that stupid phase bit thing. So it's not even yeah, like just end, pixels. Yep. And yep. then you've got and the interleaving breaks. going on. Yes. Yep. And there's breaks between everything. So this is and like he's a, also emulating the 6502 somewhat. This is like a Dodge Charger trying to emulate a Chevy Nova. Yuck. No, I'd be more like a, a Dodge Charger trying to emulate a VW Beetle, I think. Maybe <laughs> worse. I, I kind of rank the 6502 a little bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's main claim to fame is it was cheap. Right. Mm -hmm. well, you know what, Chevy? And that no, worked. I can't no, deny that. Nova. And to make it work, made sense to Waz. Chevy mm -hmm. Nova. And Nova means no go. Nova. <laughs> In Spanish, yes. Yeah. Nova. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just read the little update here for those on the audio <clears throat> listening to the podcast version. I'm a bit excited to share the progress I've made in the past month on further developing my emulator. In addition to the low risk graphics mode, which we showed previously on a previous episode. I now have working high-res render as well, as you can see from the screenshots. And he's even got the, the, the green phase and stuff here that the Apple does that the Coco doesn't directly do. I've also added support for the Apple II language card since many games and DOSs require the ability to bank switch in additional RAM via certain control registers. I now have a working implementation of the Apple Disk II system so that you can boot games, programs, and even DOS itself. And he sort of screens out, I think, from 3.3, which is the 16-sector version versus the old 13-sector version previous to that. Correct. I remember that transition quite well. Um, since the Apple II floppy controller works at such a low level, emulating it is pretty complex and a slow process. For the moment, it's read-only as I wanted to make sure the code is solid before allowing people to modify disks with it. But it does work. Since loading off emulated disks can be slow, I've also utilized the Coco 3's extra screen real estate to display a status bar at the bottom so that you know the emulator is working, albeit slowly. I hope to have something... People can download and play with sometime in April. And I know we released a kind of a pre-release to a few people here, but you can kind of be as a picture of the actual. Yeah, here you can see floppy reading track 28 sector 16. So you can actually see the progress as it's going like some of the emulators do, you know, the modern emulators do. So that's a pretty impressive feed off actually. And he's even got the, like the color all working and stuff too. I, I do. I would like to try this out. I just don't have time these days. I don't know if anybody else has had time or is anybody else on the panel or in the chat for that matter actually given this an actual try i don't know how much slower it is i imagine it's pretty slow to emulate all the funky hardware that the disc controller does <laughs> julian brown chat says emulating a ford is easy it just needs to break down every few hours well and i'm a ford owner daily I'm... what's that fix or repair daily <laughs> yeah i've been well, pretty I'm lucky in mine i haven't had any do any repairs of mine in 11 years now Aside from, you know, replacing windshields when a rock hits it. Okay, next up, uh, Carlos Camacho put up a post asking, in a hypothetical world, what some of the other color sets would have been best for making games in the VDG, given the restrictions of four colors on the screen at once. Of course, we know the VDG has basically several color sets. The P mode three color sets are these top two here, which is the green, yellow, blue, red. And then you got the pastel one, which is the white or buff, as Tandy called it, uh, cyan, magenta, and orange. Now, one thing that Paul Shoemaker noticed and when he put this little color graph is that these colors are all maximum intensities for that particular color, except orange. Orange is an oddball. It's got like one quarter, there's a one third of uh, G green mixed with full blown red. And it's the only color that does that. And he was speculating it might be better to do pure ones like this. And this, honestly, if you guys have seen the original CJ graphics, this is the exact color set they used, white, cyan, magenta, and black. So you still got your white and black. I'm not a huge fan of the magenta one like some people are. I kind of like having the green, yellow, blue, red, a bit more variety for me. Uh, but he was kind of asking, like, what kind of you know situations could you maybe, if you could pick your own colors and didn't have to follow this grid of intensities here, what are the colors you might pick? <laughs> now, I definitely... I definitely want black in there. Yeah, black and white for me have to be in there. Yeah. I actually, the, like the Cocos artifacting, I think, is pretty, pretty well ideal. Honestly, I mean, great if you had palette settings, you could just change them to whatever the heck you want. But now, one thing that Paul pointed out here, because I mean, Nick, me, and numerous others, except for a very few specific games, hate the pastel color set. 
for something like skiing, it actually works quite well. Um, but for most other games like Puyan, uh, I don't know why James Grown picked that one. He should have picked the other one. It would have looked way, way better. But I was kind of trying to figure out, like, why would you even put that color set in there? Why wouldn't you pick something totally different than this? Like maybe a black with a couple of primary colors or something. And then he pointed out, um, I wonder if the alternative color set we got, buff cyan, purple, and orange, might have been intended for use on a monochrome monitor. When I've used these colors with my green screen monitor here at home, they render quite nicely into lighter and darker shades of monochrome, especially with the color burst disabled. They produce a smoother look than the gray, yellow, blue, red. And I've actually tried playing like the original chess and checkers when I had a black and white TV way back in the day. And you can't tell the difference between them. They look pretty well identical on a black and white TV. And he said, the presumably smoother look and the color set where the blue and the red are almost equally dark. And then he showed a sample with Ghost Rush, which I'll zoom up here, but you can actually kind of see there's some, you know, different colors. Mm -hmm. Shades. Yeah. 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 Better different yeah. shades. And I thought maybe that is why they picked such an oddball color set. Because, I mean, a lot of people back then, you know, color TV was much more expensive than a black and white or green screen monitor if you were using composite versus RF. Is that mm -hmm. part of the decision making Motorola did in 78 when they designed the VDG? Well, and I've always been taught there's there is a math, there is a specific mathematical difference between the different color sets. And it's sort of you go with the colors you've got, not the colors you want. Yeah, and that's so, kind of what his chart up here was doing, which I'll zoom up. You know, and the... so this this is what you can do. <laughs> and brown is weird because, I mean, orange is weird because, I mean, what is brown? It's dark orange. It's yeah. not, none of this is really a color. How do you explain that digitally when it's just a fluke of the... I, I would ask the Commodore 16 people because you know. they had so many earth tones in their color set that it's kind of like they're set up to do it that way. Well, that would be cool if you can do it, but I don't think they could pull it off in 79 or whenever they made this chip. 78. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, 78. So uh, this is what they had. And if you divide by some number, you get green. And if you divide by a dumb number, you get light blue. And I bet these were all mathematically related some way inside well, if you look at the actual breakdown, like these are the 8-bit values of RGB, 0, 255, and all of them are off or maximum intensity except orange. That's the one well, oddball one. Well, yeah, but the, the other thing is that is a digital value that has nothing to do with what comes out of the chip, which is a analog phase shifted thing. And so what could the chip actually do with the digital value to convert it into the analog phase shift? And, you know, what were the limitations of that conversion? And I think that's what we're looking at. They they would have done nicer colors if they really could have done a more clean conversion. I mean, honestly, if they did what our artifacting does, and obviously the artifacting is a little bit lighter version, so it's not a pure bright, you know, dark blue or bright blue like this or the red. It's more a little bit orangish red and a bit of a lighter cyan blue mixture the way the artifacting works. But if they'd done white, black... And then put these two in there, kind of similar to our artifact colors. I think that would have been a better color set than this. And it's still using the pure, you know, max intensity, no intensity at all values here. But I, cyan and magenta just isn't a good mix. Like, I remember some of the CJ games. I thought they looked horrible, even compared to the artifacted cocoa ones. Well, right. But it comes back to the point that the numbers on the left don't have anything to do with the colors on the right, except what you can do with the phase shift dividers in your ch in your chip. And maybe they couldn't put all that together in one set. Yeah, they did by accident with, uh, with artifacting. <laughs> it, it, it got it. Well, yeah, artifacting is a whole different thing. That's a trick that has nothing to do with actual color assignment. That is, that is, it's screwed up on purpose. And we're, we're messing it up on purpose to get these fake colors that don't even belong here. And, <laughs> That's that's just really strange. I mean, it's... I tried My apologies to do... for laughing out loud there, but I just read uh, comments from Jim Gary. He said the MC6847 is per perfect in every way. And anyway, it says otherwise <laughs> can shut their dirty mouth. <laughs> okay. Of course, that's well, what I'll he's got on the MC10, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, given the choice between the artifact colors we did get and the artifact colors like the Apple II has, and then the CJ method of using this as the color set, I prefer our artifacting. Honestly, I think it's a better color mix. What do you think, Nick? You're you're the one who's probably the fussiest about this out of all of us. 
I look, the colours themselves are okay. I don't mind the colours. It would have been good if we had another mapping mode, which allowed for all eight colours to be displayed. And that would mean a video mode that used more than 6K for the yeah, high Yeah, 12K, rep. basically. Yeah, a 12K <laughs> screen. Would have been good if they included something like that. And then you could have all eight colours. Like the eight primaries, still no black? Well, yeah, the black is the the one I would really would like to see, but yeah, without knowing what the exact limitations are. I mean, if you were going to do that, I would ditch either the cyan or the magenta and replace one of those black. Yeah, I'm not sure what the hardware limitations would have been, but assuming that that might have been too hard, I would have liked them to have created another graphic mode that did support. Uh, well, the funny uh, thing is they do have one that does that. It's called semi-graphics. Yeah. That has yeah, black yeah. and all eight colors. Actually, it has nine or ten if you switch the color sets. Actually, that and here's a question. The um Coco, the uh what the VGA, the Coco VGA, does that do 64 characters across? Yes. That's an option. You can do 64 by 32 or 32 by 16. Yeah. So how does it do the 64? Like, is that a VDG trick or is that an FPGA trick he's doing. Uh, that would be an FPGA trick. Uh, basically, it's using a 2K text screen. Right. That the uh, the FPGA interprets because, as a different mode. Because that would essentially give you semi-graphics modes, which are not as the pixels are going to be a bit narrower too. Yeah. Well, you literally, if you're using semi-graphics characters, you get 128 by 64, 9-color, yeah, yeah, 10-color, so, 11-color, depending on the mode. So that would have been good as well, but Anyway, and then of course the the it also has their sixteen color option mode where it basically takes a one twenty eight by ninety six and interprets a different bit pattern to say actually I want sixteen colors. So it's going to take six K still, but it'll give yeah. you much more color. It gives you the simple you know equivalent of a Coco three color wise, just lower res. Yeah, I, I I mean honestly, I I I'm not a huge fan of the the, the CJ set that's on the bottom of this this particular picture, the white cyan magenta black. I just thought that looked garish. It did look better than ours because at least it had black. But did the uh, IBM also have those two color sets? Yes, I, I believe it did, didn't it? Yeah, yeah so they I had a green, it, yellow, blue, red. I yeah, it did. so it, yeah, so I think it still did have that same thing. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah which, instead of instead of the orange, it had the black. They gave us another. Um, so looking at a, looking at a um, uh, YPRPB to RGB thingy. Um, what you've got there is one set that is color and one set that is monochrome. Um, the monochrome set is your white, cyan, magenta, and orange. And the orange gives you a mid-tone range that you don't get um, from like the cyan and the magenta. I think the white's uh, full on, magenta's like three quarters, orange like halfway, and um, then your magenta's one half or something like that. Um, so you still get four ranges from full on to full off in, if you put black in there, but by using an orange instead, you only have to have four discrete Luma levels and, um, very few chroma levels. And when you do have color, you get color and you still get good monochrome performance there. The, um, the, the Luma, the Luma on the green, yellow, blue, red, that's Luma's all on or all off. That's all there is to it. Um, and then all you've got there is chroma data, but um, that one, I'm I'm certain that one's got to be just for color. Nice. And so, so you basically agree with Paul that that mode is specifically to help monochrome monitors differentiate. The yes, I, I would I would agree with that. I would very much agree with that. And just for, as a review here, here's an example of it. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you, you can you can easily see the differences here between the colors where yeah. on the uh, color set zero, the green, yellow, blue, red, blue and red completely blur together. You can tell no difference yep. at all on a black and white yep. TV. Because right. right. I remember playing the, the checkers and chess programs that Tandy put out, some of the original carts there. I tried playing on the black and white TV, and if I stepped away partly through a game and I came back, I couldn't remember whose pieces were what. 
and you can't tell by looking <laughs> unless you wrote it down on a piece of paper or something first. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd never thought of that before, but uh, yeah, and, and to be honest, the checkers and chess programs do have the option to switch to this, you know, the pastel color set, and maybe that's why because it did look better in a black and white. I just never thought of doing that because it was black mm -hmm. and white. Why would I change the color set? I'm not going to see a difference anyway, right? Actually, it looks like I would have if I'd bothered trying. <laughs> Right. Of course, I solved it by eventually getting a color TV, but. Well, it's a color computer, so. All right. Hmm. That's a color computer for rich people. That's well, right. White and gray are colors. The Tandy color computer, it's got a great monochrome. Well, it's not even monochrome, it's, it's gray shaded. No, 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 it's gray <laughs> no, no, it's, it's grayscale. Yeah. Yeah. All, all four levels. Color computer, even more colorful when you turn the color off. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's an advertising scheme I've ever heard one. That's right. <laughs> All right, on to something completely different. So Jack Chadwick has started up a new Facebook group, uh, Tom Mix Software. This includes their Novasoft, which is their low price division. That's basically dedicated to Tom Mix. So there's not too many companies, I think, for the Coco that had the cachet that Tom Mix did for having quality games. Now they didn't always hit, you know, home runs every time. Obviously nobody does, but on average, they had a lot of really, really good software, the Coco one and two. I would rank spectral associates. I would rank computer shack, slash, computer shack slash Mictron in this level later on, maybe something like Dicom or Sundog. Uh, I would put in that, you know, upper echelon of, of having the most quality titles and original games and clones and whatever else. So I can kind of see what you want to do this. And Tomix is actually one of the more popular ones that was sold in uh, the UK as well through licenses with Microdeal. In fact, that's where this screenshot we're seeing here is actually a uh, load up from the uh, Microdeal distribution. Or it might even been uh, Dragon Data because they, they chose some of their stuff too. And Spectral and Computerware are the only other ones I can remember that really sold a lot of stuff in the UK type thing. So um, the group just got started March the 4th. So it hasn't been around that long. I missed it the first time around. Um, but they're basically looking for people to just, you know, kind of join and then reminisce about some of the games, like maybe some of the differences between the Coco and the Dragon versions of games. Um, Tomex, unfortunately, is not one of the companies that transitioned to the Coco 3 all that well. They did a few. They had their uh, casino game that eventually got sold independently by the Leany Brothers. Um, they did uh, Wild West, a graphical adventure game. They did a couple other smaller ones, I think, too, but they didn't really get into the arcade game stuff. Um, like some basically the newer companies were kind of taking that over, like Sundog and Dicom and some others. So I, it's too bad because I would have been curious where some of the Tomix authors could have gone if they had gone on to the Coco 3 and, and kept going with the programming skill that already learned from doing the Coco 1 and 2 stuff. Next up, uh, Tom Cherry Holmes. Um, it's got a video showing him using an 8 bit Atari terminal program that emulates the video text we were talking about earlier based on the manual that uh, Bob Emery was showing, uh, based on the demo server for video text that was written by Tim Linder, which I mentioned earlier. And this is a, you can see that the Atari 8-bit here is actually changing the color set to more closely match inverse video on the Coco. So dark green background, not truly black, with a lighter green foreground. And then he starts talking a little bit about the semi-graphics modes, which he kind of shows in overlay. So I'll just do a quick little bit to show. Up on the upper right-hand side of the screen, I've posted a picture here of the semi-graphics character set. And this is the character set that was uh, typically run from the 6847's character generator that was in uh, that was in the 6847 itself. You'll see that we have uh, two sets of alphanumeric characters up top, one for inverse video and the other for standard video here. Uh, but you'll also see that there are four, that there are eight sets of what are called uh, semi-graphics characters. This anyway, it kind of goes an explanation that because uh, you know people that are viewing this on from the Atari side of things because that's what the terminal program here is is running on. Uh, which to explain what semi-graphics are because that's not something that was typical on in, on many other machines. I mean, there were semi-graphics on the Tier same model one, two, threes, black and white, of course, and it was a different size. It was two by three pixels per character instead of two by two. Of course, they didn't have the color to to worry about there. Um, 
But he's kind of trying to emulate the Vidtex protocol here, and that's something that um, the term program and the Deluxe, as I mentioned before, also emulates because that's basically what it's based on. Now, the full-blown version of that also included RLE graphics, which CompuServe used to have. There's a couple of different resolutions as, as time progressed. I think the initial one was 128 by 96 two-color, and then there was also a 256 by 192 two-color. Um, the color artifacting on the Cocoa got popular enough that the IBM PC actually had special viewers made to view artifact colors based on Cocoa screen captures, uh, which was kind of interesting. I remember that in CompuServe back in the day. Um, but they actually loaded pretty good. And we showed that when we showed Tim Linder running the the terminal program, the actual video text cartridge loading some graphics because it run length encoding. If you had a lot of you know large spots of the screen that were white or black, it actually would load pretty fast, even at 300 baud. It was like you know downloading a a GIF at 56k, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, it actually wasn't too bad. Now the term program, the deluxe. There's three modes. Basically, there's uh, text only, which filters out any graphic characters. There's a semi graphics mode, which will allow all everything you see on the screen there, and then there was a early actual graphics mode. And the term program in the deluxe, now this is very early version, so maybe they fixed it up later, but it specifically does not cover the early graphics version. It only covers text only or semi-graphics, which we'll have to fiddle with it, uh, maybe at the show or something. And then uh, he also did an update just last night. <clears throat> uh, after he's asking some questions on how to, you know, I get the, I think it was the IRQ on a carrier detector or something on the bit banger yeah. he's trying to get working to get drive wire yeah. responding. And unfortunately, DriveWire is not really designed to interrupt the user to say, I've got stuff ready for you, you have to pull it. So he just kind of worked around it. But he actually has a Mastodon client uh, kind of working on it. Uh, and it basically he says, if anyone wants to see the source code to the Fujinet Mastodon client, which shows how to do web queries for JSON, then parsing and display them, you can get it here. And he's actually got a link to his GitHub. So you can actually download the source and see exactly how he did it. Uh, he's currently using Disk Extended Base with HTTP DOS, DOS extensions to the, the DriveWire read and write, and um, has basically got it working and processing it and actually displaying it. So you can actually use a Cocoa to get onto a you know Mastodon type thing. So he's actually made a fair bit of progress the last week, which is really cool. I know he's been asking for more help and stuff like that, and I mean, he's asked me years ago when he first started entertaining the Cocoa side of things. I just, with all my projects, I just don't have time. But I'm glad that he's he's you know continuing on and he's actually been making some pretty good progress lately and there's a, a zoom up now he's running this on a Kobo 2 one of the older ones without true lowercase so you're getting all the inverse video but it does work i'm not sure if the semi graphics characters are supposed to be there there might be some high bit characters that the mass on uh host is providing that he's just not bothering to filter out i'm not sure has anybody fiddled with his uh mastodon client just out of curiosity is anybody here even on mastodon I'll take that resigning silence as a no. No, no. But, Rickets. but the graphics <laughs> things were, are the hex decimals. Hexadecimal. <laughs> Hexadecimal. I didn't even notice yeah. that here. <laughs> Actually, it looks like you might be getting some errors on the read because you've got, oh no, downloads just put on lines here. Never mind. But he's running on the bit banger, so it's entirely possible that it's just getting some glitchy. No, what he's getting there is Unicode. Oh, that's what that yes. is? Yes, yes. Yep. Oh, yeah, 16-bit characters, right? Yep, hexadecimals. That makes sense. Anyway, if you guys want to check that out, uh, the links are in the show notes, which you can get on the Discord, of course. Next up, we have Neil Cherry. <clears throat> now, he's working on pointing uh, Peter Stark, and Stark was the guy who ran Star Kits, which was a company that did 6800 to 6809 based stuff from before the Cocoa even was a glint in Tandy's eye. And he kept going. He was actually uh, sold a lot of utilities type software and some um, spelling checkers, probably spell and fix is probably his most famous product that you know some people that were around the early 80s will definitely remember. I used it all the time for school stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but basically he's porting uh, the Humbug debugging tool from the 6800, which I, he did port to the 6809. And he's actually got a GitHub that he has for Humbug as a copy of other utilities and also Microware's very first OS RT68MX. Now, this is the real-time operating system for the 6800 that Motor or Microware did before the 6809 even came out. I think it came out 77 or 78. And it's a real-time OS for the 6800. Uh, this is when Ken Kaplan was still in university. That's when he started Microware. 
in Iowa. And it, uh, because of this loss, that's actually why Motorola approached Ken to come up with Basic 09 for the 6809. And they actually were collaboratively. They were actually designing the chip around making high-level language work better. And Basic 09 was that language originally designed, which wasn't supposed to be under an OS at all. The original project was just Basic 09 as a language to take advantage of 6809 and vice versa. And so this is basically quite historical. Uh, but if you want to see like Ooh. where where Microware kind of started, this is this is it. 6800 and RT68, which they used to advertise and bite in a tiny little ad in the late 70s. This is interesting. I, I had uh, Star K DOS for 68,000 that Peter Stark did, which was an extension of this, and it was a very original bit of work. Yeah, and Stardos, I mean, wasn't that kind of based on Flex? I remember. There was Flex like in the range. I'm not really sure what it was based on because it was out there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the sectors on disk were a linked list. There was no file allocation table, so you had no idea how much space was left on the disk unless you crawled through every sector and counted them. It, it was a really strange world. But it was fun. And yeah, this was all before anyone was doing anything else so it made sense it's time yeah I'll, I'll just read the little header here just so people that don't know the history of the uh, rt68 mx the very first real-time operating system which is what the rt stands for that Microsoft ever did as they did as university students basically Microsoft's rt68 mx real-time os for the motorola 68 came out in 1977 it's a real-time os by microware microware has been kind enough to allow us to make the code available so this is even legally available the source code. It's a very interesting OS. It's quite small, but 1K in size. Has very little overhead using 128 bytes of RAM for the OS. The rest is for programs, applications, and processes. And it can handle up to eight processes at once. That's pretty amazing for 77. Uh, most of the time, if you wanted some real-time, you know, multitasking like that, multi-process, you'd be talking like running on minis, not on on little eight-bit right. micros from the you know, mid to late 70s. So, really? yeah, it's, that's pretty fascinating bit of history there. And it's got the debugger and the editor and a bunch of other stuff there, too. So memory map, how it works. And uh, and source code right from micro themselves. So I, at some point when I have more time, I'm going to have to delve through this. Cause it's, I'm interested in the history of it, too. And it'll give me some more questions to ask Ken if we can ever get that interview arranged. <laughs> there you go. Next up, and since we have drunk Karen in the chat here, he can help with this. <laughs> XWare 1.5 was released. Now, this was released, I think it's 1.51 is the current one. Let me skip ahead. Yeah, 1.51 fixed some bugs. 1.55, um, uh, various point release happens, isn't it? but it just pushed out 1.55. The big deal here is that hopefully in italics, Windows Audio is now a little less glitchy. Um, <laughs> and, and Bosco confirmed that as a 64 Windows user, XWare 1.55 fixes the slightly garbled that I was experiencing. I know Nick and I have had problems where, especially if you go off focus of the XR window, it really starts popping and doing weird stuff in the background. But I haven't tried five one five five yet. So if that fixes that, that'd be awesome. Has anybody else here experienced that with XR two? I know some of the people recording stuff in XR for YouTube have definitely got some of the audio glitches on there. And from what Karen has said, this this glitching does not happen if you're running it under Linux. I was laughing because Windows eleven and Windows ten, there's a major break in the audio between those two. So good luck, boys and girls. Yeah, I've only got Windows 10, though, and I'm still getting all that weird stuff. Oh, okay. Well, it gets worse in Windows 11. So. Oh, <laughs> well, I have that to look forward to, at least. <laughs> anyway, there's the download link. If you want to go direct to his page, it's now available. You can download source code for it. You can also build, download builds for Debian, Ubuntu, Mac OS 10, Windows, and there's a Git repository as well. So... And he kind of goes through. There's some other stuff he's been doing, not just trying to fix audio glitches here. So 1.5 added the ability to change a picture area, seeing more or less border, which is kind of nice because uh, quite a few of the emulators don't do Cocoa 3 borders quite properly. Uh, respect geometry dimensions and SDL-based UIs, 60 hertz vertical scaling, um, or you can disable it. A faster ROM intercept-based uh, printing for the Cocoa and the MC10. MPI slot config move from global to per cart. Um, screenshot to ping. That's a nice feature for you high score people that are joining on the game on challenge. Um, fixed printing after switching machines, better rendering of paths and windows dialogues, fix some Coco three cartridge behavior. 
uh, some gimme fixes. Uh, 151 added a, a, a cartridge database, mostly for Coco 32K cards for convenience and recognizes drive letters. Fix 152, did some gimme interrupt timer fixes, thanks to Tim Linder. 153 fixes the interrupt, fix, interrupt fixes fix, <laughs> fixes Robocop. <laughs> uh, 154 fixes 609 register memory bid ops, thanks to uh, Robert Allen Murphy. And 155 added STL to use was sappy audio bug fixed since STL 2.293, which I do remember him mentioning the STL sound had some bugs that were known to them, the people that wrote it. It looks like they finally got fixed. That should help as well. And use queued audio interface so you can kind of buffer stuff ahead so that the audio doesn't pop and stop and stuff here. So has anybody here downloaded 155 and, and given it a, a, a try or? Not yet. I'm downloading right now. <laughs> I was just compiling it for Linux, but uh, I seem to be still at 154. So troubleshooting. Okay. Yeah, if, if you guys do get a chance, try it over the next week here. If you guys can report back next week, it'd be interesting to see. I don't know if I'm going to have time to do it before the fest, honestly. Next up, Alan Huffman, and this is you know going back to the Steve York auction stuff and the fact that Roger Taylor managed to pick it up for at a huge cost to himself. But thank you, Roger, for doing that. So he decided to delve a bit more into Tears City Model 1 software that Steve did before he got into the Coco, before the Coco was out. Now, we showed a couple of these last week, Spaceball and the Soft Music Editor, both from 1980. Spaceball is kind of a predecessor to uh, Clowns and Balloons and is based on the original 1977 uh, circus game. But he added some other ones on this particular blog. So here's a Galactic Fighter. And uh, apparently the disc is in Roger's possession. This is a game that we have not been able to find previously. There's some screenshots that people took way back when, <laughs> which we're showing one here, and it looks to be kind of a Galaxian style with saucers. And there's a bit of a controversy here too, because uh, as, as Alan mentions in his blog post, Bjork described his Galactic Fighter game as similar to Galaxian, but predating it by three months. Now, Galaxian originally came out in Japan before... Steve's would have came out, but it didn't come to North America until November of 79. And uh, from what Steve has said, and I haven't been able to verify this looking for ads or anything, his actually came out several months before that. So uh, it, it could be the similar situation to what happened with Double Back versus, uh, what's the arcade game? It's a vector game. Uh, similar gameplay where you have to circle objects. I'm trying to remember the name of the different thing. But basically they came out within... There was no way they could have copied each other because they were working on it simultaneously. And in fact, I think Double Back actually got completed, written, and submitted to Tandy before the arcade game came out. So it could be just, you know, you know, great minds think alike type thing. But uh, apparently Roger has a disc that is labeled Galactic Fighter, but the disc looks to be in a bit of rough shape. So he's going to be really careful getting that one copied because it might be the only copy in existence. Is it Asteroids? Is that what you're thinking of? No, no it's a Galaxian oh. game. Like, Ships are moving back and forth and they dive bomb you. Um, you also found a couple of basic programs that Steve Bjork worked with back in the day, Perpetual Calendar and Biorhythm. These appeared in a cassette tape collection called People Software. And he found a little ad for it. It's about people that you can volunteer to write for type thing. And he even mentions a couple of things in the ad, a Perpetual Calendar by Steve Bjork and Biorhythm by Steve Bjork. So these are basic programs. They're not machine language. And um, of course, uh, I think I'm... A lot of us know that he did the original uh, light pen extensions to basic on the model one and three. And as it says at the bottom of here, they got the light pen itself for 20 bucks. New pen basic by Steve Bjork. Steve is one of the best sim language programmers around and he's come up with pen basic. This low memory routine will add 10 more commands to level two basic, such as pen get, which searches the entire screen for the pen and returns a number between zero to 10, 24 in about one second. Plus nine other commands. Perfect for your lightware authors and new light pen owners too. Um, so that extension basically was fifteen dollars, roughly at the time, and that that one I have heard about. And I remember Steve talking about it. That was one he was quite proud of. And we'll have to see if there's anything else coming. So as Roger goes through things, we'll have to see what uh, what other cool discoveries he can make. Next up, another one from Alan. Um, this was a question he posted, and a, a bit of a statement of question, both at the Color Computer Group on Facebook. He said, on this April Fool's Day, I think back to a few Coco hoaxes. I guess the famous one was the Hounds game. I've never heard of the Hounds game before, so I don't know anything about that particular one. 
The other one he's talking about is one Steve Bjork actually wrote, and it was to simulate. He wrote it to look like it was supposed to be a disk utility, and then it simulated formatting your drive. Now I'd seen a similar one to this even previous to Steve's that was done on the Apple II, where you put the disk in, you hit a key, you know, I'm supposed to just check the disk for free space or whatever the stupid utility was supposed to do, and instead it makes it look like it's formatting. It actually, you know, takes the head, drives it back to track zero, and then tick 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 while the motor's running. You think, oh god, it's writing my disk. And actually, all it's doing is moving the stepper motor. It's actually not writing or reading nothing. Um, and he did the same type of thing. Uh, and I remember him talking about that. I remember it being available, I think, on CompuServe's download area, too, at the time. <laughs> so I was curious for all of you guys. First of all, has anybody heard of this Hounds thing? And then second of all, do you remember any gag prank type Cocoa things that were released you know, around April 1st to fool people into thinking the Cocoa is doing something it's not? The only one I know of is the Steve York one myself personally, and I don't know what the sounds one is. <clears throat> Anybody? I did. I did a fake antivirus thing the way it's back in time that <laughs> it ran through and did stuff, and then at the end it said you didn't really need it because we don't have viruses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I did one a little bit. You guys have probably seen it before, but I did that Windows ninety five fake boot on the Coco. Where actually does a splash screen and actually um, plays the Windows ninety five start sound and then it does some Simpsons bit and it you know says detecting virus found a virus the virus is called Windows ninety five deleting virus and then it finishes booting OS nine. That was fake. That. <laughs> I like that. I know that was one Brian Schubring actually expanded on. He added a whole other scenario where you're talking to Hell nine thousand and killing it off too with sound clips from the movie two thousand one Space Odyssey. <laughs> That's that. That one didn't pretend to be destructive, though. It was meant to be completely tongue in cheek. But does anybody, anybody else, did anything like that, like Ron or me, or or remember seeing one? I want to mute your mic there, uh, Pat or Rick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> or share sounds, with us. Sounds like Fritos. <laughs> oh, this is my most important project acquisition. Um, oh. you, <laughs> Fritos. You, you may not know it, but uh, Chef Mike. Oh, I don't even have a video. Wow, Those I muted like the wrong thing chef. again. Um, so most of the meals here at Cheyuland are prepared by Chef Mike, whose turntable motor went out. So I just acquired a new turntable motor for my microwave, so I can cook supper again. <laughs> so. That's that's a good acquisition. I'm sorry I forgot to turn off the mic or I turned the mic on when I turned it off or whatever the heck I did. Turned the video off when I turned the mic on. I don't know. So I'm sorry, folks, but uh, please resume Coco because that's better than me. Okay. James Jones in the chat is saying, look for sounds of the hounds in the Coco wiki. It never really existed. I've never heard of this before. I'll have to go check that out. If anybody wants to check that out while we're you know doing the news and can report back in the meantime, because I've still got a fair bit of stories to cover. Uh, next up, uh, Marco Spedaletti, new version of UG Basic or Micrographics Basic. 1.16 has been released. Now, this is a cross-platform compiled basic tool, which has added a ton of Cocoa 1 and 2 and Cocoa 3 support. In fact, uh, the version 1.16 is released. That's probably the platforms that got the biggest updates. Um, it's an isomorphic open source basic dialect designed to develop programs that are portable to multiple 8-bit home computers without sacrificing efficiency. So it's unlike the Interfudo or uh, Fabrizio Crusoe, I believe this guy's name, who also has these ones where they do fairly simple tile-based type games where you're basically you know fitting certain grids of characters that you can redefine and you know a bit of machine language routines for doing some sound and stuff. This actually does like full compiles and actually can do full blown arcade games, from my understanding. Uh, what, I know Eric Canales and a few others have actually been fiddling with this. I was hoping maybe some of them would be in the chat to kind of talk about it. Has anybody in the panel fiddled around with uh, Micrographics Basic at all? No, but what other words could we have used than isomorphic? <laughs> it's accurately descriptive. Yeah. Uh, I've compiled right. it a few times and played with the demos, but I haven't spent much time on it in the last few months. <laughs> it's impressive, though. You know, they uh, use a common basic language, uh, modern type basic language, and then target potentially multiple end platforms. Yeah. 
So as you mentioned, this version collects the optimization, bug fixes, and corrections that have emerged in recent months, in particular for the Tier City Color Computer 1, 2, and the Tier City Color Computer 3. So it's got full Cocoa 3 graphics support, et cetera, too. So um, I, I would love for somebody who's, you know, A, got the time, and B, is, is really into this, like Eric or some of the others that were uh, really active on the UG Basic channel on our Discord, to actually come in and do a demo for us at some point. I would love to see that. Even at Cocoa Fest would be kind of cool because I think a lot of people don't really know what it's capable of doing. And we just read, you know, press releases like this where you say, oh, I released a new one. It's got this command at it, but that doesn't tell you how it runs, how easy it is, is it to program, how seamlessly can you translate between different platforms? If you write something like Coke 3, will it work in Atari 8 bit or a Commodore 64? Do you have to do a ton of changes to get it to work? Uh, like that kind of thing. I would love to see a, a, a talk, tech talk, or a, a seminar at the fest here, kind of going through this in a bit more detail. Um, Does UG stand for micro? Micrographics, I think, is what it stands for, doesn't it? Micro Mark? game, I believe. Micro. Oh, it's a micro game. Okay. Yeah. So I'm really curious as to if if somebody can set something up either on a Coco Tech range with Mark, please, and uh, demo it I'll and see. maybe show some examples. And uh, or a seminar at the fest, that'd be a good seminar, I think, to do. Yeah, I agree. Next up, I came across this podcast, and it's a strange one. It's called Nerdery and Murdery. <laughs> it's got two hosts, and they've been doing this for a while. Um, not a ton of subscribers, but it's probably the weirdest format of a podcast I've ever seen in my life. They basically split the show into two things they do something nerdery, which is like retro computing or computing in general. And this particular case, they go through the Tandy Coco with a few you know, errors and a bit of bias as well. Uh, and then the second half of the show is talking about some murderer that uh, is infamous for killing people. That is the oddest combination to make a podcast I've ever heard. <laughs> so you have half about a retro computer and half about people that kill people. <laughs> so if you want something completely different to like download and listen to on a long walk, this would be an awesome one to try. And you can download the Cocoa episode in particular. Um, Finish up that walk a lot quicker than you started it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I just, I thought that's such an oddball combo I had to bring it out here. Like, even well, though they have some mistakes on some of the history and some of the capabilities of the Cocoa, it's mostly correct. Like, they they, they have obviously used them, uh, but they're trying to remember stuff from like 30, 40 years ago. Is one of and, them a and, cop or something? I have no idea. Um, not a clue. <laughs> as it says here zig geeks out over an old computer line and jeffrey spins a sad yarn of jamie rose bolan who got murderized or whatever so yeah interesting interesting concept i have to say pretty unique never seen that kind of a combo before i can say honestly though while coding and making a bunch of stupid mistakes i feel like murdering someone so maybe that's where it came from <laughs> Jeez. next up we have an update um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce what his YouTube channel is, <laughs> but it's basically it's uh, Jim Mullis, <clears throat> and he's been working with uh, Sundog's Graph Express to do his Superpowers game, which is based on the DC characters and the DC comic book of the same name. And he's been fiddling with different techniques using Graph Express, which is basically an enhancement to uh, Super Extended Basic uh, using strings that you pass to an assembly language machine, written by Jeff Steidel, who of course did some of the programming for Contras, and he also did Photon, which is actually one of the premier Coco Three games. It has multi-voice music, uh, it has sprites, it has windowing, clipping, uh, very optimized routines compared to basic, and uh, that's what Jim has chosen as his target, so he can basically write in basic to do his uh, game. And he's been trying to work on different methods that GraphXpress allows to speed up some of the graphics, and one of the things he's been really trying to get running better is horizontal scrolling. So his previous attempts have been pretty slow, we've shown the videos before. So this is using a different technique, and he doesn't go into too much detail here. This is a 256 by 192 screen, so the same size as a P mode 4, but 16 color mode. So this is taking four times as much memory as a uh, P mode 4 screen would take. And this is using double buffering, too, so that it doesn't flicker. So I'll just play it. It's a little quick clip, but you can kind of see. He does some line drawing in the background, and then uh, I think it's a Batman figure, or one of the superhero figures anyway, and then scrolls the background. And this is running a fair bit smoother and faster than his previous attempts were, which were probably about maybe half this frame rate. 
I mean, it's not 30 frames or 60 frames per second or anything, but it's, it's multiple frames per second. It doesn't look too bad. And it's actually doing the proper masking, like Batman's not a rectangular shape, you know, with, you know, pure white in the background. It's actually doing the proper masking of the background, random graphics he threw in. So, Nick, uh, considering this is the type of stuff you do, your bread and butter programming here, what do, what do you think of the speed of that of doing this through BASIC, basically? With, uh, through BASIC, that's uh, that's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. And I, I did talk to Jim a couple, well, probably about two months ago, and I am, as I get time freed up, huh, uh, I'm going to go into the Graph Express and see if I can tweak a couple of the routines to be 6 or 9. I don't know if I'll get native mode working because there's a lot of flipping around, some interrupt stuff that's actually done in Graph Express itself, and I don't know if that requires a complete rewrite. But for some of the stuff like block copying memory, for some of the windowing or the scrolling and stuff, well, that I could TFM. Or I could use, you know, some masking with 16-bit registers where I can have, you know, D to being the mask register doing two bytes at a time, while E and F can be used for the counters needed to do a, to the counters for the horizontal and vertical part of a shape, for example, whereas otherwise you have to do with memory locations, which are slower. So I might see if I can do some tweaks to Graph Express to do some 639 enhancements like we've done on some of the games. And then maybe you, people can write even better games in Graph Express. That would be really cool, I think. And just you know, learn basic and Graph Express's extensions to it. <laughs> Henry, I'm just going to start playing this muted and you can explain what this video is about. And this is this is not part of your fourth. No, this is not part of my fourth. I am uh, I here. I was trying to go ahead and build a FujiNet adapter, which the physical build went fine, um, and you know it was relatively easy to go ahead and put everything together. I'm using the older revision, the double aught revision, instead of the triple aught revision. The triple aught uh, will actually give you uh, will will actually give you cartridge port access. You know, you plug it into the cartridge port instead of having to sideload HDB DOS or something like that. But the biggest thing I ran into wasn't it it wasn't the build itself the build seemed to go fine it wasn't flashing the esp32 though finding and uh, finding and installing the software for the esp32 was part and parcel with that it was actually trying it was actually once i tried to run the software on the coco side it just wouldn't go and i don't know why it won't go so I'm gonna so I'm gonna put that little project of getting a FujiNet up and running on hold for a bit because I've got VCF coming up, I've got uh, Cocoa Fest coming up, and I also want to try to do a build with the uh, with the uh, version three on. Have you tried reaching out to Thomas and see if that's something he's encountered and maybe as you know a way to figure yet, out how to fix not it? Yeah, I figure you know I figure I'll go ahead and try and solve it on my own. You know, and okay. if it's still not working, I'll ask Tom about it because I also noticed that as I'm doing this, he's also working with the code base. So there might be something that is affecting me that is now affecting him that will be corrected in a later version. Okay. And when's the last time you worked on it? Like you just released the Mass and Client Source literally yesterday. So um, um, that's after you probably last tried, I'm guessing. Yeah, I was like uh, earlier this, I think it was earlier this week that I was uh, working on, maybe last week, late last week. Okay. But yeah, I would love, love to see if you can report on this later, like as you get time, like you said, you're getting ready for two shows. I'm just getting ready for mm -hmm. one. Uh, I know how much time that takes, so. Yeah. This is an interesting one I found quite unexpectedly. The auction house that auctioned off all the stuff that Roger Taylor bought actually recorded video of the auctioneer going through the Steve Bjork, and they actually made a special video uh, from the February 24th auction. It's called Steve Bjork Archive Auction Highlights. Um, this struck me as rather odd. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I've never you know participated in many of these types of auctions. Do they typically stream these? Or is it just done electronically where you just send a bid and you're kind of watching a stream or, or watching a text go by or maybe you submit by a certain time? I don't know how these work. Has anybody had any experience with online auctions like this? No. No? Security camera? Just show everything? Who knows? Just the car ones. Because they actually go through all the different lots of Steve, of, uh, Steve's stuff here. Now, I will point out for those watching on the screen here, the actual auctioneer is this guy over on the right-hand side. 
So you'll see him talking, but I'll, I'll play a little bit of it because this, this is news to me. I was hoping Alan Huffman might be in the chat here because uh, I think he'd find this fascinating too. Lot 125, you might require some romancing. First, the seven lots out of the estate of Steve Bjork, who created the Coco computer. How about a hundred and That's go? not quite true. <laughs> <laughs> about now, two and a half, fresh out of the estate of Steve Bjork. Who knows what code is on here? I got two and a quarter to two and a half. Is this open to online? It is as well. Pardon me? Is this a, you, do you have to be there to get the, I, bid that's or? what I was asking. I don't know how these work. I, 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 I'm yeah. pretty sure it's online also. Probably the people on the left of the computers are probably monitoring. So like All if right. Roger was bidding on this stuff, I'm assuming you do that remotely. It doesn't have to be there, right? Yeah. Call, call one of the folks on the left and they, yeah. Okay. Order, it's very rare stuff. I had 300 on the Steve Bjork archive in three and a quarter. But can you see it's already gone up like 75 bucks in the span of like 10 seconds. I got 300 with Kevin on bid live in three and a quarter. Is there any agent past 300 and three and a quarter on the Steve Bjork? So I'm the Kevin's bid on bid three and a quarter down three and a half. Very rare stuff. Original code for the candy computer. 350 now 375. I got 350 in the Steve New York archive at 375. I got 350 with Kevin Lynn at 375. Really rare opportunity for coder very at 350 and 375. Fair warning, Kevin Lynn at 350. So anyway, that, that, that's basically what it does, and it covers each of his lots here. So I'm going to show a little bit of each lot. You can see the lot number at the top here. So here's the unreleased uh, Nintendo Super Pitfall 2 original code. Uh, which you know is now in Roger's possession, which we'll definitely have to figure out what exactly is happening there. <laughs> there's 127, and there's another batch of uh, discs. Another batch of discs, including some actual data soft labeled ones. No, I just reused the slip covers. Yeah, they're just <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> There's some original data soft actually in the original disc too. Quite a few data soft discs here too. And some of the manuals, you can see Surcomp's assembler uh, manual there. I actually have that one myself. Some more source code listings because they had source code listings for quite a few of games like Clowns and Balloons and stuff is in there too, all printed out. And some of these these auctions, like if you go through, listen to the whole thing, you can hear what some of the prices were for the individual lots. And holy cow. Uh, I'm not brave enough to be like Roger and spend that kind of money. All right. So hats off to Roger. Once again, I'll plug his Patreon. Uh, he did put out thousands of dollars to get all this stuff. And he is going to be sharing it and has been sharing stuff as he's been going through it. So if you uh, have the financial means to do so, please go support him on the Patreon. Uh, after the fest, I'll be contacting him about PayPal because I can't really do repeated payings monthly because my work schedule just doesn't work like that. Uh, but I will send him some one-offs to to help contribute to it. Because he really stuck out his, you know, financial neck on the line to get all this stuff, so that you know, it didn't go to some random person who's going to flip it in two weeks and sell it for even more. Bizarre. Sorry, go ahead, Nick. I was just saying, it's very bizarre. I wouldn't have thought that Steve Bjork would have wanted all his. Uh... He didn't. He didn't. He he told people exclu explicitly on his Haunt Hackers forums that he was planning and willing it to Glenside, but that never got through to the estate right. or to his family, unfortunately. Hmm. So once again, you know, we were still got to have our special on getting all that set up, you know, setting up right. deals for retro equipment. Yep. But um, my, make sure your your needs are are known to your family members, well not just the geek community. Right. Do it now, folks. Write it down. I want everything that I have buried with me. I'm taking <laughs> it with me. Well, write it down. Otherwise, we're going to buy right. it all right out of your. That's right. It comes with me. No one's getting it. <laughs> I was thinking of yeah, writing a program to make uh, color computer paddles. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was interesting. I was never expecting to see an auction of Steve's stuff to sh actually show up online. Yeah, um, no. That... So, Alan Huffman, if you're listening to this, um, <laughs> which you probably aren't because you haven't watched a lot of our late shows, but <laughs> um, I, I would love to see your, your opinion on that because you were probably closer to Steve than most of us. You used to go visit him in LA multiple times and you know, you toured Disneyland together and stuff, and, and you knew well what his original intentions were with his estate from way back. And uh, kind of curious what you would think about this. 
I was kind of a bit shocked, to be honest. Next up, we have a channel called Tropical Retro, which sounds awesome. Um, so basically, this is a uh, Brazilian YouTube channel, and it posts a video about the CTP 400 currently in Portuguese. You can turn on Google or uh, YouTube's translate feature. But there is a note in the description. They are planning on re-releasing this video with an English uh, over talking about the uh, CP400. And this goes through uh, some of the history of uh, Prologica and the CP400 in general. It also has some specific programs that they run. And they're showing one of the earlier versions with the Chicla keyboard. Later, they got the more uh, modern style keyboard. Um, I won't play too much here. Linha de microcomputadores TRS-80 nos Estados Unidos, and you can see one of the ads for Prologica itself. And as I mentioned here, many Brazilian companies, they had a really tight reign. The government basically wanted all industries to be internal to Brazil. So they basically copied a ton of machines. They copied Spectrums and Apples and Cocos and a bunch of others. <laughs> basically without any regard whatsoever for patents or copyrights or anything else from you know, any other country they're getting from. <laughs> and here's some of the other models that they made, which are you know more based on the model one and three level type machines. Some more high-end graphic stuff. I think it's specifically into the Coco itself. They're showing a Coco 3 here. but This is an odd one. They put a Coco screen on top of a Model 1. <laughs> yes, they did. Okay. <laughs> and the Coco disk drive. Yeah. Here's the Codemex, which we also saw uh, when we got some of the live streams from the Brazilian Retro Show. The CD609. So they're basically going through the other clones. Now, the Prological by far was the most common. But here's the uh, color 64 with kind of a, it's got basically the same Coco style case, gray. except it's got this very different paint. It's still gray, nice. but it's kind of got that texture to it. And the keyboard is actually quite nice. I'm impressed by the keyboard. That's yeah. more of a battleship color, battleship color than the uh, Mercedes. Than the battleship gray <laughs> we got. <laughs> And here they go through like the CP400 and the way the cartridge slot is quite different than the Cocos did. Though, you know, software compatible wise, if you can get it to fit. And they go through the RAM design, they go through the ports in the back. Uh, some demonstration with uh, power supplies, etc. You can see and paddles that, from the 2600 in the background there. That's their joysticks back there. Yeah. And then they how to cook it up to a TV. So now, Brazil one... had that weird. Brazilian unique PAL, if I remember, didn't it? PAL M. Had to, yeah. They're using a Brazilian unique TV, so they would need that. So, yeah. And there you can see a bit of distortion on here hooking it up to a, a TV. A little adapter that he made, which I missed. The... So you can use a monitor with a composite input. Was that computer wider than the Coco? I'm trying to remember because uh, Brian Weezer brought one down to Coco Fest last year. I'm trying to remember. Mm. I think it's. I think it is a little bit wider because the cartridge is built into the case coming out on the side yeah. rather than right. sticking out. So I think it is a little bit narrower width wise. But not as deep. Is it? Yeah. Is so, it about? Is it about as wide as a PC keyboard would be? Probably. I'm trying to remember. It's mm. it, it's the width of a Spectrum basically with a cassette built in because it's mm. the case is kind of cloned off that. So did it have a bus expansion besides the cart slot off in the back or somewhere? Do we I know? I don't think so, but I'm, I, I honestly can't remember. I haven't really looked at it since the hmm. live okay. stream we did. Did it have a disk drive option? Well, that's what I'm saying, because what would you do if you plugged it into the cart thing in the front? You got the door flop. So does it have like a bus? Well, I do remember seeing somewhere. like extender cables where you can actually plug it in and then bring it out to a port that would plug, you know, wherever you want to lay in your desk. Probably, yeah, you I, I think they've actually hooked it up to multi-packs that way too. You get a ribbon cable coming out, plugs into the multi-pack and then the multi-pack you put the cards in. 
Okay. The inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. But you can see here, like this is one of the cartridges, and it's quite different shape and size. Yeah, and, it's, than, and it than goes ours. all Much internal, narrower. and you close it, and it's away. And I do like the grip handle to yank the sucker out, though. That's kind of nice. <laughs> Maybe spot there. Well, one thing, good thing, is it didn't turn yellow much, right? <laughs> no. Right. And here they demonstrate players playing. So this is like using a pure VDG mode. Uh, o do CP400, now, é, with modern TVs, you get this kind of cross-hatchy look. Que they all do that. Solta. The older ones didn't do that. They kind of put it together. That looks like defense. No, it's the better one, players. <laughs> yes, it is. And here's tennis, which is another one that was a, a Tandy product. Now, that's, that's one game where the green suits it. Right. Yep. You're absolutely right there. And then he played Donkey King. Now, this is where you get to see Brazilian PAL actually does have artifacting. And it's different than the PAL artifacting. But you get a purple ape. Now, maybe you could flip these, but he's got his... Instead of blue and red, he's getting purple and reddish orange. Uh, is that like the uh, Deluxe Coco's blue... Blue it might be. I, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, like a face shift. Yeah, yeah. yeah it looks like a face shift. Because I do remember the, 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 the PAL in Brazil was very strange. It was almost like an NTSC PAL hybrid. Uh, it wasn't the same as the, the PAL in, in Europe. Best of, worst of both. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it wouldn't be your PAL. Well, it did give you artifact colors of, of a sort. I mean, you'd have to program, you know, with their colors in mind, I guess. But so I, I'm, I'm like a, the translation engine in YouTube isn't perfect. So sometimes it, some stuff it says is missed or some stuff is nonsensical. So I'm waiting for the fact that they've actually advertised there is going to be an English version that's coming out. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So link for the English version of the video to be announced. So once they get the translation done, there'll be an English over talk and I'll bring it up again and I'll actually I will listen through the whole thing and see what all they talk about. Next up, Tech Guy Life. Uh, this is the second part of a Coco One repair. So the first one, he replaced the power supply with a modern one. Uh, so it does power on, but it comes up with you know constant characters on the screen. So this time he's going through and figuring out. This was a uh, an upgraded Coco One that had stacked 16K chips to get 32K which is why you got this wire going all the way across here to connect that extra address line to get the upper bank. And uh, I had this in my D board back in the day before I replaced some 64K straight through RAMs, which why required trace cuts it? and stuff that I definitely didn't do. I got people to know what they're doing to do it. Did they make it serpentine to keep from having uh, interference? You no. electrical guys can tell me. No, that was that was so we could get our fingers around them. It doesn't make sense. Otherwise, it's too small for our fat fingers. <laughs> I, I do remember this <laughs> this pin sticking out. You had to solder the wire on and going back and forth. I do remember that. Well, see, and you got more room for slop if you kind of swoosh it back and forth, where if you went straight through, you'd have to solder everything exactly right. Camera or anything like that. So I thought maybe this will at least give me a sort of here chips and i've already <laughs> so this originally was an older model coco you saw the ram badge on the right the radio shack labels offset to the left and i'm thinking i don't know if he moves his thumb out of the way here or not but it's i think it might be a d or an e board i don't think it's an f mm, it's gonna be d or earlier the e board the supported the 64 directly so, what i'm gonna do... i thought it just labeled 32k on the board though didn't it or am I remembering wrong? Yeah, but if you look at the jumper between the two PIAs, it's 4K, 16K. 32K machine, which probably worked great. But now I think we have a bad RAM chip because a couple of them get to uh, 50 plus degrees after a few seconds after turning on the machine. So... Oh, here, we can find out here. Well, 50 degrees isn't much. Celsius, Celsius. I think. Yeah, it's a D-board. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the same board I had that I had upgraded to 64K by people who knew what they were doing. And D didn't mean dumb. No. I mean, there's a few C boards around. I know Richard Lorbieski has a couple of those, um, but I've never seen them in the wild other than with him. I don't know how many of those were actually sold. Do you know, Mark? Mm, no. Was there an A and B? 
there was. And if you ever had one come into the service department, the first thing it told you to do is replace it with a D. Oh, right. <laughs> do not so there was this... A and Bs released to the public? I thought those were just internal ones. Um, not to check the tech one again, but uh, if you found one of those early boards, there was no upgrading them. Oh, don't let this out of the building. Just give them something better. Okay. I, I didn't know that. That's, that's kind of cool. So he went and replaced RAM and kind of re stocked it back down to 16K, took all the chips apart, and uh, it came up. Kind of a crappy picture, but it came up. And it's booted. And I think he might be missing a wire between um, that bank of RAMs and that other chip that's over by that screw there on the other side of the regulator. Okay. So I haven't seen this whole thing. So did he get it working? <laughs> What's well, working right now? No, when he went back to the 32. I don't think he, he did that. He was actually fiddling with some other things. He was trying to figure out the extended basic versus basic. So we pulled one out and booted up to see what version of color basic he had. Um, when he's already I think it's 1.0. Oh, yeah. he had fun with the keyboard. <laughs> I remember this from my D board. Because he had some problems with some of the keys weren't registering all the time. And a little bit sticky and stuff here. And... uh Unlike um, later ones where it was not too bad taking the keyboard apart. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. <laughs> Rick knows that one. Don't, don't I know this one too because I went to clean it and I did the exact same dang thing. Oh, uh, here go the pieces, parts. Excellent. Because <laughs> he didn't know they weren't stuck, right? Here, these going to fall out. And. Are. <laughs> <laughs> Man, is that a pain in the ass to put everything back? Does that say, make the same noise at your house? <laughs> so, so all you and all these little rubber things to bounce the keys back and stuff and cleaning all those so you can get hair and crap in them. Oh, I hated yes, this keyboard. Yes, it so was all, an evil. He, all he needs to do now is give you a call, Rick, for, for a replacement kit. Actually, he's uh, asking about that. Part of the, At the end of the video, he's asking, like, you know, what kind of game should he run and what you know, hardware add-ons, I mentioned the Coco STC in the comments, but uh, one of the things he was asking about was replacement keyboards because he's seen some of the other videos like Mark Data Products, HDL 57s, and he's asking, are any of those still available? Um, I didn't mention Rick, though, because I think he wanted to get a whole replacement keyboard, not just the the key, you know, keep clicking part right. of it, but the actual right. keys. So he's not a huge fan of the chiclet. <clears throat> so I mentioned, you know, Ed Snyder occasionally does have his out there. Uh, does anybody else make replacement keyboards, not just the... The circuit board part and the well, switches and i guess it's important to mention that all coco keyboards except for the melty coco 2 are the same so you can use any kind it's the same size it's the same mounting you don't have quite as many tabs on the later ones but it doesn't need them so, so i can put a chiclet on a coco 3 you can I've put a chiclet on a coco 3 you can put a full travel on a coco 1 I had a Coco matter. 3 keyboard that completely so, died because the Mylar busted, and I actually put a Coco 1 keyboard in there, chiclet one, just to get it going long enough to get some work done. We do <laughs> sell an adapter, so you can go from the header pins that this thing has to just a Mylar a ribbon. Yeah. ribbon thing. Yeah, because yeah. the Mark Data products used to advertise you had to spend an extra four ninety five US to get the little adapter to take right. the Mylar... And the so, slide into digital to the so, road. So pins. anyway, if your Coco has this keyboard, we can give you like a ten dollar adapter that includes shipping that you can plug any Coco keyboard in, and you're good to go. And it fits right in your case, and the top goes back on, and you're you're done. So there's no reason to fix this. Now you should take all the pieces of this, put it in a bag, sell it to me, and I'll turn it back into res restoration quality keyboard for somebody. But there's no reason to. Well, I, I will give you a fix. spoiler here. Like when he finishes cleaning every individual piece with a Q-tip and alcohol and stuff like that, it actually functions way better when he's done. Because yeah, he had keys yeah. sticking and keys not registering, and all that disappeared when he cleaned it. So, but he still wants to get a like a a, a more typical like a full travel style keyboard type thing up from the sounds of it. And I'm trying to think: is anybody besides Ed selling something like that? I mean, back in the day, we used to have AT XT keyboard adapters, but I don't think any of those, unless Mark's still selling mm -hmm. his. I'm going to have a few that are key fixed broken keyboards that look good, but Rick, Rick, you should get the URL for this video and actually give him a comment then. 
Okay, I will do that. You might you might get a sale out of it. <laughs> well, or get some, yeah, attention is good. So <laughs> oh, it'll be in the show notes anyway. So you, you put it back on, it works good. And he starts talking about what can he do with it. He's got a cassette recorder. He does have joysticks, the Black Beauties. And I give him some suggestions there. So actually, I think he sent me a reply this morning. I just haven't attended to read it yet. Next, we got an update from Jim Brain, the president himself of Glenside, calling calling all cocoa connoisseurs. Now, Grant's kind of covered this last week, but for those that missed it last week, I'll just read a little bit of it here. Uh, just one month from today, the 32nd annual last Chicago Cocoa Fest will officially kick off at the Carroll Stream Illinois Holiday Inn for 2024. We've taken over the entirety of the show space at the venue, not only filling the entirety of the main hall, but also taking over space across the hallway. Cocoa Fest coordinator Grant Leedy is busy finalizing the presentation schedule, which we post along with the hotel reservation information exhibitors at the Cocoa Fest part of the Glenside site. For the second year, Cocoa Fest is sponsored by Retro Rewind. Please stop by their booth at the show. So thank you, Frank. Speaking of hotel accommodations, they've noted 102 nights have already been reserved, although they're holding the block rate open until April 17th, as Grant announced last week. And it's a fair bit of a price difference. So if you want to go, I would definitely book before that date, if you can. Well, if now, that's if 102 nights, does that mean it's really only a uh, uh, 51 people got rooms? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering nights. about that because that's not what Grant they, said. They, they misspelled rooms as nights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're considering joining us at Carol's Stream, there's no better time than now to take advantage of the room rate. Like last year, attendee admission is free. Though we really appreciate pre-registration, the Tantalus Economy, of course, as Grant mentioned, you can actually win a prize if you do so. Also, as previous years, we're offering a catered evening meal at the hotel, and you can order tickets for that at the website. I've already got mine. I like being able to hang around all the hotel and see people scattering to a bazillion different restaurants, depending on the... <laughs> right, right. Like, yes. back in the old Coco days um, in Schaumburg, like during Rainbow Fest, while well, Rainbow Fest was so huge, you had to go some other, other places, but... Like the early Cocoa Fests in the early 90s and stuff, when you had four or 500 people showing up, we filled the entire hotel restaurant front to back. It was just Cocoa people. So you just wander around the tables while everybody's eating and just visit with everybody. It was awesome. And I I, I, I kind of miss that when people go, you know, I'm going to go to this pizza place and I'm going to go to this, you know, German restaurant. And I'm going to go over to McDonald's and Portello's. Yeah. Like it's just a scattering of little pockets to become clicky. And I much prefer we just all hang out together myself personally. Right. Right. <clears throat> Sorry, that's kind of the official update from uh, Jim Brain himself. And uh, actually, I haven't checked the candy cocoa list here. So let's while we're sitting here, I don't think anything's been updated. So of course, the main four completely sold out. And the auxiliary room has got two tables available. It's the same. And then Forgotten Machines, of course, is getting the hallway space. So looks like that's about the same. So. Definitely going to be a, a the biggest show we've had in years. Where's the 100 Decades. series? Sorry? The 100 like the... series is the hallway. Yeah, there's one guy taking it all. <laughs> oh, I see how they got the, the column set up. Yeah, it just didn't columned over badly. Yeah. The 200 series is that extra room off to the side, and then the 100's the hallway, basically. Okay, next up, the Motorola 689, 609, 6800, a semi-language programming group on Facebook. Craig Ianello, hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, has an update on his pug computer, as he calls it. He's actually got this machine, which is a 639-based machine, now running, uh, getting files off an SD card at 17.1K per second. And he says, I know that's not much by modern centers. And to be honest, we did faster than that on some of the hard drive controllers back in the day, like the Eliminator and the Burke and Burke. He goes, hey, it's almost 50 times faster than a Commodore 61541 disk drive. <laughs> <laughs> and then he explains why it's slow, and he's absolutely right. You can definitely improve this. So he said, I think this can be improved a lot. The 609 is currently checking a 16-bit CRC over each 512-byte packet, so basically the size of a PC disk sector at the time, after it is all received. So basically it receives a packet, and then it spends all its time calculating this CRC over 512 bytes, then saying an ACK. And no more data is sent until after that act. So basically, it's receive data, do the calculation, send the act before the next packet sends. Um, so there's a couple ways to speed up, and he mentions them here too. He made a mistake. He's talking about a sliding window X modem. X modem doesn't have a sliding window. That's Z modem. 
or why won't them batch. Uh, but basically, you can have it so that it's actually you know simultaneously receiving the next packet and just assume everything's fine and you only send a knack if something went wrong. So if you have a nice smooth transmission without any errors, it just floors it and keeps going. The other thing you do is calculate the CRC as you're going so you don't have that long pause of having to do a 16-bit CRC calculation on 512 bytes of data at once. You do it as it comes in, and then you're still receiving the next byte while you're doing that quick little calculation. So that would speed it up as well. If he does both of those, and uh, he's also thinking he could just crank up the speed because it's a short parallel connection. Uh, he's probably he's estimating you can probably get a five to five, five to ten times speed up, which would put you up, you know, between one well, that'd be one hundred and seventy at the top end down to you know eighty five k per second. And I mean, the Coco SDC, I can do a, a mega read in seventeen seconds. I have to figure out the math there, but uh, yeah, you can definitely get it running a bit faster, especially because I think this is six through nine. Uh, code running. I don't know if I can't remember if his project is running at two megahertz or three though. Three should be able to do faster than that. And the last uh, story here is actually I sneakily got out Nitrous Nine Ease of View version one point zero point one and put it up for download just before the show started, so you guys can go grab it. Okay. And uh, for Number Rick one. and some of the beta testers, um, there's some changes. So fairly minor nice. on the six eight oh nine six zero nine standard releases. I the Gimme X releases are included in there as well. There's more you substantial changes there. You didn't switch your screen. I know. Uh, this is part of the oh. tease. <laughs> oh. So basically, it's uh, you can all get it on the Nitro Stein um, page on my website, which I will now switch to. And you'll see here, <laughs> one phone's available. I put as of tomorrow's day because I wasn't sure I was going to get it done and ready. That's why I was late for the show because I was just jamming out the last bits of it. <laughs> oh, nice. So. It's here now, eh? Right? Yeah. So if you clear down, I actually changed the splash screen here. It's actually showing the version 1.01, which has some extra checks it's doing when it boots up on Cisco. Uh, copyright date extended to 2024. Um, Send screenshots. This screenshot's changed a little bit because we've actually split the games into that are one mega folder with everything. It actually has sections and you know games that have their own set of files get their own folder just so you don't have a mess of stuff it has to load and relook nice. for. Nice. You know, oh, nice. uh, things. I did not take a picture of the narrow screen here, but I'll show that in a second. And then a few other ones here, too. And basically, right. the versions available right now, you've got the standard 6.09, the standard 6.809. The 6.809 version will run on a 6.09 just fine. It's a little bit slower. But if you want to try, you know, backwards compatibility with or see what the speed would run like if some if you created a game, for example, and you want to see you know, it runs great on the 6.09. How will it run on the 6.09? You can just download the 6.809 version, run it on there, and it'll tell you how fast it'll run because it doesn't run native mode or anything else. The Gimme X releases are also available now. And I've also got this update. Now, I tried this update thing last time. This is the first time I did it was version 1. And this is basically a disk image that just has directory structures for all four of the bases with only the files that have changed. So for those of you who have you know, done a lot of changes or modifications to the main VHDs themselves, of course, if you replace it, they all disappear, which is why we recommend if you have you know custom environment files or custom uh, setups that you do, copy drivers. them off onto the, a blank second hard drive image or a floppy image if they're small enough. And then you can just restore them after you install the new one. Well, this is another alternative way. And this way you can you also know, piecemeal. Like if you're not a game player, maybe you don't care about all the game stuff we added. Because I think we added four games on this this version. So you may want to get the updates. Only want to just skip the games directory folder structure entirely and just do other things. You can pick and choose. And that includes source code, executables, documentation files. Uh, one of the things I've taking a lot of time to do on this one because there's not a ton of changes at the operating system level. There's a few. There's some bug fixes to Base09, for example. Thank you, James Jones, who's in the chat. Um, but I, 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 one thing I, I that Nick Morandi's really got me on to is uh, there's a feature on the Amiga where you can bring up, when you launch stuff on modern Amigas, you can bring up a little window that tells you like critical controls, like how do I exit the game? What's required for the game as far as controls as a keyboard? What keys do what? Um, what is it called, Nick? Is it WDH load or something like that? Uh, yeah, um, WH load. Yeah. So inspired by that, I actually took time to make dozens and dozens of little help files for all the apps that have icons, or at least most of them. So if you click an icon, single click it instead of double clicking to launch it, <clears throat> and then you either select the question mark in the upper right corner of G shell with the mouse, or you can just hit the question mark shortcut on the keyboard. It'll pop up a little window, which will give you a brief explanation of what the program does and then some critical keys, like how do you exit it cleanly without you know breaking out and maybe leaving buffers, you know, loading up your memory with stuff that you're not using anymore. 
Uh, so it should make it a lot easier for people to do a quick look without having to find the full documentation. Now, some of the programs are complicated. So there is full documentation in the docs directory for quite a few of the programs as well. But as a quick and dirty method, it's actually not too bad. Now I'm going to bring up VCC here and I'll kind of give you a little brief demo of some of those little features. And then uh, you guys can request to see something if you want. Which version I got 639? Because it's stock 639 version. This is not going to be Give Me X because none of the emulators do that yet. And I will just let it boot up and share. And I have to say that Gimme X makes things so much faster. <laughs> But there isn't um, any even though one. it has to slow down for the Coco STC, we have to slow back down to two megahertz. Otherwise, the Coco STC just starts erroring like crazy. If only the Gimme X was reduced so much faster. I, I'm now. I know my VCC does not like sharing sounds. So you're probably not hearing the key click, but I'm going to shut off because it annoys the hell out of me when I'm doing this. And you guys uh, give me feedback. Like, there's certain things I could change on the next distribution. Like, if the key click, which I originally put in, defaulted on the first main window term, was specifically just to show people that feature's there. Um, and I do find it handy if I'm typing stuff while it's busy doing something else and I'm not actually seeing feedback. I'm not seeing the keys being pressed. At least I can hear every time I hit one that it clicked, so I know I didn't miss a key. I can even correct typing mistakes based on that feedback. So. So you need the clicky key fix is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I have it, you actually. Retained, you retained the garbage can. <laughs> well, oh, Nick would have throttled nice, me if I didn't. Nice uh, garbage. garbage can. So here's okay. here's the standard view. Um, and now one that Rick requested was to get back the icons at the ratio that the original Tandy multi-view did, which is the new 80 by 25 by 4 thin. Yes, I'm going to have icon packs for this thin icon pretty soon. Yeah, I got so used to the fat and ones that Kent Myers added, and I kind of stick with that. And actually, this is one thing that surprised me. The speed of drawing a screen refresh of icons is actually more slowed down by far by the six pixel wide font that the text uses. That is much slower because that's the bit shift than anything else. It doesn't fall in even byte boundaries. Ooh. So switching between these two, doesn't make a huge difference in speed, even though it's doing twice the graphics, because the get put buffers are byte aligned and they are using the fast get puts. Um, but it's the text that's slowing it down. Actually, I do like the thin one better too. If you you like the thin one better? Well, it looks a bit more high res. Right. The well, ones and that's true. Look and this clear. is even misleading because these icons are drawn to be chunky. They are not yeah. as square as they look here. Uh, well, yeah, I do know the reason it. that Kent did that is because a lot of people back when Multiview came out didn't get the RGB one because it was 300 bucks extra. Well, right. And these look great on a te television. So this is what they were used to seeing. Right. And when well, they went to the thin ones, they said, oh, it just looks weird. So Kent did well, the thing. And, and I guess my point is even the thin ones on a television were better with the little chunky, like, stair step look. Yeah. That isn't required by the actual native resolution, but it looks better on a TV because it gets too thin and you end up with rainbow colors, not not a diagonal Yeah, because the artifacting kicks in, right? Right. <laughs> so you have to avoid the artifacting by using two pixels for every horizontal step, even in the thin mode. So it, it's, you know, it's it's weird. It's, it's complicated and uh, we don't do that anymore because no one has a television. <laughs> if you do the one that has 16, isn't that supposed to be color? It allows you to design icons stuff that have 16 colors. Yeah, but there's no color at all, is there? No, because I'm just using the. I, I'm not redrawing all of these icons or, or remaking them all for 16 colors. Right, now, if you want to, go ahead. No, would they <laughs> well, be yellow well, or something? Well, no, um, like I say, I, I have an icon pack that's like a four-color set of icons for the skinny mode. But that's a very specific thing that I drew up. You would have to do that for any weird kind of color icon thing you wanted to do because no one done it before. <laughs> the 16 color mode, because it, it doesn't, like the original multi was trying to run a 128K machine, so they couldn't duplicate every icon for every color depth. 
Okay. Um, right. So right. basically, the 16 color mode is more for the control program, so you can actually see all 16 colors at once, rather than just seeing slider bars without actually knowing what the color look like. Now, in the default mode, it basically creates eight colors and duplicates it for foreground and background, which is what you're seeing here on the left and right on this column on the right here. But you can set them all individually. Yeah, you can get more colors on the screen if you want. That's Fred Provence's control panel version 3.2. I can't even remember now. Yeah, 3.2. Yep, yep. That is so much nicer than the old one. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, um, because we have five icons, you guys can see them probably even on your phone. I'll just switch it back to the part where I fit more on the screen at once. Um, so just to show you an example of the help, and hopefully I'll pick one that actually I did it with. So I'll just go in the apps folder. Uh, so let's say I want to run Galilean Sat. So I can go up here and click the question mark. Nice. So it explains what the program does. Must run from a 320 or 192 or higher window with at least four colors. So if we try to run a two-color window, it will not work. So it tells you that information. So we folded back to that help on how to use help concept that we were talking about earlier. You've already installed it in EOU 1.1. And if you want to use a keyboard shortcut, which actually I usually find better, because if I want to launch the program, why do I want to move the mouse way over here, get the help, and then move all the way back? Wait, wait, it says Deskmate 3 right there. Work in progress. Uh, yes, it's a folder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll see a few of those kicking around. I thought I was going to be able to get it done until I discovered, oh, there's more than just the main program I have to fix. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of crap. It was on last time the same way, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but at that time, I hadn't even fully disassembled the main deskmate program. Right. No. And then when I did, I started going through the other ones just to do a quick check and, oh, wait, this one needs fixing too. Oh, crap, this one and does too. One... So it, it's progressed further. Like, I'm closer to getting it. I think I have the main program basically working, but if you try to run some of the certain apps in deskmate, it will still screw up. So now if, if I like click this single click so you get the outline box, and then I just hit the question mark on the keyboard, I can leave the cursor where it was, get whatever documentation I need, and then just click it one more time and it launches without moving the mouse all over the damn place. Just like big boys now. Yeah. And just, just for Ron, here's his deskmate. Not much in here. <laughs> now, another keyboard shortcut we added is the period key to go back a directory. Now, you can do this the normal way, which is basically hit the close box and it'll go up one directory at a time and then it refreshes that and then goes back, click it again, go back one more directory and you can close off the drive if you want to switch drives. The funny, the fun thing is, is that because now I've got a keyboard shortcut and the keyboard buffer is 128 characters, if I'm like six levels deep, if I tap the period key four times in a row, you'll watch it go back a directory, then go back a directory, then go back a directory, then go back a directory. So you can actually buffer ahead going up the directory tree, <laughs> which on the mouse you have to keep the you have to wait till it refreshes, then click. Wait till it refreshes, then click. And you don't have to do that. So if I want to go to the root here, I just tap it twice. Goes up to apps, then goes right up to the root directory, and there I am. Awesome. Nice. So that that's kind of a, a nice little feature. Custom. Um, what Special. else we got here? Go back to oh. the thin icons icons. Pardon me? Go back to the thin icons. Ah, oh, Nick, you're such a problem child. Ah, much better. Yeah, I do like that. <laughs> a little more air. So far, you the... and you and Rick are the only yeah. two I know of. I, well, actually, yeah, let's no, get an opinion of the panel. Not... What do you guys think? And it's, maybe it's, I'm the only one that thinks that that as well. Problem. Yeah, I agree with with Rick on that. How does M shell work? I'd be okay uh, M... with the thinness of those on a sixteen by nine monitor. Right. Yeah, we're well, and, and, out of it. <laughs> and again, these are double stepped wide to avoid artifacting. You don't need to do that anymore. So mm -hmm. you've really got to see icons that are drawn for this aspect. To, well, uh, here's here's a proposal, Rick, because I mean, you know. it's using, it creates buffers. Like the original icons are 24 by 24 pixels, period. Right. The double wide ones basically just map the buffer in and double every pixel horizontally and creates right. a separate set of buffers. In fact, they're all still in there. In fact, if you right. uh, go to a different window here and you do a GP map, you can oh, see the alternating oh. ones. It does a different group number, and it's 24 by 24, 48 by 24. That's the exact same icon. Right, right. 
and it just keeps going through that like that. So you have the, and you can see the screen type here, six, which is a four color 320, seven is a four color 640. But basically that's all it does. I sure. could make it so that it actually loads alternative icons that use the full 48 by 24 that you can define at a pixel level, not double them up. So you have full control at full high res. Is that something that might be something people would want, do you think, or I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Because somebody's got to draw all the damn things. I'm I'm running uh, my my uh, eighty column icons, uh, if you'll call them the full res icons, on uh, two four or two two four a some kind of patch mode that nobody has. But uh, yeah. the thing here is, they're artificially less resolution than they are. Yeah, they're basically the, zoomed. Uh, Pix the uh, double zoomed. the the reason that the horizontal line is double pixels wide is to avoid artifacting and it doesn't have to be that way these icons could be drawn with a much smoother horizontal yeah. line or diagonal line than they have and now, I've done I, will, I will mention kent myers who did the whole double wide stuff he did not create it for our composite at all that was our artifacting he didn't care about that he just thought right. the proportion looked wrong switching for the 320 he thought everything looked better in proportion right right because basically it's more square pixels and these are like half it's, it's, pixels it's, I guess my point is it's two separate concepts. How, why do you draw the icons and how are the icons drawn? And, uh, here's part one. They're, they're displayed narrower, but they also need to be drawn to use that to good effect. And that's not done yet. And so this isn't quite as good as it will be fully maximized. So I it sounds like been, you you would you would like to have the option for a fully defined forty eight by twenty four. Well, no, I've I've got a different not. icon set that looks a lot better without changing anything. It's just oh okay, different base data, and uh, I just don't have it available yet. But uh, because it was drawn for a whole different system with different color mapping, and so now I have to do your dark to light scheme and. You know, there, there there are changes to be made. Yeah, because uh, I mean, when when we first talked about thin icons way, way, way back, late '90s, early 2000s, I was thinking because there's so much gap space here between that, maybe I should actually allow the a background graphic because you could actually see a lot of it behind all, all these right. if you did the square surrounding. Whereas if you're in this mode, there's not a lot of room for a background right. picture to show through. So I just I like the extra air to be honest. I don't even want anything between. I just want the air there to kind of make, you know, the targets separate. And I don't know. It's just, it's a style, you know. And so, how about you, Nick? Is that the same thing for you? It's a kind of a stylistic thing or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do like the uh, the, the air there, yeah. So what what is your guys' opinion on the 320 where you really don't have much of a choice? Well, there you um, go. You can do. <laughs> I would probably still like. Can you do thin there as well? Does it have an option? Well, no. Which I'd I have to actually create a get yeah. put buffer where I literally remove every second pixel to do that. Oh, that would be nasty. Well, yeah. Depending uh, on the icon, it would look like absolute although, crap. <laughs> if you drew the icon, if my alternate icons without the double steps might be skinny in this mode anyway. Yeah. But how about all the icons everybody's done for their apps though? Like some of the text that people draw in here, you wouldn't be able to read. Well, like no. if I took every second pixel at RS and DW here, you wouldn't have a clue what those were trying yeah, to say. Yeah, I'm saying don't change it. I'm just wondering if it isn't that. So look at the the M shell icon is double the resolution of the folder icon just below it. That's all artificially doubled, you know. Well, in, in the wide mode there, in here they're actually literally yeah. the exact same pixels because this is a 320. It's just 24 by 24 in all cases. I'll, I'll change it to the. 80 comps. That looks good. Okay. Well, yeah, there's there's thoughts to be thought and work to be done, but I think it can be brought together. See, my worry is is that if you define the the standard icons like folders, executable programs, data files, text data files, etc., that those will look good with the, the new snare that you're talking where you design them for that mode. But what do you do about all the third-party stuff that everybody's done? Do you redraw them all or do they just all look skinny? Well, I mean, we've got icon packs. So look at these skinny. They they look weird. I mean, Gilly and Sat is 
not a circle, <laughs> but it's certainly lookable. G calendar is probably better in this mode because it does have the skinny vertical lines I'm talking about. Um, you know, so you have icon packs. Maybe someone fixes a bunch of icons. It's you know. It's, yeah, I guess. Okay, somebody wants to put the work in. I'd, I'd be fine including them. I, I am going to be working on some alternative ones for the actual mouse cursor and stuff here. Because I had a better set back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and that was part of my hard drive crash. I never got a chance to distribute to anybody. So I have to start from scratch, <laughs> which sucks. But, okay. but the, We could make it look really nice if we just want to spend a minute. So I want to show a couple other things here. And you guys, if you guys are getting bored, just let me know and I'll, I'll stop. Um, well, one is a rather famous picture. Um, yeah. The only concern I have is uh, what was mentioned about a thunderstorm coming up, question mark? Yeah, Ooh, there's, a, there's a thunderstorm fixing to uh, hit me over here. So and blow us offline? Maybe. Beauty. <laughs> well, let, let's see the picture before you go. Hmm. Right. Hey, the camera. I'll show as much part. as I can. I, I only got two or three things more I wanted to show. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a whole list of what's coming <laughs> or what's in the new version Ooh, here. So. Yeah. I'm sure some of you have seen this before, uh, but we didn't have a sample animated VF file. Ooh, wonderful. So this is stolen from the Atari ST version. <laughs> and there's a version of this for Disk Basic as well. But you can actually, you know, change it, stop it, change the speed. By doing what? Tapping some keys. No. Oh. It's in the manual that's included in the docs file. Okay. No, what else you got? You can even single step through if you want. Okay, go up a directory. Oops, I'm right off one too many times. Uh, the next one I want to show you some of the demos. Um, one of these you've seen before at the Fest last year. She is Retro Rewinds. So a little one I did for him for showing it shows. And I include source for all these too. If you, so if you think the, you know, the graphics routines look cool, you can steal and use them for whatever you want. That's where I kind of try to simulate the Sundog logo look a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And there's some little sound effects and stuff too, which I'm not going to let play because you guys can't hear them anyway. And then one that never got used. <laughs> so, Ken, you probably remember this. Uh, Taylor and Amy were looking at uh, getting some Halloween content this last Halloween. And I think you actually did submit some, didn't you? You're muted. I'm not saying anything important anyway. Oh. Because I think you actually, like, they were looking for people to dress up for Halloween and stuff. Yeah, and I, I, I submitted some stuff to them. I don't have any Halloween stuff around here anymore, and I didn't really have a budget at the time to go get some, so I decided to try to do something completely different but Halloween-related. So I made them a little demo. I don't think they ended up using it for anything, but... Uh... But if you guys want me to do little promo things like for your companies and stuff, uh, or for your boots or something, just hit me up. I'm not the greatest artist, so if you can submit you know, proper artwork by Ron or somebody... <laughs> Can you that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of orange. There's a little bit of sound effects here, but you can't hear that either. Right, there's the Meyer flask, and it drops something to light the pumpkin up. And as they're standard logo and then it'll pop up their website address on YouTube. But is the crib cycle involved? What was that? I said is the crib cycle involved? That's a Taylor and Amy joke. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it just repeats ad infinitum until you hit the Q key and it'll check for the Q key at certain times. Like about then. And this is one that Alan Huffman said he'd never seen before. Um, 
which is the bouncing ball from Steve York. I've actually made icons for the three different speeds that it actually accepts. This is a level one program, by the way. This works in a Cocoa One or Two. That runs a pretty good clip, and you got, the, like I said, the slower versions as well. I'm trying to remember how to get out of this one here. I should have. Oh, I know. press break to exit. I can just do my help. I just wanted to show that off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one I'll show here is a new entry under emulators. And like I said, there's a list of like 40 things that have been changed or updated. It's included in the documentation you get with it. Um, well, this comes courtesy of Dave Weens. You may remember his name from being involved with this artist, Snow Health Controller, back in the 80s. <clears throat> I got to remember that command here to get out of it cleanly. So Mon and then O to exit. Okay, gotcha. But since Mikey's been doing so much stuff with Flex, I figure, why do you have to leave OS9 to run Flex? Just run it. So here we are. There's, there's Flex, the plus, plus, plus thing. This is the TSC Flex, too. It's not the Frank Og one. And you got some commands you can use here. Like, I want to get a list of the errors and the error sys messages. Here's their list of <clears throat> possible errors. And then the monitor, uh, he added added a new thing in here. And Sardis Technologies, of course, was the company he did for the and all drivers, et cetera. So you can memory examine and change and return to flex with a warm start, just like the normal monitor command did. But he added the exit to OS 9. And you can add a second mounted drive if you want to do your own programming and stuff. There's a whole archive of flex stuff with you know, languages like ABASIC and Pilot and all a whole bunch of stuff. There's like Dynastar and Dynacal. There's versions of that for Flex. There's the Eliza programs in Flex. There's a ton of stuff out there, hundreds and hundreds of programs. So if you guys want to fiddle with that, you can do it while, you know, while you're running something else, you know, type of thing. So I will return. And I guess I could show one of the games. I'm just trying to figure which one I should pick. Because the new ones here, there's uh, Cribbage which actually has a built-in tutorial written by Bob Vanderpool, same guy who did the VD text editor and reprint and a bunch of others. Um, there's another homebrew Sierra game called Sorcerer's something. I can't remember the name of the top of my head. And then a couple other minor ones as well. They're all level two? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think the level one ones are all ones that were on the previous version. Though I've added help for all those, so now you had to get the heck out of them. <laughs> uh, I did speed up Stranded uh, and Out of Gas by Tron Driscoll because um, I partly this is or decompiled that one thanks to Wayne Campbell, and uh, there was some way he was doing things that was very slow. He's doing a shell to do a display command rather than just printing it directly, so the reaction time on some of the boxes updating is a lot faster. So probably no point in showing that. Um, oh, I, I guess I'll show the one arcade game. Another Floyd Reser one I actually finally got working again. Now, this one I'm going to have, probably have to patch for the next one because on a 6 or 9, it runs a bit too fast. Uh, on a 6 or 9, Gimme X, it runs way, way too fast. So I'll have to put in some sleeps or sound effects like I did on Gem Quest. This one's a bit different, though, because uh, Floyd did a disc basic version of this, which is worse graphics. It's slower. There's not as many levels, but he did add digitized sound effects. And I asked Floyd, I said, if you still have those, I can definitely play them now. I've got the play command that I've used on several of my games and, and updates here on Nitro Stein. And you can actually have it play those sound effects in the background. And he says he doesn't have those discs anymore. So I'm going to have to get the disc one, figure out what format it's in, what speed it's supposed to run at as far as samples, and then actually incorporate them in and make a new version with all the sound effects added. Because he had digitized speaking in there and digitized sound effects. Uh, it was actually pretty good, but uh, you guys won't hear the simple OS9 sound effects. But here, they're just basically, you know, the equivalent of a play statement. So, so this, anyway. this is about poop in a pit? Dung depths, yeah. Yeah, I had to fit it so that it actually fits in the amount of characters I can actually fit on the screen. <laughs> I never even thought about that until you just said it either. <laughs> Now, one thing he did here, different Gem Quest too. Gem Quest, every time you move from screen to screen, 
it actually clears the screen, then redraws the whole thing. So it takes a second or two. On this one, he actually allocates four windows in a two by two grid, redraws all four of them so that when you go to a different screen, it's instantaneous, which is a nice, cool technique to write a basic game in. So I go up here, I'm bang, I'm right into the next screen already. And I just, just ran, landed through a bunch of monsters here and got hurt. Killed a few of them here. But the fact that cool. you can instantly switch between four screens, like that's that's pretty decent. And you with with uh, Nitrous Nine, you're allowed up to sixteen screens. Now, obviously, you need some for your you know, actual G shell and stuff here. But you definitely could do like eight or something like that. So if you wanted to make a bigger game without having all the redraw time, it's a nice, easy way to do it. And something I probably should do a seminar tech Coco Tech thing on how to how to do that kind of thing. It's very easy. I'll just complete the first level here, just so you can kind of see. Even try to do a little crossfade there. Now it takes a bit longer to draw the initial screens because it blacks all the palettes out, then draws all four screens and comes back. All right. Just let us know when your Coco Tech comes out. Yeah, that might even help with your web browser, actually. Right? Don't worry, we'll promote the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> You mean I don't promote Nitrous Nine enough of my own? No, no, you need to. <laughs> so that's just a couple of the things in there. There's there's a bunch of other stuff too. But like the uh, the docs have been really expanded. The help is the main thing I spent a lot of time on. I hope I didn't miss anything. Anything that has its own unique icon should have a help file associated with it. So you don't have to like hunt down docs. But if you do need to go to the docs directory, there's quite a bit of stuff in there. Is that Tetris the same as the cartridge? No, it's a uniquely OS 9 one. It's actually based oh, okay. on the original Russian Tetris that ran on a Ooh. text terminal. Cool. Uh, that hey, Nick, are you going to write some games for this system? Um, Maybe. Yeah, maybe or one, Neutroid to it. Or some, Neutroid to it. Some things to put in the trash can. Yeah, we got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> That finally just sunk fully in. <laughs> but yeah, here if you if you want, you can actually go through. There's a ton of uh, more expanded docs, like for Ultimus and some of the stuff. It's a bit more complicated. Um, so uh, oh yeah, what? there's one other new graphics software. I want to show this to you guys actually because you Linux guys might like this because it was actually based a little bit on some of the Linux Unix stuff. What what is the actual size of this newest version? Is it much bigger than the old one? The disk image version, you mean? Yeah, like how big yeah. the hard drive image is? Exact same 128 meg as it always has been. Wow. There's still about 30 to 40 right. meg free. Wow. All right. And Mark's window is still bright outside over his right shoulder. So I guess we're good. Yeah, so far so good. <laughs> it's getting closer, but not quite here yet. That's not the right one either. What the heck did I put it? <laughs> Only 1530 in my time zone. I got another four or five hours of daylight. Yeah, and he's still got another four or five minutes of you, not it has, storm. Do you have a Mandelbrot <laughs> thing in there? I do. Uh, it's not the quickest thing to draw stuff, though. Oh. Yeah, right. Mandelbrot is you, you speed. I'll mention this, too. Swap boot actually has an icon. So if you want to switch between drive wire and a regular one, you can double click yeah. that. And size the window to whatever size you want. So if you want a little half screen or a full screen, you can do that. And then it'll run it on its own. So you don't have to like type it in. Cool. And where is that at? In the apps? In boots. In boots. Okay. So were those boots made for walking? Okay. <laughs> one of these JC's boots. We'll be affiliated with Walgreens. <laughs> I don't remember what directory. I should probably should bring up my own documentation where I actually listed this stuff. <laughs> any any uh, new music or anything? Um, I don't think since version one. Version one, I did add some. Yeah, the Win95 demo, though, which I don't think I'm quite set up to run right now, but close the right off. I didn't want to do that. 
I'm trying to remember what the heck I put in there now. You say it's a game? Or you what must, is it? You must chorus your screen. <laughs> Jim Gary says, when's the MC10 port? <laughs> Actually, I've got some of Jim Gary's games on here, but. But, uh, yeah. Plus nine for MC10. That would be fun. Can you coordinate your cursors, please? Oh, my God. <laughs> or maybe it's under demos. Maybe I put it under demos because it's a graphics demo. There's another library that Freud wrote. The guy did Jim Quest and Dungeons and Depths there called GVX5. Ah, here it is. Yeah. So we've seen the GWIB 3 demo by Sean Driscoll. Uh, and GFX5, he tried to get it to look more like one of the Linux Unix desktops did back when he wrote it years ago. Oh, tab window browser. So I'll just show you. You guys can you know kind of gauge it because I I didn't use Linux at all back then, so I I don't really familiar with it. But yeah, that looks like Mosaic, NCSA Mosaic. Well, not Mosaic. I'm sorry, but yeah, because there was a couple. There was two main ones back then. There was Mosaic. What the heck was the other one called? There's two that kind of competed. Can't remember the name. Well, I know that there was the Mosaic. There was a Mosaic toolkit, toolkit, and there was um, the standard window manager was Tab Window Manager, and I hated it yeah. because it didn't. It, it you had to have the the cursor over the window in order for the window to have focus. Right. Yeah, and then right. the cursor is blocking what you're trying to see underneath. And I hate Windows because you can't just put your cursor over the window to get focus. So there. Oh. <laughs> you can see these little functions that he's put in here, and you can call that because it's a little library he's released the source for. You can call it from base command, uh -huh. which is already running here. I'll just turn them all on so you can kind of see what they look uh, like. How come your scroll bars don't work ever? What do you mean? You know, like when you have the menu on there, the, the, all the folders, you only have up and down. You can't uh, left it. and right actually work, but they just basically duplicate each other because G-Shell is meant to be a vertical. Oh, okay. Right, so it's already folded into... Yeah. Yeah. There are some other programs that actually do use both. And I have some ideas on doing some programs myself that use both. But I, I need to fix it so that you can actually do not just up, down, left, right, but you can click you know, in the middle of a bar and have a jump right over there or maybe a click and drag. I'm yes, which yes. Way to do it. please do that. You know, somewhere on this uh, version or, or pretty soon, you ought to have a little picture of yourself, you know, and uh, about, <laughs> with, uh, you know, that I've worked on this my whole life. <laughs> right. And all right. I've got is this little picture of myself. To <laughs> G-Shell about, here's the curse. I, I, did it. I don't think it's on EOU, but I do have a picture of myself I did back in 1990 with uh, the Rascam, Nick's digitizer, Hi. playing guitar. Mm -hmm. So does this look like Mosaic then, Henry? You probably used it back in that, that time period. It looks it looks familiar to me as being mosaic. Um, I was using uh, I was using like uh, X X Windows based desktops in right. the late nineties, and um, that's very familiar. Oh, like X Free eighty six versus uh, what was the other one? Because X Windows was the one so that let you do remote network. desktops where you would just send a command like draw a box over here and not. Well, yeah, but there, there were the multiple. Screen. There were multiple X Windows, so you had X. Free eighty six X Windows, and then you had um, well, the microwave had X Windows. They had X Windows revision ten or eleven for OS. Yeah, R it would have been R ten in the microwave times because R ten was the R ten was was uh, in the early nineties, late eighties. By the time I got to it, it was already R eleven. And your big names in that that were in open source were X Free eighty six and um, X dot org. So <laughs> any of the other any of the other implementations would have been proprietary. But X is an interesting case because the server doesn't rest on the server. The server rests on the client. So if, right. you've, got an X terminal, <laughs> if you've got an X terminal, your terminal is running the X server. And then the programs that are running on the server are the X clients. The clients of your server. I always, yeah. I never got that. I, that but no, just once, I, once I saw how the communication paradigm worked, it made sense because the server is the ones that's providing the service to display everything. And so the client program says, draw me a window. And the server says, okay. And then the user sees the window on their terminal. Right. But it's so backwards from a sysadmin point of view. Yeah. I it's just, like statistics. You know, 
<laughs> right. So, all right. Uh, that's just some of the stuff. There's a uh, documentation. I revised the beginner's documentation because it was about four pages to get stuff set up. And I figured, you know, a lot of people don't read docs. So I made a, a little intro that's like a half a page long to get you up and running if you're running an emulator or a Cocoa STC on real hardware, uh, which doesn't go into as much detail. I left the old stuff there in case you do want to get into more detail. But if you want to just get up and running, you've never done it before. The first page will summarize exactly how to get that up and running. Um, there's also the standard documentation of what all has been updated or changed since version 1.0.0. That's, I can't remember how many pages long that is. Six, seven, eight, something like that. Um, so you, um, you have this as a demo, but you could actually make this whole program use this system correctly. Correct? Or no? I I, mean, I could, but G-Shell has some unique stuff that this does not support. So this is more meant for user programs. Ah, um, okay. Like menus, you have to handle manually. There's not a built-in system call to do a menu selection. Uh, the auto-follow mouse cursor is, is built-in. That's something that OS 9 itself does. Or you just tell it, turn it on, and you follow me around and draw the mouse cursor wherever you move the mouse to. So you don't have to actually worry about programmatically doing that yourself. But pull-down menus are handled by CoWin, or formerly Windint. And uh, this is just basically a drawing layer. It doesn't have the interactivity with... The menu system to know I click this menu and I selected option five and that kind of thing. But visually, I, I like this actually. I think it looks better than multi So I might steal some of this for <laughs> the general OS later on. And then of course you got GUI B3, which has its own alternative way of doing it, which is what inspired uh Floyd to do it in the first place. Um, this is Sean's that he did a little bit earlier, which has some of the same things, but it's a little bit of a different. Different look. One thing I do have to add is the uh, vertical offset, which I think the level three upgrade did, and also Chris Decker's um, boost graphics boost program that he sold did, where you can tell it's offset by so many pixels. Because right now you have to follow the character cells, so you get forty by twenty five positions or eighty by twenty five positions, and the character has to fit there, which is why these things don't look vertically centered. Because otherwise, you have to make the box incredibly huge. And this one has still got that little distortion. When um, Robert Galt changed the algorithm for calculating some of the circles and lines stuff to be more mathematically accurate, which is nice, except that everything that wrote was written before for the not quite as mathematically accurate <laughs> isn't in the same spot anymore. So a lot of the stuff kind of gets warped. Like you'll notice the diamond here gets a bit twisted and the bullet's a little yeah. off. Well, you know what? Clint mathematically Eastwood, accurate does not equal pixel accurate. Yeah. Right. The, and backwards gotta, compatibility is a thing. <laughs> so, yes. A man's got to know his limitations. But you can see a lot of the same different types of boxes with frames yeah. etched, carved, and Floyd added a few of his own. But it's pretty close to this, but it's it's uh, a bit more expansive in some, some areas. And here's the 640 version of it as well. So if you're if you're a mm -hmm. basic nine programmer, I mean you've got these two different libraries you can pick from to make them look a bit more unique or a bit more Linuxy like than the standard you know G shell built in Windows system. And one thing I always liked about OS nine and MultiView, and this is something Windows at the time could not do, and I can't remember if the Mac could, but changing resolution on the fly without having to reboot, yeah, which people forget. That on no. Windows, you know, I have a 640 by 4060. Right. I want to go to 256. Reboot, Shut reload all the new drivers so that you can run the new screen <laughs> resolution. And here I'm bouncing back and forth between, you know, whatever stuff I want. I, you know, I want a 40 clock right. screen. I can just do, do the that. old uh, yeah. art type around my mic here. There, now I got a 40 column and a 640. I, I could switch that back to a 320 and another 640 and 80 column and back to a 40 columns. So you, have all those, and... you have all those numbers stuck in your head somewhere? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what's wrong with Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that's nah. wrong with me. Wow. I mean, I totally I totally get that. Like I can I can type out a I can type out a valid tar command without even thinking. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> Well, and you notice he seamlessly mixed uh, hex and decimal in the same command line, pretty much. Because yeah. why not? Yeah. yeah, and display handles both. 
I normally put a period in front of it, uh, the number, if you want it to be interpreted as decimal. Oh, one other thing I will mention, I won't demo it because it's not something to demo, but the stream backup and restore utility for backing up hard drives, which is one we used at work all the time. <sighs> Save my butt. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you recover back. from sets that are missing disks, it'll actually resync after the file that previously you're missing piece of, and it'll actually pull the rest of the backup out fine. Uh, it was written by Bruce Eisted, who we covered recently, passed away um, in Calgary. And um, I, I thought it was a fitting tribute that I happened to have found the docs and the program right around the same time. So I included it as EOU 1.0.1 oh, as a kind I of would, a tribute. I don't know how many people would actually use it, but... Uh, I would like, like to say, if I could, everything that I remember from the 90s is due to two stream backups that I made of my hard drive that were both incomplete but combined pretty much gave me most of my install from 1997 in 2019 when you first contacted me about Coco stuff again. So, yeah, stream, solid. Yeah. Yeah, we used to work. We backed up. We we used a specially formatted disk with 20 sectors per track. So we could fit 880K on a three and a half inch floppy and streamed both our 65 meg drive and our 40 meg drive once a week. And oh, yeah, we actually had to use the restorer <laughs> on occasion. And I restored stuff. Actually, a lot of the stuff that's in EOU now is based on the fact that I still had some of the backups from work, which we also developed NitroSign in. So I was actually able to recover some parts no, some discs were completely missing like i can't get anything about that and some of them were too old i definitely had more up-to-date stuff that i'm still trying to recreate some of it i have some of them i haven't but uh right i mean keep in mind some of these backups were like 74 720k floppies yeah so but here i am i'm running a two meg machine virtually here and i'm still not using even the 512k i like i've got you know lots lots of room left over yet and i'm running you know several 32k graphic screens here <laughs> three of them how old will you be in 10 years <laughs> and will that be filled you're gonna up? make me do math <laughs> and then the, the 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 bane of existence for us <laughs> and the for those of you don't dots. <laughs> For those of you that are wondering why we don't stick in network drivers at the system level and a whole bunch of other things, it's because of this. Because the main <laughs> system task is 64K because we have an 8-bit CPU. Now, there are some ways you can extend it, though it does slow things down a little bit. And Nitrous 9 was always about speed. Um, yeah, and you need a little swap But this is why space. you can't run a level 1 game that double buffered because you need 12K. I've only got 9K free in my system RAM. And to remain mm -hmm. backwards compatible, it has to be mapped into the system space because all those system calls dependent on being there and also the programmers used to it was all mapped in at once on level one so you would just directly write to the screen you can't do that the same way here so you either break backwards compatibility with all that stuff or you come up with creative ways around it so it's got 9k free in the kernel wow right like no that's mind you with you know this many programs already running with their own uh, path descriptors and each well, of those has at least three or sorry, process descriptors, and, at least three path descriptors each. And don't you need like 8K in the kernel to format a floppy disk or something stupid like that? So That really I do want to fix because there's no reason. when, Like right now when you format a floppy, yeah. especially if you're using a standard Cocoa controller, it's running in halted mode anyway. So I can shut the rest of the system down, map in a different 8K space for the track buffer right. and just do it there. But so that lives, is one I would cheat on. <laughs> you, are, you are right at the skating living edge of everything as you are. And, and there's every and, module that's part of the operating system or user programs or the stuff I'm running right now and all the windows that are currently got loaded. So from the beginning here, from the relocatable module up to clock two is the system, the OS9 boot. GraphDriv is the main graphics driver, which actually has its own memory 64K map. And then everything else is user okay. programs or utilities. Wow. And mm -hmm. none of this stuff is uh, stored smaller, you know, like... Uh... This is smaller. This is, <laughs> this is as small as it can be crammed into a CPU. This okay. is it. This is this is a 16-bit yeah. operating system running on an 8-bit machine. Yeah, right? kind of, kind of. <laughs> yeah, level what power level wise, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. 
it's nice. I, I like I, I I liked OS9 level two when the, some of the graphic patches were speeding up that Kevin Darling and all the guys did as part of the version three upgrade we didn't know about. You know, made it a lot more presentable. Um and we just kind of kept going once the six zero nine came out and we we're going, hey, we can do all this extra stuff with the chip. That's where we went. Now the six zero nine version is much faster than the stack stocked handy one as well, like several times faster in, in some cases. So even if you don't have a six zero nine and you don't have the capability of adding one, go give it a try. If you have a Coco SDC or you just want to run the emulator, it still runs way faster. It's actually not bad. Um and you know, there's no functionality loss. And that's fun. There's a whole operating system here to play with yeah like well if you guys want to see i mean i haven't actually gone through all these programs yet and there's more to add yet but here's just the list of the commands in the commands directory please oh, ignore geez, these 200 stupid graphic yeah, things out well, of the, we'll be back in a few publisher. minutes if you need to <laughs> take a break or something here's a good time there you go <laughs> <laughs> that was quick and how do we pause it as it's coming down shift at control w for wait oh control w Right. Or you can just type in T mode pause and have it auto pause. There you go. Think ahead and now, now you there don't you have to do anything. So okay, wow, hit the that's space so bar. Nicer. So hit zero space G bar. turns off the gravity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of course, you got command history. So if you want to redo a command, it's a lot easier. A lot less typing. It's not quite a full screen editor, but actually, I can do things faster this way most of the time. Right. Anyway, we'll be doing some tech talk. So now that you guys kind of seen it, for those of you not familiar with it, if you have any questions, they don't have to be today because I don't want to keep Mark going through a storm here. I but maybe send add... some suggestions to Mark or myself, Mark Overholzer, for anything uh, specific subtopic you would like us to cover as a tech, Coco Tech Talk. We're Coco in the middle of it now. The Coco so. Nation .com. so M shells working just fine on this version. Yeah, that's Bill Pierce. Now, the one problem with yeah. M shells is it takes a lot of RAM. Yeah, because it's a big program, right? Yeah, it's multi-faceted. There's multiple chunks to it. Yeah, it's... I've actually tried running it as a five twelve k program and actually not doing too much in it. I've ran out of five twelve k, so you pretty well need a oh. mega or higher to run it. Ooh. Okay. okay, comfortably, especially if you're using all of his networking options like auto updating over the net and you know through DriveWire and all that yeah, kind of stuff. It that is great to know. That's probably what, what some of my problem was on the one machine I was using is 512K instead of... Yeah, I was quite surprised. I actually had to contact Bill Pierce to ask, like, how come I'm running out of RAM here? That's the only thing I'm running. <laughs> and it's it's because there's a lot of stuff in the background. It's a very powerful program. Yeah, it is. And to get full use out of it, you definitely need drive wire. Yeah. Which you can just do, you know, swap boot. and. But, you know, I, I make my um secondary hard drive using that you know putting programs on it and stuff or you know i'll just size this here full screen you can't do that here oh i think i clicked outside of the window and screwed up yes he blew it all up oh well. bad curtis all right show us how you there. fix it. execution chairman let's try it again oh good Stay in the lines. Oh, it's not registering. Oh, the shrapnel. Click for some stupid reason. Okay, that's an odd size. Whoa, what did it do there? So scanning to make sure you have complete boot sets. If you're missing one of the three pieces for each set, then it won't let you pick it. But that's the standard ones that come with the distribution for 6809 or 6309. <laughs> you got two for... Or three for drive wire. There's plain STC, uh, STC with drive wire through the Bitbanger, ST3, STC with drive wire through the RS232 pack if you happen to have one. And then there's two for the emulators. There's the hardware clock, which means you have to have VCC or MAME set up with the proper hardware clock settings for it to do it. And then you don't have to type the time in when you boot. And the soft clock, which if you don't know how to set all that up and don't know which one to pick, you can just, if you're just playing games, just hit enter. Don't worry about the time. If you're doing development, the make utility and a bunch of things requires proper timestamps, so you definitely do want to type in the time. And I'm not actually going to do a, a boot swap at this point. So, just but you can it. also do boot swap when you're first booting, right? Still, when you when you first boot before you even go into the shell. Uh no, it'll boot with the stock boot image. That's just plain old SDC. That's what we have a default to, and then you swap it depending on what your configuration is. Yeah. 
And you can add your own. I mean, Ken has shown how to do that in one of his videos. And it could be just you want different color sets. You can make a boot based on that. You can have the exact same OS9 boot file, but the environment file and the startup file is a little bit different. You can mix and match whatever combo you want. Or you want to use Rick's Coco IO to fetch the time and date from the internet. There you go. NTP. Well, I remember Rick actually did a demo where he fetched Nitrous 9 over the internet. So, yeah, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> now you get a new version to try. <laughs> All right. Oh boy, we're going to burn up some time. Anyway, go through the go through the docs. The uh, the main one to check is everything that's been updated. If you've never used it before, definitely check the beginner's doc. They're both real text files. Uh, the beginner's doc. If you're just trying to get up and running from scratch and you don't know what you're doing, then the first page basically covers everything. If you want to get more more detail, you can finish reading that doc. And please report any bugs. <coughs> I'm sure I've got some in there because I had a few people that were helping beta test, but only one of them really had time the last week and I think that was Wayne. I think Rick was too busy and uh, Fred is actually off to see the eclipse so I didn't get any help out of him and Bill's been busy again so he wasn't able to help so it's uh, basically just me hoping everything works right. <laughs> right. So. so there's really no other operating system like this on any other 8-bit, right? Or is there something um, close but doesn't have all the goodies? GUI-wise, I've seen some that actually are a little bit more advanced in, in certain specific uh, Well, like bits. Jim was cool yeah jam there's a newer one in the c64 that's actually using the redefinable character set that actually looks really nice uh but it has to basically swap programs in and out it does allow a simplified version of multitasking i guess you can call it but it's more a cooperative style like as far as preemptive and this is also multi-user you can have people log in and run the on the machine <laughs> the same time you are um we really need to get a, a decent linux os 10 windows terminal program that actually knows OS9 terminal codes. I had one we used to use at work, but unfortunately that got lost when work shut down and I stupidly didn't copy it because I'm going, well, I'm not going to need it anymore. I don't work anymore. But I should have kept the damn thing because it had, it supported overlay windows and foreground background colors and change working area and a bunch of other things. And it actually ran really nice. And uh, we were going to be adding the graphic stuff and then we said, ah, at work, we don't really need that. But if we had, we could have been drawing circles. You could actually do a full graphics game over the terminal, kind of like X Windows did back in the day, where you'd send a command to draw a feature rather than actually showing a raw bitmap dump like we do now with you know stuff like VL or not VLC, uh, VNC and uh, remote desktop on Windows. I don't know what the equivalent is on Linux off the top of my head, but everything is seems to be a raw dump now, and that takes if you get a slow bandwidth, that's terrible. Whereas well, you know I can draw a circle with ten bytes. Now, now that we're done, don't forget to make a little you know embellishment for yourself somewhere on the program for the next version you know about is there an about if you hit about it doesn't say you did anything does it what does it say uh, oh yeah there he uh, is kdm and lcb yeah kent d myers and, and me <laughs> he's famous well, how about a picture you know and a, a little world swirling and you know, oh, a little pop-up <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd rather make some demos for some of you guys that actually have booths and and <laughs> tables and stuff at shows there uh, like i did for retro rewind taylor and amy okay or help you make make it on your own because i mean it's not that hard i did all those in basic i didn't did no touch of machine language or anything else so yeah all right go give it a try Give me some feedback. You guys can report back next week. See what you think. See if you found any major bugs or things you really liked or the, your oh. your view after using it for a week. Uh, do you like thin icons better than thick ones? <laughs> well, we, we the controversy begins. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we thank you for what we see. It looks great. Yeah, but it, it definitely, to me, looks better. I do that. It's a good thing there's a menu. <laughs> well that is something you requested even back in the 1990s late 90s i remember that because i had yeah. notes written on i still have the notes actually i've, I've got and a i finally got around somewhere. to doing it 20 years later i actually had a windows 95 desktop written in multi-view with teal and everything um yeah so cool well, hey, we're, nick, yeah, we're, we're at nick five Barney. hours so let's call it a day all right, Nick, you ought to make a, yeah. a dumpster instead of a garbage can. A dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this will work. We're going to need a anyway. bigger garbage can. <laughs> when you empty it, fire comes out.
It's working. It's working. One with uh, Curtis and his hair on fire, maybe. Yeah, Windows 95 should be one in there. <laughs> Ah, the flames poof out the top to let you know it's empty. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I haven't quite fixed this one for uh, EOU because well, mm-hmm. a few things changed when I originally wrote this back in 80, well, pink, no, pink no, 97 or 98. Wrong. <laughs> and hard-coded a bunch of crap? <laughs> yeah, I hard-coded. A, <laughs> yeah, I didn't really know what I was doing back then. It does have a bunch of sound effects. It has the window start sound. It has a whole couple Homer Simpson bits. Um and stuff in there too so cool. but I'll, I'll fix it up probably for the next release i just i didn't even think about it until just now that yeah i, I didn't actually finish fixing this up did I? so anyway thanks for letting me blather on about niger sign for days on end thanks for blathering thank yeah. mark b for the extra time right yeah. he stayed here despite the yeah oncoming uh Thunderheads. We've seen you looking out the window and praying to Jesus. Right, closing the windows <laughs> and pulling down the, the storm blinds. <laughs> Holy oh, see, the red part missed you. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Miss. Little to the south. You're safe. Okay, let's go on, folks. So, so the blue <laughs> circle is the power outages. Oh, oh lovely. Okay. Oh, no, that's where you were. Uh, no, I'm in the middle of that. He, he's a you know, couple of feet outside somehow. So, all right, let me run the Obviously outro here. Obviously, not affected by the power outages. Yeah, I live next to the substation. <laughs> there you go. This concludes another episode of The Coco Nation, the world's leading live interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things The Coco Nation, visit us on the web at thecoconation.com. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to show at thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation Show would not exist without the community and its cast and crew. The Coco Nation theme song copyright 2022, D. Bruce Moore. Mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. The Coco Nation is over. Join us on the Coco Discord server. Coco forever. It's over. Yep, it's over. <laughs> I just wanted to address <clears throat> while we're doing the outro. <clears throat> I was scrolling back in the chat because I didn't get a chance to check it here, but uh, Chris Durst was asking, is Ed's 8th Meg, Ed Snyder, that came with the GameX going to be supported? Is it even possible? There is a RAM disk driver specifically for that, which will give you up to six meg RAM drive, and the other two meg is reserved for the operating system itself. I don't have it installed by default because not many people have eight meg, um, but it's there and it works. I've tried it, and uh, so yes, you can. In fact, uh, if enough people, if like if Ed starts manufacturing them again here, then I may add in a, a swap boot option to have the eight meg or six meg RAM drive using the eight meg upgrade pre-installed. And then, you know, to make for the system itself. As it stands now, you can use up to uh, one and a half meg uh, RAM drive with the existing two meg boards. So is the RAM drive faster yet than the uh, SEC? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no it's hesitation. Because we have to slow it down on the Gimme X just because the SEC can't keep up. And on, the, okay. on uh, a 6309 Gimme X version, the RAM drive runs full throttle. I don't slow it on nothing. Okay, well, I better get. So, bye, everybody. Bye. Say goodbye. Next week. Bye. Sayonara. See you later.